for being here in this second day of our conference. Our first speaker is Elizabeth Babalik Sotno. She is a second year PhD researcher in the universe in the European University Institute in Florence. She specializes in intellectual and cultural history with an emphasis on women thinkers of the late 18th and early 19th century. Her doctoral thesis presents the life and ideas of female scholars in the Hellenic cultural space. Today she will speak uh, on uh, Friends of the Muses, Greek, Greek women and education in early 19th century. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for being here and thank you for accepting me. I've uh, enjoyed this so much. Um, it's a very pluridisciplinary, this is the thing I've enjoyed more, it's very pluridisciplinary and I hope um, I will add something with my contribution. Um, so as Sarah said, this is part, this is one chapter of my PhD uh, which is on the ideas of women in the early 19th century in what I call a Hellenic cultural space. Uh, because the period I'm looking at is between 1800, the period I'm going to talk about today is between 1800 and 1832, which is the years preceding uh, the Greek War for Independence and the war itself, so before the inception of a Greek state. Um, my main argument today will be that education, uh, a topic that was considered to be feminine, um, so it was accessible to women, afforded women the opportunity to talk about politics and to engage in politics in a not a necessarily feminine way. Uh, of course, this is not the case only in Greece. Um, we know of thinkers like Mary Wollstonecraft or Catherine Macaulay or Zanon Destel, um, who, for example, answered to Susan Mill. Uh, but I also think there are, let's say, mi minor intellectuals who translated or facilitated um, educational initiatives that are worth looking at. Um, so for Greek scholars in particular, ideas on education were developed within this new, newly emerging plexus of political um, liberalism, enlightened and patriotic ideas, and they were um, a substratum for creating a national identity. And education was seen as a means of self-fashioning, um, a way to conceptualize themselves within a new imagined community. Um, and this was done by providing links with the civilized ancient Greek past. Um, so the, these, all these debates and discussions on education ultimately um, amounted to an examination of who is Greek, what it means to be Greek, and the answer the answer is varied. Um, my PhD talks about will be about uh, 15 women more or less, but today I chose three of them to talk about. Um, they all engaged uh, with the issue of education in different ways, and I think this will highlight the diverse appearances and political aspects the topic has. Um, all, of the, all of them were women of the elites or of bourgeois classes. Um, I start with uh, Roxandra Sturza. This is what you get if you try to do some fancy stuff with you. <laughs> That's her. Um, so she was the member of an aristocratic Fanariot family. Um, she was born in Constantinople and then her family was forced to move to Belarus and later in St. Petersburg because her father, uh, who was a member of the Ottoman uh, administration, was forced out of uh, the Ottoman Empire for siding with the Russians in the Russo Turkish War. Um, so she and her siblings were very well educated and their house was described um, as a hub of knowledge and more of an academy than a house. Um, so she was brought up in this environment and when she grew up, at the age of 22, she gained access to the um, court of the Russian Empress. She became a lady of honor. And this made her a, a very influential person. Um, so in 1815, she was part of the Russian delegation to the Congress of Vienna. 
Um, a lot of things were happening, of course, in the Congress of Vienna, but Roxandra and her brother uh, were very close friends with Ioannis Kapodistrius, who would later become the first governor of Greece. And uh, together, they were trying to, to convince the Tsar uh, to help the Greek cause. Um, the Tsar was reluctant for various reasons. Uh, he wanted to protect the status quo. But at the same time, Ioannis Kapodistrias and Roxandra Sturza, they also have a secret love affair. This is another. <laughs> anyway, so they established a um, society called the Philomsus Society. Philomsus Eteria. This means a uh, society of the friends of the muses. And this was their city. You can see there's Minerva there. Mm -hmm. See. Um, a symbol of enlightenment, also a symbol of the Greek wisdom. Um, so, ostensibly, the aim of this society, according to its founding document, was to gather enough funds for the uh, to help the poor Greeks who thirsted for education and culture. Um, and Roxandra was very keen on this society. She repeatedly pestered the Tsar, the Tsarina, all of the officials who were present in Vienna. She even convinced Metternich to give her money. Um, and she was uh, very emotional, also very emotional about it. She writes in her memoir um, about how Capodistrias um, told her about this whole affair. He says, he told me that he had already conceived of a sweeping plan that he would soon announce to me and in which he asked me to take a leading part. I answered him, not with my lips, but with my eyes. My voice was choked with emotion. Um, so she, she participated in the society. She managed to gather financial assistance that she used uh, also for guns during the war years. Um, she also financed the publication of 12 ancient Greek tragedies and studies um, she financed the studies of poor Greek students in Paris and Leipzig. And this society has been seen by historiography so far as the act of Capodistrias, but their correspondence uh, is full of her accounts on the financial details and her ideas of how, how and why the money should be spent. Um, she worked very, very hard for this cause. Um, although the founding document of the society was only referring to education, many people saw behind it a threatening secret society that had other goals. Um, so the Austrian secret police saw it as a direct attempt of Russia to help the Greeks destabilize the Ottoman Empire. Um, for example, in a December 18, 15 report, the chief of police in Graz asserted that the society does not only aim to educate the Greeks, but also has political, obscure political goals. This was not unfounded. Um, secret societies who were very often connected to Masonic lodges were, in a sense, the infrastructure of revolutionary activities uh, at that time. Um, and I think also the allusion to education was provocative in itself. Um, in the writings, as I said, of scholars at the time, it was seen as the vehicle that would bring, up, would bring about um, political changes necessary. And it seems like uh, both Roxandra and the secret, uh, the secret police of the Austrians were right, um, because in the end it was um, this uh, a secret society like that that instigated the Greek war for independence. I think that secret societies are a very privileged um, place where women's historians could work because it's a place that's public, but also it's hidden in private. So this is this mix that uh, I think we're looking for in this situation. So um, I will move on to my next uh, subject. Um, so why Roxandra Sturza was trying to promote liberation and education of Greeks in the diaspora. In what is now mainland Greece, another woman, Evanthea Kairi, was making a different kind of effort. Um, and she was focused on women. Uh, she was the younger sister of Theophilos Kairi, who had been, who was a very educated Greek priest. He had been educated in Kibernias, Pisa and Paris. And um, she read a lot. 
scientific and philosophical works. And at the age of 15, she decided uh, she should contribute to the enlightenment of the subjugated Greek nation by translating the works of European scholars into modern Greek. Um, so with her help and the, um, uh, the, uh, the help of Adamadius Corais, a very famous scholar of the time, she focused on French pedagogical works. So for example, in 1819, two years before the beginning of the uh, Greek Revolution, she anonymously published the translation of uh, Bouilly's Conseil saint um, these were short, short stories um, who gave moral lessons to young women. But what is more um, interesting is her introduction, which is half of the book. So the whole book is 40 pages, 20 pages are the introduction, where she doesn't talk at all about Bouilly. Um, she actually mentions she doesn't know many things about him. But she goes on to say that um, this is just the beginning of uh, an effort that all Greek women should make. And um, she spent a very long uh, part of this introduction talking about all the ancient Greek women who were educated and were the proud of uh, the Greek civilization. Um, she begins with Sappho and ends with Hypatia, but in the middle she, she talks about so many women, I, can't, I haven't yet found how she knew about them. Um, some of them we don't know now, maybe she imagined them, I don't know. Um, so, in this case, um, again, the self-education of women this time was connected with political aspirations uh, of the liberation of the Greek nation. Um, and uh, she dedicated the book uh, to the female friends of the muses again. Um, unfortunately, we don't know anything about the reception of this translation and the reception of this introduction. Uh, any correspondence from that time of her life was lost uh, as the city where she lived in Kidanis, which is present-day Ivalik, uh, was destroyed by the Ottoman army. Um, but I, can, I think we can safely assume that she had a kind of readership on her mind. Um, last. I will engage with the life and writing of Elisabeth Martinengu. She was the daughter of an, uh, an aristocratic family in Zante, um, and she lived a very, very secluded life. According to her autobiography, which is the only writing we have, uh, she was allowed to leave her house three times in her entire life. One of them was to marry. Um, and the fervent way um, uh, in which she wrote about what she called the female plight, uh, have led to her being seen as the, the first Greek feminist. Um, and unfortunately, the only source we have about her is this autobiography, which was published in 1881, so 50 years after her death, by her son, who unashamedly says that he crossed out parts he thought were uh, destructive to the family's occupation. Uh, so everything else she wrote, um, we know she wrote dramas, poems, translated from ancient Greek and Italian. Um, she wrote even a treatise on economics and a, a treatise in poetics. Everything else was lost also because of a catastrophic earthquake in the 1950s that all of the archive in Zante was burnt down. Um, so this autobiography is actually, she calls it my story. She, she doesn't have the concept of an autobiography at the time. Um, but it's the story and her account of her quest for knowledge um, and the difficulties and the joys, the realization of her bondage of her gender, as she calls it. Um, she, so in the beginning, she was taught Italian and Latin by her father, who thought it was cute for a young girl to know that. But as she grew up um, and she started asking for more education, um, People got angry at her. And she was told she should marry and become a mother. So she tried, she asked to go to a convent um, because she thought that that was a place where she would be allowed to study and write. Um, but um, she was refused. And in the end, um, she was married to a guy, a rich merchant who was 20 years senior. And uh, her Autobiography ends with this hopeful note that maybe marriage is not as bad as she thinks it is. 
This is very bitter for us reading it because she died um, less than a year after that, uh, during childbirth. Um, so this is, of course, a very personal account, um, and it's through this personal um, account that she talks about her patriotic feelings and all the big, big, big events that are happening. And um, a very telling example is the way she describes learning about the Greek Revolution. She actually, uh, she wasn't told about the Greek, the beginning of the Greek Revolution. She it was eavesdropping and she heard her father talking to her brother about it. And she says, I felt my blood getting warmer and I wished with all my heart I could gird on weapons and join the fight. I wished with all my heart I could fight for my religion, my homeland and for freedom. But then I looked around and I saw the high walls that kept me inside. And I looked down and I saw the long gowns of slavery I was wearing. And I remembered I was a woman. A woman from Zante and all I could do was simply pray. Um, so these three women led very different lives. One was in a lady of honor moving around Europe. The other was very secluded. But um, what can they tell us about the time they lived in? I hope many different things. That's why I'm doing a PhD on them. But um, three things stand out to me for what we're talking about today. Um, first of all, I think they can tell us a lot about women's agency and the, the strategies they deployed um, in order to prove, if I'm allowed an anachronism, how the personal is political. Um, also, how the age of revolution present, as it was permeated by enlightened, uh, romantic, patriotic ideas, provided um, hopes that a new type of polity would emerge and that this new type of polity would offer um, women a proper place in society. And um, I think it can also make us consider that educated women and women who participated politically were not a rarity, um, but a product of this time. And in this, in this sense, um, the silences and omissions we encounter in women's and gender history are very eloquent and all of these debates were masked and muted in the shadow of gender power relations, but they were there and I think we can uncover them. Thank you very much. In her PhD, she studied the roles of women in the Finnish civil war and women's survival after the war. Her main research interests include war propaganda, the Finnish civil war, and the function and methods of the state police in the Nordic countries. Currently, she works as a university lecturer at the Department of Philosophy, Contemporary History, and Political Sciences at the University of Turku, Finland. Today she will speak about uh, the female emperor, emperor of a predominantly male industrial town. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here and I'm sorry that Professor Rentola he is not here because he's the one who speaks Italian and he's a really charming person, but now you have to set up for me. Sorry about <laughs> that. Yeah. Here's the outline of my presentation today. And at the beginning, in order to give you some sort of context, I will tell about the gender roles at the beginning of the 20th century in Finland. And it will be really brief, and I will generalize a lot, but at least you will get some kind of picture of what was the situation. And then uh, I will present uh, the environment where Lydia lived, Karkila, this really male dominant, dominated society. And after that, we get to our heroine, to Lydia. Who was she? What was she like? And finally, I will give you some explanations why we think that she was able to, to reach such an extraordinary influential social status in her hometown. But first, the generals in Finland 
at the beginning of the 19th century. Well, the conservative view was that women had two spheres where they could, they could act. First, of course, at home, uh, giving birth to children and taking care of them. And then there was this other sphere there where they could act and, uh, and pursue the, these ma maternal duties. It was called that uh, social maternity. So they could work outside home as teachers or nurses and thus take care of other people. Um, but this was the conservative view. Uh, but what did those people on the left side think? They thought that women should be should be equal with men, and young unmarried women they could do that. But married women they often have to stay at home with the children, and young women were also more active in the politics because they had more time. They could do it because they didn't have to stay at home. But a huge change happened in the, in the late 1920s as the children's daycare system was established, as, as the kindergartens became state-aided institutions, and this enabled women to leave their children there and to go to work. So it was a huge step forward. Uh, what would I say is most char characteristic for Finland was that uh, and there were lots of small farms where women worked really hard with their husbands. And they, for example, they have to take care of the cattle. And at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, nearly 80% of the population lived still on the countryside. And most of them were tenant farmers or agricultural workers. In the 1920s, and in the 1930s, the situation changed as the rural urban migration increased. And when the young women moved into the towns, uh, most of them worked as factory workers, craftswomen, or maid servants. Uh, what was special in Finland that the women gained universal suffrage and eligibility to for election together with men already in 1906. So in the first parliament there were 200 members and uh, already 19 of them were women. So this is quite extraordinary in the world. But still husband represented a wife in judicial matters. For example, a wife needed husband's permission to go to work. Um, and if there was a divorce, uh, the husband got always, always the children under the new marriage law in 1930. So there was a paradoxical situation when you think about it that there were women in the parliament making decisions uh, of the nation, but they were not allowed to take care of their own business if they were married. Yeah, but that changed in the 1930s. Uh, unmarried women, they were in a different position. They were independent after they turned 20, 21 years, so it was better if you didn't get married at all. And of course, the wartime changed the roles like everywhere in the world. <coughs> and women stepped in in many branches which had been male oriented before. But this was to make it short. Uh, then about the Karkia, uh, it's the little red dot over there. Uh, uh, it's a small industrial town 40 miles from Helsinki and in those days there were like 5,000 inhabitants. And it was one company community since the 1820s. There was a big foundry which produced all, like, all kinds of things about iron and other metal products. And there, in this Big found that there were the 1500, from 1500 to 2000 workers who were predominantly males. And if you think that there were 5000 inhabitants in the whole town and 2000 of them were working in, in the factory, in the same factory, so you can think that the factory owner had a huge authority in the town. And during the civil war in 1918, the local Red Guard strength was 700 
but 750 persons who were male, mainly young males and 150 of them got killed but 600 survived and lived long after that. In general and local elections, the left-wing parties received 75% of the votes in town. And the communists with their allies were the strongest party. And the communist majority, the communists had majority in the local council from the 1945 to 1969. And all the time, Lydia, the local communists they were radical in political sense, but their views in family and lifestyle issues were rather conservative. Uh, they were actually quite close to traditional rural attitudes. Here we have a picture from 1917 in Karkila. And here the, uh, in Karkila the factory workers were were organized and the labor movement was really so strong and here they are demonstrating for better uh, for better working conditions and for for an eight hour working day and almost the whole town is participating you can see there are even children marching over there and the political leaders they were always men at the time so then we come to Lydia. Who was she? There's the sign, Diego on Balta, it means knowledge is power. And the, the, the young people here, they are the study society of the Perk Force Young Workers. As you can see, some of the young women here on the second row, they are using uniforms, uniforms and men's ties. And this is in the 1920s. Uh, the picture is taken on May Day, since many of them have May Day on so we can say that. And Lydia is here. She's not wearing a uniform, but a nicely cut skirt suit. Her expression is quite stern, even though she has been described to be an open-hearted and caring person. Then something about her childhood. Uh, she was born in 1901 in a nearby village and she had four older siblings. Her father was a glass blower, a respected craftsman. Uh, he was the breadwinner of the family who took care of everything. But he died when Lydia was four years old. And then the mother has had to find work and support the children. And I think this is really important to Lydia's spiritual growth when now she had a strong and independent female role model in her mother. And they have to move to industrial town for first Karkila because the mother didn't find work from where, where they were living at the moment and they moved there uh, to Karkila and she worked as a washerwoman. And this Karkila then became a lifelong operational environment to Lydia. Uh, she, was, she was four years in elementary school and then after that two or three years in secondary school. She was really bright, pupil, uh, very clever and she, she wanted to study but they didn't have money and she had to drop the school. She became a trainee in a tailor shop and became a very skilled seamstress. Uh, and she was able to support herself and later also her mother. And here's a picture of her in age of 15 or 16. Then about her political activity. She joined the Workers' Association Youth Section at the age of 15 and Next year, uh, the civil war burst out, and to make it short, the socialists started the revolution which turned into a civil war. It lasted for three and a half months, and the Reds were defeated. So, Lydia 
joins the Red Guard and works there in nursing and maintenance. There were also women taking arms in Finland, 2,600 women who, who were fighting on the front side, but Lydia was not one of them. She was working in the nursing section. Uh, after the war, all who had helped the Red Guard were taken to the court and they were sentenced, uh, sentenced for penal labor. And they also lost their civil rights for a certain time, usually it was for five years. And also, Lydia was taken to court and she got two years, what was, what was paroled after three months. And this was the normal procedure after the Finnish Civil War. And the badge here is the badge of the red, local red card. It's 1918. After the war, she joins again the Socialist Youth Organization, and many of the former, former Reds had lost their interest to politics after the war because they were taken to the prison, but Lydia was not one of them. Actually, on the contrary, she becomes a communist and joins the underground communist party in 1924, since the communism is banned at the moment. And she is very cautious in her party work and participates lively in legal left-wing organizations like in theater, sports and consumer cooperative activities. In 19 29, she is elected in the local administrative council, but in the same year she is arrested and sentenced for 18 months in a women's prison in Hamelinna for communist activities. Uh, in jail, she, she studies history, natural sciences, Swedish, and national economy. Uh, she had to drop the school before, but now in prison she takes use of that time and she, she studies really hard. And when she's released from the prison, her homecoming is a quite an occasion. Huge amount of people come to greet her at the local railway station and salute her and show her respect. Uh, after the prison sentence, uh, she has further activity in cultural and economic societies and still cautious participation into underground activities. During the Second World War, she is under surveillance and she is interrogated seven times uh, by the state security police. And around Karkia, where she lives, there are several. Uh, several more resistors and deserters hiding in the forest and Lydia is helping them. <coughs> in 1943 the town becomes really restless. Lydia is interrogated again and one of the policies says this town will become calm again when you will be removed from here and he asks if something happens here you will be held responsible. So her status as the local number one communist already is established and known there also by the police. Uh, but she is not taken into preventive detention like many other communists are. Uh, she will be sentenced for four months, but she will uh, pay fines and get rid of it that way. Uh, when the peace arrives in September 1944, communists and other left-wing activities become legal again in Finland. And in the first parliamentary elections in 1945, uh, the communists get 24% of all the votes in, in, in the whole nation. What happens after the war to Lydia? Her position as a local leader becomes even stronger. She is elected to the local city council and she holds that position for 25 years. She becomes a chairman of the Communist Party's local section and she is called Emperor of Karkia, so not Empress. Uh, she will be elected for the President of the Republic in 1950 
but she will not go. She will. He's not willing to run for the parliament. Uh, they asked her several times, but she refuses every time. And uh, she she becomes a leader of cultural activities as well, like theatre, school boards, and cooperative society. And she, here she is rewarded for her work for the coup in 1974. So, so she is already uh, uh, over 70 years old in that in that picture. And then finally, uh, what we think. How did she do it to become a female leader in that kind of society? Well, uh, she was a special kind of a woman. Uh, like I said already, her mother, mother gave her this uh, model of independent female, uh, of the independent female woman, and she was never married. There was no known love, love affairs in town, no wooing allowed. She lived with her mother all her life and took care of her until uh, she was in her 60s herself. It's kind of Virgin Mary effect. And actually it's really interesting that during prison time she had a love affair with a fellow female convict. And this was not known locally. Uh, I will read you a short part of one letter that Lydia wrote to her friend Gottlieb in 1932. You must believe me that I have tried to get rid of these feelings for you and be just a friend. It has been impossible. Maybe then if I hear that you have someone else, then it will not be hard at all. This woman Gottlieb lives elsewhere and is married and their relationship ends after a few years. But there was also a local legend that Lydia was romantically involved with a young man in the Red Guard in 1918, but the boy was killed during the war and she did not want anybody to replace him. It's not known if this was true or a cover used by herself, so we're thinking it might have been a rumor she started by herself in order to hide her lesbian affair. We don't know. And then her personal qualities. Intellectually, she was on much a higher level than the ordinary worker women. Um, she was a cultural person, and even the right-wing persons enjoyed her company and the bright conversations they had with her. She was also able to support herself financially, financially outside the company, and she was not dependent on any male. And then. Also, her political qualities are really important. She was fearless. Uh, she brought down the local police chief in 1917 by witnessing against him, and this was really brave because at the time she was only 16 years old. Then she participated in the civil war, the Red Side, and he, she had this prison term for political activities and was respected for that. She also didn't talk during the war, even under duress, when the state police interrogated her, because talking would have meant that death for those hiding in the forest. She also wanted to influence only locally. She had no ambitions for a political career in parliament or party central committees, so she was not too power hungry. And in the Communist Party characters department, they described her personality. She is modest, agreeable, but a bit stubborn. And here finally are our sources. And we thought it's really important to have the sources from both sides. So here we have the official, official documents uh, by the authorities here from the uh, state police and um, from the court, uh, but then we have also Lydia's own voice, voice from her own own collection where we have letters, public speeches, and notes during her prison. Thank you.
Maria Piccoli has a doctor, uh, doctoral degree in history from the University of Lausanne. She worked there for the database of Swiss personal writings, and she's a member of the network abudocument.gh. She also works on Nuns Chronicle and Female Common Culture in Switzerland. Today she will speak about the female agency in the mirror of a Swiss farmer's diary at the beginning of the 19th century. Thank you. Thank you, Zoom, and uh, thank you for the invitation and for letting me um, present my paper as Kathy today. I'm, I'm really sorry I'm not in London. I started my PowerPoint presentation. Let me know if you can see the, um, the slides. They're quite small yeah, at the small. moment. Yes, now. Yeah. It's okay? Yeah. Great. So today I will speak uh, about female agency in the mirror of a Swiss uh, farmer's diary from the beginning of the 19th century. Between 1823 and 1866, Giovanni Anastasia, a farmer from Bueno, a small village of Ticino, in the Catholic Italian-speaking part of Switzerland, regularly wrote a, a diary. He writes on notebooks and loose sheets of paper, 2,100 written pages, which he groups into three volumes. This is for uh, Switzerland, but also at an international scale, a unique document. We know some important eco document of craftsmen, for example, the autobiography of the French glassmaker Jacques Louis Menetra, published by Daniel Roche, or the documents studied by James Hemelaske in Spain. But very rare are eco documents written by small farmers. And at the moment, for the period, we have no diary written by a peasant a woman. Giovanni Anastasia is a simple man. He has a life of hardship in a rural context and in a society characterized by seasonal migration, a typical of the Alps. In the Malcantone region, subsistence was based on a complex balance between agricultural work on small, low yield soils, breeding, and craft work, carried out mainly in the Lombardo Veneto Kingdom, or in northern Italy. Giovanni went only to parochial school. The diaries are written with a basic syntax and its written Italian is similar to the spoken dialect of the region. And now this extraordinary uh, document is published in a three-volume edition plus one volume containing essay, um, uh, critical apparatus, maps, uh, a glossary. Today, in my paper, um, after a brief contextualization, I will talk about women life, and uh, um, I will have a particular focus on father-daughter relationship in order to study female agency in Alpine and peripheral valleys at the beginning of the 19th century. Giovanni Anastasia was born in uh, 1797, in his youth, he worked in a furnace, and in 1821, he married Maria Righetti, who was abandoned at board and raised by a family in Breno. The two of them get married without their parents' consent. After the wedding, his main activity is farming, and other Giovanni ordinary the land, money and food are often scarce, and Giovanni often fears he cannot feed his children properly. Giovanni became a widower in uh, um, 1842. His wife died during childhood, and he is left alone with seven children. The eldest daughter, Teresa, is 21, and the youngest, Rosa, is only three. 
Teresa can manage the household, but she gets married and leaves uh, the parental home only three years um, later, and the little Rosa is only six. The sons emigrate in Algeria, Anastasio will die there, and Lorenzo and Giovanni come back alive but without money. For them, the immigration overseas uh, was not a success story. Giovanni Anastasia does not remarry. He does embody, as Raffaella Sarti underlines, a real figure in ego documents, that of a father who take care alone of the household and of the education of the chief. The diary illustrates how the Escobé managed the delicate balance between his melancholic temper, a raw character, the demand for affection and freedom of his seven children, and the need to impose his authority. And this in a rapidly evolving social and political context, which challenged the paternal figure and more generally the family dynamics. In telling about himself, Giovanni Anastasia talked frequently about his family group and his community. A community, as said, characterized by male migration. Sex ratio was clearly unbalanced, as illustrated by the homophobe, and you have the, the numbers on the slides. Francine van der Poel concludes her article Migration and Fertility in Ticino, saying, Ticino assumed he knew that threats, a heavily female labor force, by far the highest employment rate of women in Switzerland, and an extraordinary extent on female celibacy. In this context, women played a crucial role. Women kept the household and the agricultural work going, and this in a system of continuous vertical motion with in plain pasture, mountain uh, pastures, typical of an agricultural, agropastoral economy. Since the son of the Chani were absent, it's the daughter who go out to pasture, take care of the hay, and go to the market in the plain. The daughter uh, has also um, called the, um, for, for all for other family in the village. And the diary, um, which also serves as a account book, records the value of payment giving us an idea of the woman labor at the time in a fine village and its value. Here uh, on the slide, uh, you have uh, an example. Giovanni, uh, this diary is also um, very interesting because it describes the father and children relations. As we know, the first half of the 19th century is a period of great changes. The role of the father evolves and new generation demand more freedom. Without the literary wit of a Diderot or a Goldoni, was comedies underlying the problem of the generational conflict going on since the mid 18th century. Anastasia often complained about the growing difficulties he faced in managing what equals uh, their children in particular. The, bar the boundaries of the paternal authority are clearly challenged by his children. The societal structure that are already strained by political and existential crises are also uh, a problem. And this, despite the law trying to limit the phenomenon, the civil code of 1837 tried to maintain social order based on the hierarchy by reaffirming the power of the patriarchate. In Ticino, no emancipation was possible before the age of 25. If the father, on his own initiative, did not grant emancipation, everything his children bought or born remained paternal property. And this prolonged control did not help to develop a harmonious relationship in the family. Women, as we know that, were legally subject to the father or husband. They had to be subject to external totally. But I should be, it should be said 
this figure, uh, that of the legal future, is never mentioned in Giovanni uh, Stapier. So, um, one of the central uh, theme of the conflict between um, father and children is uh, uh, marriage and sexuality. As well described in the diary, young people in rural and urban environments enjoy great freedom of movement since childhood. There is less control than in aristocratic or bourgeois circles. None of Giovanni's children marry the kinship. Only Teresa will have an endogamic marriage. And the diary does not reveal any marriage strategy. We are far from a, a bourgeois context where marriage policy is linked uh, with power, consolidation, and property. Maria and Giovanna decide to leave the mountains and find a new home in the plain. The marriage between a completely unrelated person in a region where marriages into kinship was known point toward the disruption of older structure and ties. As the slide shows, Giovanni's daughter get married relatively late, and this reflects uh, a demographic trend. But let's focus on Giovanna and Rose. Giovanna, marriage is a failure. The woman doesn't get along with her husband's family through a problem with a mother in law. Not even a year after her marriage, uh, Giovanna leaves her. Uh, at her um, house and returned to Ticino, where she lives in part by her sister Maria and in part by um, her father Giovanni. Uh, Giovanni is initially pleased with his daughter uh, the Cisian. He will have a daughter at home again uh, to keep him company and uh, to help him. But the situation at home is not working. To have some tension, and Giovanna, she is uh, 33, and Rosa, the youngest daughter, live uh, to Sevilla, their father's house, and uh, they get live uh, with their sister. The bond between the, the four sisters is very strong. They are often in Milano by Maria. Maria's husband leaves the village and immigrates in America uh, after a year of marriage. She is therefore quite free. And Teresa became a widow only four years after her marriage, this uh, 28, and she does not remarry. In this social context of, of an absence, women network between skin or in a religious group, I think, um, for example, of um, religion for other root, are very important and must be uh, investigated further. That is to, to bring to light female uh, network of support. As I know, as I show in my research, uh, um, for example, the role of Ursuline, who live at home and on in a convent, uh, uh, very important and widespread in Alpine valleys. But this is not the topic today. So, by the time, Juan is very upset uh, uh, by his daughter behaviors. For Giovanni, the theme of respectability and even sexual, sexual respectability of sons and daughters is central. Respectability is a key work to interpret the diary, his relationship with uh, his children, and uh, uh, this vision of women. He is afraid that his daughter's conduct and liberty will let them to be given a disreputable. In 63, he feared uh, that uh, Rosa is pregnant. It must say that Maria, in 56, had an illegitimate son from a, a young man of the village. The baby, prematurely born, is abandoned in front of a church. No one knows anything, right, Giovanni. It is not the only case of illegitimate pregnancy in the village that they report in the diary. Between 63 uh, and 64, Giovanni tried to reunify Giovanna and her husband for the best uh, recoup and uh, dowry, but he fails. Giovanna will never return to her husband and will, be, will live as a separate woman. 
Rosa and Giovanna uh, live with her father, but in a pre-64, Rosa, Rosa gave her father again. It seemed that the disagreement stemmed from the fact that Rosa was seeing a man who did not suit um, her father. Giovanni and Anastasia grew old. He feels that his family is falling apart and his fear of being left alone uh, grows. He's frustrated and unable to relate to his children with healthy, positive feelings and often get away. He needs to vent his frustration and hence he runs in the dear. He used some time harsh and sharp words to condemn his daughter's behavior. Shameless, resolute, and arrogant, write uh, Giovanni about Rosa. There is nonetheless a discrepancy between the word and actions. He always welcomed his children into his home and takes their side when necessary. He's friendly with Maria because of his illegitimate pregnancy, he writes on nasty remarks. But then they will reconcile with each other and Giovanni will try to be a grandfather for Maria's children. In terms of expression and writing style, we are far from the successful literary model conveyed by the Romantic literature at the end of the 18th century, and that we often find in the um, correspondences uh, of bourgeois families, for example. Novels such as Liula, Novelle de Louise of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, did not enter the homes of peasants and did not sharp shape their writing. Giovanni has no literary model on which to build when he put about his feelings for his children. And his children do not like the obedient and reasonable boy and girls described in books that circulated at the time in public schools, showing a loving family, obedient children, and a domestic space at its form and well governed by a caring mother. It is clear to us that what Giovanni described is not a relationship of differences that his children have for him. His children look for more freedom, but sometimes they do not know how to do. They act an impulsive and not always conscious way. There is not a clear strategy. Well, what should we conclude on the topic of agency in an environment environment? The question is not simple, and the documents of this type, critiques, ego documents, produced by the middle of low classes, have to be further investigated. My research is still at a preliminary stage. As underlined by Patrizia Avenino or Marina Cavalera, travelers in 18th and 19th centuries have often described the women on the Alpine Valleys in a negative way. Two legged, two legged beasts wrote one of them. Surely it was a lot of war and it was hard and easy. But a more complex image emerged from Giovanni's diary. A reality made up of active women with many skills, always on the move and with a very different of the territory they uh, regularly travel not without a uh, danger. Once uh, um, a, 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 a daughter of, of Giovanni is brutally aggressed. These women were called to feel the pain absence, not only without war, be it agricultural or both industrial, but also with decision making abilities to cope with complex and difficult situations. Many women could write. And in the China, the rate of female literacy was relatively high already at the end of 18th century, the 18th century. This context of May absence and certainly offer more opportunities for independence, but also increased female responsibility. Autonomy is also something that women must look especially in a context where formal power is still the hands of men and patriarchal, patriarchal structure are still very strong. 
What of note is also to the fact that the language used by Giovanni to talk about his daughter is often active. Beyond the actual word, it is clear that these women, in their small ways, are defying the existing order and the rules of society and trying to carry out spaces of action themselves, okay, their own experiences. And despite the very difficult economic uh, context. So we can say that agency arose from the variety of everyday interaction in which these women uh, negotiated uh, and uh, manipulated uh, social order or rule. So I think uh, it is important in order to bring to light female agency to study, uh, to study men and women's life trajectories. Doing that, we can escape or try to escape the logic of the uh, structures. I thank you for your attention. Um, so the, our first speaker today um, is Elena Masopilotka from Cambridge and um, She's going to speak about emerging from oblivion the unpublished letters of Maria Sabilovitz to Italian intellectuals at the turn of the 20th century. Thank you for the introduction. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the introduction. So, in today's presentation, I will explore the upcoming works of Maria Sabilovitz, who was a creative folklorist, teacher, and author of short stories, novels, and collections of Latin and popular traditions in costume and fashion design. The figure of Maria Sabirovets emerges powerfully from the vision which many women writers were relegated to during the 19th century. And this process of recovery is possible not only if we observe their vast literary introduction, but also if we examine in depth the correspondences with several Italian men of letters at the turn of the 20th century. Although Sabirovets' fame in the late 19th century went as far as the United States, uh, today, she hardly features even in works and anthologies specifically devoted to women writers in Italy. However, the depth of, biological, of biographical information on Sabirovets can be reflected by a wealth of first hand knowledge if attention is devoted to a rich uh, epistory. This presentation will therefore pay well deserved attention to this neglected woman writer by retracing their accomplishments through a study of her published letters. I will initially present a corpus of letters she wrote to several Italian intellectuals, from which it is possible to reconstruct some of the key events in her life. And I will then provide an overview of her literary production with attention to her contribution as a folklorist, focusing primarily but not exclusively on the correspondence between her and the Italian man of letters, Angelo de Vidermadis. And this paper stems precisely from the discovery in the National Library of Florence of an extensive unpublished correspondence between Maria Sabiotis and Angelo de Bernardis, who was a renowned uh, Orientalist philologist professor of Sanskrit in Florence and of Italian literature in Rome. Starting from this correspondence I, and from the dedications I found in her own books, I retraced the steps of her life and tracked down the letters she sent to other prominent figures, including Nobel Prize winner Giuseppe Carducci and Nico Bancora, who was uh, one of the most popular publishers of the time, uh, post-impressionist Spenter, Mario Puccini, literary critic Pino Ravena, and novelist Antonio Fugazzaro. This corpus of letters discusses a unique and intimate view on incessant activities of a woman who attempted to combine her studies with her manifold jobs and responsibilities. Yet the everyday difficulties didn't hinder her cosmopolitan interests and their determination to make a solid contribution to the cultural life of the time. Her ability to weigh relationships with famous publishers and illustrious figures is particularly grounded in her missives. She was certain in contact also with other men of letters, such as Benedetto Croce and Giuseppe Di Tre, the latter being often affectionately mentioned in her letters to the Vivernatis. So what I'm going to present today is obviously just the beginning of a process of rediscovery that I intend to continue in the future. These correspondences uh, help allows us to sketch a portrait of a late 19th century terrorist writer who was also a lecturer, a musician, a pedagogist, and a teacher, as well as a passionate scholar of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. The reassessment of Sabirovitz's life through her own words as they appear in the exchanges she interlaces, on the one hand, allows for the reimagines of her personal <coughs> anxieties and physical ailments and sad human vicissitudes. 
On the other, uh, on the other hand, these lectures reveal their wide ranging cultural interests and frenetic literary activity, permeated by a strong uh, patriotic spirit. As such, these letters lend themselves to multiple levels of interpretation and offer interesting insights into diverse areas of study. First and foremost, they constitute an important biographical and historical source, since, as we will see, they give us a wealth of information on Savi Lopez's life in 19th century, as a single woman who actually has a son in her own, on her relationship with him and his growth as he follows his mother's example, becoming a scholar and a university <coughs> professor, thanks to her serious care and in spite of the economic difficulties they endured. Her dignity constantly seeps through, together with an humbleness and composure, as well as her awareness of the value of her own works, which constituted for her also a source of sustenance. This, this correspondence has also unveiled the national and international web of relationships between Savi Lopez and several personalities of the time, not only the ones that previously mentioned, but also the politicians, scholars, writers, of which detailed references are provided, opening up a network of connections that would be very interesting to explore in further depth. Finally, this material offers previously unknown information on the publication process of their works, and as we will see, a great passion comes to light, especially for the works concerning sea legends and legends of the Alps, which she frequently collected in the field. In the field. So as far as her life is concerned, most of the biographical data in this slide can be deduced directly from what she wrote. Uh, she was born in Naples in 1846, although some contemporary sources wrongly indicate Apulia as the region of birth. During her youth, uh, she went to Turin, where she had taken shelter with her father, who escaped from Naples in order to avoid persecution by the Bourbon police uh, for political reasons. She married a Piedmontese doctor in, in 1875 in Turin, where St. Paolo was born the year after. In 1892, her husband died, and afterwards she started a publishing career in parallel with her work as a teacher in female secondary schools in Naples. There, she carried out her unceasing activity as a scholar while working as a teacher of letters in several institutes and simultaneously giving private lessons, moving far and wide across Naples to maintain other commitments. To devote herself to her beloved studies, she was forced to work often at night, having to reconcile her feverish interests with the care of her son. For her literary endeavors, she received several prizes and recognitions, including the honorary pension for literary merits by the Council of the Civil Order of Savoy in 1986, the Golden Medal for the lectures she presented at the Esibizione Beatrice in Florence in 1990, an exhibition devoted to Dante Alighieri's inspiring muse, during which female creativity was celebrated in, in its multiple forms, and the prestigious literary prize Janina Migli, awarded unanimously by the Royal Academies of Rome, Florence, Milan, Naples, and Venice in 1929, the same years when, when her son died at the age of 42. So this also was a watershed in her life, after which uh, she decided to move to the Catholic Institute, managed by the nuns belonging to the Orders of the Charity um, uh, in Naples. Uh, from this moment onwards, she lived in a monastic cell. And in spite of her old age, she continued working as a teacher to female workers. She died in Naples in 1940, at the age of 94, but even in the last years of her life, she continued writing and publishing tirelessly. So in her own words, uh, she considered herself as a topo da biblioteca, a bookworm. And she mentioned, as she mentioned in a letter to Antonio Fogazzaro, dated 9th, uh, 9th of October, 1895. She wrote him, and I will be quoting the English translation from now on, where you can find the original in Italian in this slide. Uh, so she wrote him that he has become uh, a sort of bookworm, spending hours in the state archive, in the civic library, or even in the visible archive on Lanzo, where I often go with my little Paolo. But I cannot do the necessary research easily. I'm obliged to leave through books and read on papers so swiftly that I get exhausted. But I think that in the first days of November, my students will come back, and I will no longer have time. In another letter to artist Mario Puccini, dated 4th February 1927, she provided further details uh, about her upbringing. She introduced herself with these words. I didn't go to school, but since I was a child, I've known she had a great passion for studying, and together with my blind mother, I enjoyed reading many serious books from my father's library. When I began a brother in Turin between a music and a drawing lesson and a French class in work, I had never seen the Alps uh, closely. I had, I had never had dealt with legends. Then, for my studies, I became an alpinist in the Lanzo Valley and I transcribed the legends of the Alps. 
I was invited to give some lectures despite being so shy and only used to living at home to take care of the house chores when my husband was alive. Now I'm retired. My work is simple and modest, but perhaps because I've always written but for an ardent passion for the topics I did and for doing some good, it was quite successful. A literary production, which counts over 60 volumes, spans a variety of genres, including novels, novels for young girls and boys, pedagogical works and anthologies for schools, historical and biographical works, and last but not least, folklore collections. Uh, but the contribution to the cultural life of design didn't end there. Savi Lopitz collaborated also with national and international journals and was in contact with the most important publishing houses of design. A sensitive and refined scholar, she had a deep respect for her interlocutors, but she was also aware of her own skills and fame, which went beyond national borders. Indeed, as previously mentioned, her notoriety reached the other side of the world. She was invited to contribute to the World's Fair held in Chicago in 1893 and sent 15 of her works to be exposed at that occasion in the Women's Building Library, as she stated proudly in a letter to the Gubernatis. A considerable repertoire of her works concerns uh, children's literature. She collaborated with the children's journal in Giornalino della Domenica, directed by Luigi Bertelli, which hosted also Sardinian short stories by Grazia de Larga, Sicilian tales by Luigi Caguana, and frequent contributions by Ida Baccini. Sabino Bazzot also wrote other works for children with a clear uh, pe pedagogical uh, intent, um, uh, such as the novel Creatures of God and Educational Beings for Elementary Schools, but her strongest pas passion resided in popular legends and ancient myths. So we can deduce a uh, detailed background information on her work as a folklorist from the lengthy correspondence with the Gubernatis. This corpus consists of 63 letters written in a period ranging from February 1888 to December 1894. As mentioned earlier, the Gubernatis was an eclectic intellectual, founder of numerous literary journals, and author of renowned works in comparative ethnology. In their correspondence, uh, Sadirov is addressed him initially in a very differential way, but then her tone gradually became more friendly and affectionate. Savinovitz embraced the Gubernatis initiatives with enthusiasm and joined him to create um, a new society, um, National Society for Italian Popular Traditions. The exchange of letters became an opportunity for Savinovitz to inform him about the studies that interested him. In the first place, uh, popular legends, a strongest passion, collected in various books, uh, including the ones that you can see on the screen, uh, of which we can follow the broader process of composition. Being so fond of Italian and international legends, his studies include uh, American, Icelandic, Bulgarian, Lapish, Russian, and Mexican popular narratives, among others. In a letter to the Gubernatis, she revealed that she was happy that the anemic society of popular traditions uh, founded by, Cis by uh, Giuseppe Di in Sicily would take on a broader national and international vision thanks to the newly founded Society for Popular Traditions so as to farcionare anche all'estero, to do at home or even abroad. In order to complete uh, the writing of her book on sea legends, uh, Sadi Lopez asked the Gubernatis to publish an heartfelt appeal to the scholars who collaborated with his journal, Natura e l'Arte. In a letter dated 23rd February 1888, she expressed the intention to compare Italian sea legends with those of other nations, searching for uh, la leggenda marina marinaresca nella sua più fantastica e poetica espressione, the sea legend in its most imaginative and poetic expression. It was therefore necessary to involve as many scholars as possible in this patriotic project in order to give national relevance to the volumes she was planning to write. Indeed, in these letters we witness the feverish work she undertook to collect legends, which Savi Lopez frequently gathered in person. On the 6th of August 1885, uh, Savi Lopez was in Balne, uh, an Italian town in the Lanzo Valleys, to document the legend and tales of the mountain dwellers uh, who will eventually be gathered in a collection of legends from the Lanzo Valleys. She was extremely scrupulous in the collection of uh, uh, resources and regularly traveled with a guide or alone through the mountainous paths, even at high altitudes, to gather stories of these places from the mouth of local people. In another letter to the Gubernatis, dated 6 September 1893, she emphasized her commitment to collecting popular narratives, and I'm quoting, others couldn't have gone ahead in this undertaking, and perhaps I alone know all the difficulties I had to overcome to find in Italy people who wished to be part of our society and collect our legends. 
How many died under so much hardship I had to endure when I went alone without guide to collect light legends about our Alps? Her excursions revolved around the aforementioned area of the Lanto Valleys in the Western Alps, uh, which you can see in the map. These valleys became a popular tourist uh, destination for the upper middle class in Turin at the end of the 19th century. In several letters to Antonio Fogazzaro, Sadi Lopez underlined the physical and mental fatigue experienced while walking through the Alps to collect legends. In her introduction to the book The Lanzo Valleys, published in 1996, she declared that she considered the work as an immense tribute of love for Piedmont, which generously welcomed many exiles, with clear reference to the father's exile from Naples. And when she described this process of collection, she often admitted that she was leading a strange life. And she was fully aware that this perceived oddity stemmed from her being a woman, and moreover a woman from southern Italy, working in late 19th century Turin. She herself highlighted during the composition of the book on the Lanzo Valleys how much courage it took her to face and overcome this level of discrimination as she wrote to Fogazzaro on the 19th November 1885 and then quoting. These good Piedmontese rightly have a passionate and tenacious affection for their region. Many of them love especially the Lanzo Valleys, and you can therefore imagine how this book written by a woman, a Neapolitan woman, is welcomed. Perhaps many serious men laughed at the audacity I showed in putting myself through this endeavor. So although rigid labels are never useful, it is legitimate to ask ourselves whether Savi Lopez's life uh, can be interpreted in a proto-feminist perspective. In a letter sent to publisher Enrico Benquera, dated 14 January uh, 1908, she wrote, No one can be more feminist than me, in the good sense. I often remember the painful days when I became a widow, alone in the world, with a five-year-old child, poor, without a diploma. Ladies didn't have one at the time. And then, little by little, in the obvious and continuous struggle, the diplomas, um, the chair of letter, the pension for civic merit came, and the child became, at the age of 29, a full university professor. Sadie Lopez had to roll up her little sleeves, earn a living for many years in Naples, alone with her son, giving history and, and Italian lessons. And then, with uncommon intelligence, intelligence and sensitivity, she began her career by writing novels and short stories, finding effectively a room on her, of her own to live in discreet comfort, cultivating a fashion that will never abandon her, even at a considerable age and even after her son's death. She strenuously defended the rights with publishers, negotiating the selling price of her knowledge to, uh, novels to her advantage. She courageously crossed the Alps, with or without a guide, facing the night, cold and fog, and the inaccessible altitudes to collect stories and legends from local people. Although she never had a formal education when she was young, as she grew up, she thoroughly spent her time in libraries and archives, writing in her own words, pazzamente, in a frenzy, subtracting time from sleep in order to write essays, lectures, articles for journals and magazines, often translating from French and English, studying Latin. She affirmed their own individuality, working on sleeping to guarantee a dignified standard of living for her son, always pers pursuing her ideals and demonstrating unreachable courage. So I would like to conclude with the words that she wrote to Antonio Fugazzaro on the 4th of November 1885, which resonate with the theme of this conference and remind us about the importance of recovering forgotten identities. And Sadie Lovitz wrote, I became passionate for old papers. It seems to me that if I had the time, I would do nothing but searching for old memories and for the figures. I would like to illustrate works that no one has ever printed and which rest among countless volumes in the archives. It is so easy to talk about those that everyone knows, and it would instead be a useful and merciful endeavor to remind Italy of those who were forgotten. Thank you. our second speaker, uh, Martina Pala, <coughs> um, who will speak about uh, La Donia, La Donia, Bolani's narrative, uh, Voice in Silence, Women. So I must apologize because uh, in my slides there will be um, 
mostly quotes from the novels uh, by Lavinia Bonanni, but they are, have never been translated, just one of them, and mm, the quotes from that novel will be in English, but the other ones are not a translator, and it's very difficult to decide what to pronounce, so I couldn't dare to translate it. It would be uh, in Italian, but I will explain them, so that it shouldn't be a, a problem. Uh, Lavinia Bonanni is a 20th century Italian uh, writer, almost forgotten nowadays. Uh, only few of her novels are still edited by small and independent publishing houses, and in recent times, only a few uh, scholars, um, Gianfranco Giustizieri and Fausto Maritana, to be precisely, focus uh, repeatedly on her uh, opera only on her whole works and try to um, publish an edited writings and uh, her epistolary. Uh, she has been nominated to uh, Premio Strega in 1960, 1964, 1975, and 1979, in the finals three times out of four. Uh, in the first, an author of children's literature, she then obtained a acknowledgement um, uh, in 1948 because she won uh, a prize given by Amici della Domenica, um, so the, the group around Maria Bellonci, for her um, the first uh, collection of short stories uh, in Fosso. Uh, she was praised by critics such as uh, Cech Kifaqui, Montale, and her activity as a writer was interrupted because of some depressive crisis, but also because she uh, started to see her novels being rejected by her publishing house, which was uh, Bonpiano at that time. Her name and her works are now uh, almost forgotten. In the last years of her life, she witnessed a gradual lack of interest towards her writings and her career. In her epistolary, she uh, complained uh, about it mostly with Maria Bellonci. Uh, Fausto Maritani, for example, um, argued that this uh, gradual lack of interest was due to her stile mescolato and to the realism of the themes. I argue that she is not taking into consideration the most important uh, fact that she is a woman writing in 20th century Italy and male dominated environment. And, um, so she shares the destiny that uh, many other uh, women writers uh, live and face uh, in the 20th century. They are never inserted within an ideal canon and they um, are less likely awarded or uh, promoted or studied. Uh, Lavinia Bonami has deep relationships with, um, with women writers from the 20th century. She um, speaks about the Ginicello Literari, but only a few of the names of the many women she and writers she used to meet and uh, know um, uh, are now studied or remembered or read. Um, um, so I argue that she is victim of what Dacia um, uh, Maraini described as the stima comune degli scrittori italiani. Moreover, her attitude towards male critics and writers um, didn't help her for sure because she was a very uh, benevolent with women writers. She uh, wrote to them and she uh, asked for advice. Uh, while she was very harsh with uh, male critics, she uh, complained with them because of their lack of attention. She asked back for uh, books she sent uh, to them because they weren't paying enough attention, so it didn't help her. And she was um, aware that she was less privileged than them and that she uh, needed their approval in order to be uh, published, read, and reviewed. Um, Authors such as Nobel Ginsburg or Elsa Morante are still quite studied, of course less than men, also because I argue they compromise with their women as writers. They um, took a distance from labels such that of feminist, for example, or even that of scriptrice more generally. Uh, while Bonanni never compromised with their womanhood as writer, as a writer, she um, uh, was involved with women's representation both in her narrative but also in her private life and writing. Um, and um, so um, while uh, her works were mainly uh, studied uh, by um, traditional scholarship because of her um, attention, for example, to, um, to childhood, because she was a school teacher and she uh, worked in uh, juvenile and family courts, I argue that uh, one thing that must be rediscovered in one of his works, um, in addition to her whole career is that of the attention and the representation of women in their writings. Uh, because she uh, manages to offer up um, a portrait of women never stereotypical, and uh, she actually anticipates um, gender theories, for example, uh, which have not been theorized yet in Italy at least. Um, and this makes the expression feminismo which was used um, even if very uh, precise. 
Um, for this analysis, I um, highlighted three um, uh, macro themes which can help us in uh, analyzing her whole words, uh, which are um, motherhood and domesticity, sexuality and rebellion, and gender based violence. I argue that through these themes, she manages to give us the portraits of women that I was saying uh, before. Um, as for the first theme, um, Limputada uh, is a good example. This is a polyphonic novel in which characters rarely stand out singularly. More often, a third plural person is used to indicate categories of characters, uh, the children and the mothers particularly. The bond between these two categories is strong and problematic, and uh, these mothers are, first of all, outer stereotypes. Every time they reflect on their role um, of mothers by ending up um, recognizing a sort of slavery uh, in it imposed by a uh, society uh, built by men. Um, yeah, they are often pushed by the unspeakable desire to get rid of their children, and as their fellow characters, these numerous women are aware that the cage in which they live uh, may also of socially constructed kinds of beauty, for example, is due to um, a system uh, built uh, by men against women. This is what she um, makes her characters say. Nevertheless, they are never perceivable as mere victims. Uh, their strength in raising their children is highlighted by the narrator. In this novel, when Anne questions the role of motherhood itself, not only she brings into question the, the natural tendency uh, of women to be mothers and to want to be mothers, um, wanting to be mothers, but she also questions the need to give birth uh, given the society in which these children would grow. At the end, the narrator recognizes by motherhood because this is uh, something that puts women at the center of the society in which they live. However, the protagonists keep blaming themselves uh, for being stuck into a strict role and uh, forcing their children and living them off words and for them. Critics have traditionally interpreted the title in Putada as referring to war. Um, of course, this is a a good argument because, of course, war uh, covers an important role within this novel, and it, uh, but I wanted to show the effect of war uh, on poor people and on their struggles. But I argue, and uh, some other argue, that this um, title is ambiguous. The feminine form of the noun makes also think that the imputata could be the, the woman uh, herself. Uh, and it is not a case that the translation, that the Spanish translation of the novel, uh, is titled El Proceso de la Mujer, so it is made quite explicit. Uh, the only, for example, committed to this interpretation. However, I argue that um, this is not uh, a process uh, made up by women against women, the women of the, um, of the novel and women in general, uh, as the only um, argued. I argue that this uh, process is more, um, this trial is more made by women against themselves when they try to compromise between their role of mothers and their role and their sense of imprisonment because of it. Uh, there's also another role in which motherhood is quite important, and again, the protagonist is not a stereotypical or a traditional mother. First of all, because she does not give birth. She marries a widow with a son, and she gradually accepts this son as her own uh, son, and this uh, relationship, this son-mother-son relationship. Although she ends up recognizing her role of mother, uh, she's not afraid of expressing her disgust against uh, for the idea of giving birth. This is not unusual in Italian uh, literature from the 20th century. Uh, there are examples of Saint Amelia Ginsburg and Anna Banti, for example, and it is significant. It, it breaks the stereotype according to which it is biological and uh, natural for a woman to desire to give birth. Uh, when the protagonist visits her neighbor, the actual mother of Giuliano, um, after giving birth, while everyone around her um, is happy and enthusiastic for the uh, for the happening, she describes and she perceives both the mother and the baby burn as dead. And when she thinks about herself uh, giving birth, she first of all she can't um, speak in first person. She starts uh, speaking. Um, she sees herself as other, and she's speaking third person. And she describes herself as clavicola, tortured. Um, furthermore, when the protagonist finds out that she's pregnant, her reaction is feeling scared, but mostly uh, humiliated and disgusted again. again. Her psychological status is replicated also from a physical point of view because she's kept say, she's told that um, she's unsuitable, physically unsuitable for a giving birth. Uh, and her physical inadequacy is balanced by her husband's virility. People keep congratulating to him while she's again humiliated for her past people um, in the event, within the event, and because she doesn't feel happy or grateful. These kind of feelings are strictly linked with the idea that motherhood and marriage uh, bring domesticity, thus the end of freedom. She's socially constructed, um, believing that being the mother is the only destiny she can face and she can 
uh, go through. But the protagonist admits later that the choice of getting married was simply the only by the desire to um, emancipate herself from her family and find freedom. On the contrary, she finds herself trapped into stereotypical roles that the family uh, unavoidably and socially involves. Uh, she wishes to gain freedom, uh, but she ends up being the property of another man she admits to herself. Um, La Lumbra um, was uh, published in 1964, uh, 14 years before the abortion was made legal uh, by law in Italy. Nevertheless, Guran makes her protagonist, her main uh, character, reflect on it, highlighting the hypocrisy of men in forbidding it. The issue is not kept on a private level, she, the protagonist finishes um, her reflection by wishing a revolution and changing the legal structure of the society. Thus, Guran manages to reflect on this. Um, uh, issue, uh, not only uh, anticipating the, the, the discussions, the political discussions that will, there will be in Italy, but only putting already it on a, on a political level rather than on a personal and private level. Uh, La Lunda is a good note also to um, uh, a good example of how, um, through her characters, Bonanni shows awareness of the existence of a double standard as for, as for sexual conduct. Um, here it is made quite explicit because the main uh, the, the plot is around the, the fact that this woman, the protagonist, uh, cheats on her husband, and uh, she reflects uh, on the fact that she's the only blame in this uh, uh, in this relationship because she is a woman. Um, a good a representation of the existence of a double standard um, as for sexual conduct uh, is present also in the Italia. This is written in first person, and the point of view adopted is that of a man, one of the fascists who did not the, uh, the pregnant uh, partisan who's the real protagonist of the novel. Uh, the main point of view is made quite neutral, actually, and it manages to give voice both, both to the main gaze, which is conveyed by the other fascists who kidnapped the protagonist, and which um, coincides with the more general gaze of the society, but also to the woman's point of view. Um, the, the woman is called by this, um, and it's is called by this um, man, uh, Troia, all the time, not only because she's a partisan or because she's pregnant and not married, but mostly because she's a woman. And thus, she's uh, a corrupted being by nature. Um, she's, uh, the protagonist, however, is not um, afraid of this. She, uh, her voice is, not, uh, is, is loud as well. And um, she does not feel the need to defend her reputation from what is said about her. She's well aware, aware of the stereotypes um, which she's victim of, and she quite uses them um, as a tool uh, to um, impose herself on her enemies and her personality. She doesn't need the, she doesn't feel the need to uh, to defend herself from these accusations. And again, uh, the most important trait of this novel is that the protagonist again does not keep this uh, struggle on a personal level, making her life even harsher. But she um, um, she um, brings it to, again, a public and a political uh, level. The protagonist in her direct speeches anticipates uh, sociological issues and concepts uh, not yet theorized. She recognizes double standards between society and men when it comes to judge sexual behavior. And she denies the existence of any trace of nature in it. Uh, she claims that men themselves deliberately created a system in which only women are blamed as sinful. Um, the first part um, of La Lutra, I am um, switching to the third um, thing, I'm sorry, the gender-based violence, uh, it's quite useful uh, in order to, to talk about gender-based violence in Guarani's novels. Uh, in the first part of the novel, there is the journey that the protagonist um, makes in order to meet her lover. Uh, throughout her journey by train, the woman is protagonist of events that Bonanni recognizes as forms of gender based violence, and the I argue. In 1964, again, in Italy, rape was still considered a crime against public uh, moral, not against the individual, in a country in which the most evident and intrusive forms of violence uh, were not always recognized as such. Bonanni manages to identify more subtle, form, more subtle forms of violence and to highlight the patriarchal nature of them. Indeed, the protagonist is victim of what nowadays we call men spreading on public transport. And she's consciously um, uncomfortable with this behavior. And the Ferrand years later will fictionalize this kind of um, form of violence um, in the Muni Molesto, for example. But Bonanti precursor her in 1964. And uh, in Le Droghe, um, the, the violence is made even more explicit. Um, there is a relevant passage in which Bonanti shows not only to be able to recognize a form of sexual harassment. Um, as form of sexual harassment tactic that still nowadays are considered as such with ridiculous in the movie. But she's also able to use her sarcastic and ironic tone in order to highlight how the victims of violence 
uh, we have victims of violence, uh, we become also victims of public opinion. Uh, in a moment in which the concept of victim shaming uh, has not been theorized yet, uh, and in a country which still now is, there is not an expression which uh, describes this kind of this phenomenon. Um, Bonami um, recognized it as a problem, as a part of the violence against women. Indeed, when she's very young and the violence is molested by some boys, and the harassment is recognized as first, but nevertheless, later, soon later, uh, she's considered the cause of the event and of the violence, while the boys are excluded from the guilt. Um, thus, um, in conclusion, um, Bonami, through her narrative, offers deep reflections on motives and socialist issues that were and still were and yet perceived as urgent in 1960 or in 1980s. But she shows great awareness and sensibility for her female characters. They are never stereotypical. They are boys, even if, um, or because she, they were uh, traditionally silenced both on a literary level than, uh, and on a social level. And uh, the most important part is that she um, anticipates some gender theories which were um, unknown in Italy. Of course, she has a conceptualization of gender which is still uh, dichotomical and She's far from conceptualizing a gender um, which is fluid and which is a spectrum. This is obvious because she's from the 1960s. But I argue that she um, um, tried to help the condition of women through her narratives. And this makes uh, even more uh, pitiful the fact and unfair the fact that she's uh, a writer almost forgotten nowadays. Thank you. Thank you. that you're from Tara uh, University. <laughs> our our <coughs> last speaker is uh, Alessia from Glasgow, and she will speak about mythologies of resistance, the family's legacy of Leonora Carrington and our other <coughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much for having me. I'm sorry, I'm just going to sit down because we've got a series of props here. Um, so yes, uh, before I start, I will apologize because uh, I actually did translate Merini's passages from the Italian, which are, uh, there is no official translation, so you will bear with my uh, translation of her memoir that I will be uh, discussing today. Uh, but I left the original in Italian as well for you uh, to read, so I hope that that will be okay. So, my paper today focuses on Leonora Carrington's and Alda Meridius memoirs of mental illness and hospitalization. And my aim is to demonstrate how, in these works, the two authors deliver a powerful feminist message of resistance against oppression, resorting to myth and symbolism. And uh, this paper is taken as part of my PhD thesis, which is in course of completion. To be key in my analysis are Joseph Campbell's theory of the monomyth and Estelle Lauter's work on feminist revisionist making. According to Lauter, the images that arise from many of the avant-garde works produced by women creators in the 20th century express, quote, a sense of collective female experience which women have missed much during much of their patriarchal experience, end quote. Through a close reading of some crucial passages of the memoirs, I will demonstrate that this is the case also for Carrington and Marini, whose words not only bridge the gaps of incommunicability of their traumatic experiences, carrying out a healing function, but um, also succeed in exposing the inadequacy of a polycentric society, transforming the personal in political. So before um, entering the um, analysis of uh, the memoirs, I will just provide some brief biographical information on these authors. So Leonora Carrington was born in Lancaster in 1917 to an upper-class family. In 1934, while she was studying painting in London, she met the Surrealist painter Max Ernst, and the two moved together to Paris, joining the Surrealist Circle, and it is the reason why Carrington is mostly known as a Surrealist painter. Um, in 1939, Ernst was arrested as an enemy alien and taken to a concentration camp. In the meantime, Carrington was persuaded by a friend to leave France because of the imminent threat of war. She found herself in Spain under the Franco regime, where she suffered a mental breakdown and she was hospitalized in a sanatorium in Santander in the summer of 1940. 
There she remained for several months, experiencing, as, as she says, suffering in its essence. Luckily, her situation improved and she managed to leave the hospital, although she literally had to run away from um, her parents because they wanted to hospitalize her once again, this time in South Africa. Um, then she managed to move to escape and move to London and then uh, to Mexico City, where she lived uh, the rest of her life. Um, and in Mexico City is where she published the memoir of illness down below in 1943. And here I have some of the uh, different editions of both memoirs. Alda Merini was born in Milan in 1931 from a lower middle class family and from a very young age she was a prolific poet. However, according to her autobiography, her parents disapproved of her poetic inclination. And this is an experience that was also, is also common to Carrington, whose authoritative father did not support her creativity. Age 22, Marini got married to bakery owner Ethel Carniti, and in 1965, after giving birth to her second child, she found herself in serious mental distress. One night, she was sent to a psychiatric hospital after an episode of domestic violence, and it is still very unclear what happened that night. There is a testimony of her daughters that remember <coughs> that the father came, up, came back home drunk and they had a um, domestic fight, and then suddenly an ambulance was called and she found herself in a Palopini mental hospital. Um, the thing is that she would remain there for 10 years after that night. Um, going in and out of the hospital, so um, asking to be hospitalized again uh, of her own will. Um, 20 years after her first hospitalization, she interrupted her poetic silence, uh, collecting her memories of the asylum in two works, La Terra Santa, uh, The Holy Land, a collection of poems, and La Traderita di Arena Diversa, uh, which I would translate as The Other Truth, Diary of an Other, or of an Outcast, an Outsider, something like that, uh, published in 1986. So, both Stampilo and Diario di una Diversa are expressly autobiographical works. Uh, they are written in the first person. They start with a narration of the events that led to the author's traumatic hospitalizations and guide the reader through a lucid and painful recollection of the terrible memories of the asylum. Looking at the overall structure of the memoirs, it is possible to trace a circular motion that is comparable to the circular structure of the monument, theorized by Joseph Campbell in 1949. There is a first phase of descent in hell, which is represented by the asylum, um, and is also characterized by mainly animal metaphors in both memoirs. Um, and then uh, there is also, and this is also characterized by our resistance to the incarceration. A middle phase of trials and tribulations in which the reader learns about the brutalizing treatments that Carrington and Merini endured while in the hospital. And finally, a phase of ascent towards the final liberation, characterized by religious, by religious um, and mystical metaphors. What distances these stories from the classic monument, though, is that the heroes are, in this case, women, and that there is no princess to be saved. Or, to put it otherwise, the princess to be saved coincides with the hero, as she has to save herself. Both Carrington and Merini, in fact, put themselves at the center of their journeys, unlocking a powerful process of analysis of their conditions of subaltern turns that transforms them into the agents of their own liberation. For instance, reflecting on her experience, Carrington realizes through her memoir that, quote, this affair concerned myself alone, and if I could make the journey all over again, I would get hold of myself. In the opening of the memoir, Carrington also talks about the important thought gathering the threads which might have led me across the initial border of knowledge, which is how she describes the process of collecting and interpreting her memories and their symbolism. And so we can see some of the uh, keywords I quite unelegantly un 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 here, um, such as journey, knowledge, the idea of myself, the idea that this uh, moment of uh, terrible pain will lead, pain will lead to a self-discovery. Merini's narrative is also one that is conscious of its value, as she clearly explains when she writes that <laughs> having lived in an asylum and having interpreted this lived experience is not something that everyone can do, not to mention having managed to get out of it, which was extraordinarily difficult as it is dangerous to abandon the depths of one's anguish in order to venture in society. 
Furthermore, to strengthen the parallels between Marini's diary and the monument is the fact that she refers to the experience as a voyage through hell and heaven, quoting Dante's Divina Commedia. What is interesting in Marini's case is that she also paralleled hell to the real world, and so in Marini's case there is a double, uh, a, a double condition of being stuck, because also going back to the real world uh, will coincide with a condition of alienation. Sorry. Uh, another important trait that links Carrington's and Merini's memoirs uh, to the quest narrative is the identification of, of an archetypal monster, which the hero has to fight in order to regain freedom. I argue that the archetypal monster that both authors are battling against in their narratives is patriarchal and state violence. At the beginning of her of narration, Carrington reveals that after her breakdown, I had realized the injustice of society. I wanted, first of all, to cleanse myself then go beyond its brutal ineptitude. And I must say here that some of these themes are very recurrent uh, in surrealism, so the idea of being against the bourgeoisie, being against, being against fascist um, um, yeah. ideology, but she takes them to a, a next level, focusing especially on the situation of herself as a woman artist. Um, so she openly addresses the patriarchy in Down Below by calling the figures of those who were trying to influence her life, such as her father and her doctors, as the fathers, and paralleling these figures to the threatening presence of the Nazi soldiers in France and the Catholic militia in Spain. Melini, on the other hand, identifies the archetypal monster with the hypocrisy of society that, as she writes, represents the real hell on earth. The asylum I lived outside and that I am still experiencing is not comparable to that other torture that at least left us the hope of the world. The real hell is outside, here with the other people who judge you, criticize you, and don't love you. La parola, as Medina explains, the word, is the tool that allows her to survive her ordeal and find back her voice, which has been silenced by her jailers. The written poetic word in particular becomes therefore the, the vehicle of her liberation, as she also tells us. And so I wrote a book, and I also put poetry in it, so that our jailers could see that in the asylum it is difficult to defeat the primal spirit, the spirit of childhood, which is not and never will be corrupted by anyone. With these words, Merini reivindicates her identity as a poet, and with it she recovers the, her sense of self and her right to existence. Like Carrington, who had the sensibility to understand that something terrible was about to take place in the 40s, Merini's poetic voice takes up prophetic qualities and becomes the only sane and uncorrupted voice in a toxic society where people seem to have lost their ability of caring for others. Merini's awareness of being a victim of, patriarchal and capital, of a patriarchal and capitalist system designed to leave behind those who are the most vulnerable is also reiterated in her later works, where she reflects specifically on the condition of women, as she does in La Pazza della Corte Accanto. Yes, she writes, because women are educated to madness. They are instructed in the ways of fetishism from an early age. She has to love parts, venerate the objects of the house, keep them clean, take care of them. The house becomes the symbol of matriarchy. Not even feminism has managed to eradicate these symbols. Finally, you feel you're going crazy among these fetishes. The clothes you wear become heavy. This is why, when having a crisis, the first thing that a mad person does is to tear off their clothes. It is evident from these quotes that, although skeptical towards feminism, Merini does indeed convey a feminist message through her writing. And she does so by exposing patriarchal oppression and denouncing the relegation of women to the domestic sphere. So also in my case, I obviously not, don't want to portray her as a feminist, but I want to show how through her work she is still caring for other women um, and, and talking about her experience not only as a personal but also a political experience. With these words, Merini shows how the objectification and politicization of women often leads to mental illness and seems to be suggesting that this is one of the reasons behind the breakdown. The cry, this cry for justice and equality finds also expression in the diary, where Merini again refers to women's oppression when reflecting on her experience. But at the time, the law was very clear, and the reality was that in 1965, women were still subject to men, and men could decide for women's future. 
But wasn't I in a human rebellion? Was I not asking to enter a world that had already belonged to me? Why did they think that that rebellion was an act of insubordination? Nerini encounters human rebellion in the face of society's brutal, brutal ineptitude, as Carly Tully puts it, was first suppressed through coercive hospitalization, but could find expression in a second moment thanks to the liberating power of his memoirs. So now for, for time constraints, I won't be able to go through all the phases that I have alighted on this journey, but I will focus on the final one, which is the phase of ascent, that is the one of his most um, rich in symbolism and religious imagery. So Merini's revisionism is making reaches its apex when she compares herself with the figure of Jesus Christ. Merini was a devoted Christian, however, as Laura Whitman notes, her evocation of the divine seems full of contradictions, ranging from the canonically Catholic to the clearly transgressive. Yet, it is only through the written word that Merini is able to transform the initial horror of her institutionalization into divine purpose and mystical redemption. Hence, it is not only her suffering, but the ability to record and array this suffering in order to, ch to challenge oppression and its mechanisms that encourages Medini to tell her story. Mythologizing the asylum, she is able to show how, together with her fellow inmates, she was ultimately able to reach ecstasy through sacrifice and martyrdom. Describing her first uh, electroshock therapy session, Medini remembers, they put me in bed, but no one carries my forehead. They tied my hands and feet, and in that moment, in that precise moment, I leave the passion of Christ. The parallels with Jesus are further reiterated in the poem La Terra Santa, the Holy Land, where she writes, and this is the only one that is an official translation, <laughs> not mine. Uh, but one day from within my coffin, I too reawakened, and I too, like Jesus, had my resurrection. But I did not race to the skies, I descended to hell, from where I watched astonished the walls of ancient Jericho. Pervaded by the sense of sublime that characterizes the writing of the asylum, Merini explains how her ascension, lived from within the hospital, that for this reason become the Holy Land, is comparable to the ecstasy experienced by Jesus. Faithful to her literary ambivalence, however, Merini makes clear that her sentence does not retrace Christ's experience. Merini's reworking of the resurrection myth is an acknowledgement that urges the readers not to forget the dramatic reality of institutionalization. Unlike Christ, in fact, she has no place in heaven, exactly as she has no place in a society that has never accepted her for what she is, a woman and a poet. Merini's final ascent becomes, therefore, a voluntary descent into madness, which is represented as a choice of alterity. This strategy is also defined by racial duplessis in relation to women's mismaking, which she defines as defection or committed identification with otherness. This way, Merini portrays herself as a sort of Christ in hell, embodying a hybrid divine figure that is simultaneously powerful and disturbing. This constant shifting between sacred and profane, sin and redemption, salvation and damnation, is at the core of the Meridian aesthetic, and it is what makes her writing so fascinatingly ambiguous. Their interpretation of pain as a sign of ascent and the conversion of the asylum from a hellish to a sacred place space is also present in the final moments of Cunnington's journey, where she identifies the depths of the asylum that she calls um, abajo in Spanish or down below, with the location of her final liberation. Here in the sun room, I felt I was manipulating the firmament. I had found what was essential to solving the problem of myself in relationship to the sun. I believed that I was being put through purify, purifying tortures so that I might attain absolute knowledge, at which point I could live down below. I love this part. <laughs> Um, with this work, Carrington is entering the crossing stage that preempts her final ascent with a sense of empowerment and newfound awareness, and also with a little bit of a hint of playfulness. Mimicking biblical and alchemical language, she is able to manipulate the firmament exactly as God does, and capitalizes the words myself and absolute knowledge again, she says as her goals, reminding the reader that these are the goals of her journey as a hero. 
This way, she is also challenging the canonical idea that the journey to knowledge is an experience exclusive to men, as the tradition was. The invocation of purifying tortures recalls the references to spiritual and bodily suffering also present in Nerini and evokes the accounts of the lives of the saints. Furthermore, by stating that she wants to find an explanation for a relationship with the sun, which is a traditional representation of masculinity, Carrington demonstrates that she is trying to find her place in the world, also in relation to her male counterpart, not just us, myself. As Lothar writes, quote, in myth, the woman is associated with the moon, not the sun, and human beings do not traffic with, this, with celestial bodies without peril, end of quote. Carrington breaks these traditional rules and presents a new revisionist mess, telling the story of a woman who is not afraid to manipulate the firmament to resist her jailers. Finally, like Merini, also Carrington performs a subversive reading of Christ. In Don Below, she identifies with the Holy Ghost and compares its feminine traits in order to restore women's place within the divine. She remembers how in the asylum she opened a copy of the Bible to a passage describing the descent of the Holy Ghost and that enlightened her own going search for symbols. Identifying with the Holy Ghost and the moon, Carrington offers a solution to one of the fundamental problems that she encountered in her journey, the erasure of women from history, the same realization that triggered Merini's human rebellion. In a gesture that is as radical as Merini's martyrdom, Carrington literally ousts Christ and takes his place in the sacred trinity in order to restore gender balance. The sun was the sun, and I, the moon, an essential element of the trinity, with a microscopic knowledge of the earth, its plants and creatures. I knew that Christ was dead and done for, and that I had to take his place, because the trinity, minus a woman and microscopic knowledge, had become dry and incomplete. I was Christ on earth, in the person of the Holy Ghost. In this passage, Carrington is using her esoteric knowledge to question the absence of the female element in the Christian trinity, which is the reason why it is dry and incomplete. Because the Holy Trinity is formed by the Father and the Son, female attributes can only be compared to its essential element, the Holy Ghost. However, Carrington also identifies with the androgen, presenting an image of complete harmony and union that escape any possible critique of essentialism. Carrington's decision to take Christ's place in the form of the Holy Ghost is used as the ultimate representation of a realistic vision of harmony, in contrast with the damage that the promoters of the war were causing with their action. Like Merini, who does not ascend to heaven but chooses to remain in hell and keep the memory of the voiceless alive, Carrington remains on earth, as this is where her mission as an artist and an advocate of equality has to be accomplished. Hence, both authors ultimately present, through their writing, a call to compassion and peace, and an invitation to resist the patriarchy and its violence. So, to conclude with this paper, I have argued that Carrington and Medina assign a higher purpose to their journeys, transforming their ordeals into mythical and mystical quests, an act that enables them to renegotiate their experiences and to skill skillfully map their way, out, their way out of their traumas. I have shown how the reflections on the mechanisms of power that define our modern civilization are especially aimed at unveiling the brutality of patriarchal oppression in a century that was heavily charged with collective trauma. Seeing these lights, Carrington's and Bellini's memoirs can be read as narratives that hold a powerful feminist message that teaches us that men can be a, pre a precious tool in the process of recovering women's identities through writing and art. Thank you. <laughs> First speaker is Baker Ozler. Baker Ozler is a PhD student at the University of Exeter in Italian Literature. Currently, she is working on a research project uh, called, uh, entitled uh, Query Families and Modes of Belonging in Contemporary Italian Literature. Right. She holds a BA in English Literature and Italian Literature from the University of Istanbul in Turkey. And her research interests include the queer theory, queer temporality in space, gender studies, contemporary women's writing, and visual art. Today, she will talk about walking into the queer ecology of Strava in Thank you for the introduction.
accepting my application. Um, today I'm going to give a paper on uh, small images of 2007 novel, uh, Stratocon Chinese Jay. But before I start with the paper, I would like to give a few details about the characters, main characters of the novel. Uh, Vera is the protagonist and she leaves everything behind and starts a journey walking by the side of the highway. And one important detail about her is that her name is not revealed until the 60th page of the novel. And before that, in the first 60 pages, she was presented as La Donna. Uh, the second one is Dima. He is a survivor of uh, the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. And he lives in Italy illegally, and he's a refugee. Uh, Vera and Dima have this friendship, uh, sometimes looking as like brothers and sisters together. And they, they try to keep, take care of one, one another unconditionally in very critical moments in the novel. Uh, Franco is a very old man. He's been living in the same highway space for many years, and he works as the memory of this, of this highway space. He lost his uh, son and his wife long time ago, and Franco, Franco provides Vera and Dima a uh, sort of a um, shelter uh, in, very, uh, in very critical moments in the novel. Um, Simona Vici's novel, Strada Provinciale Tre, opens with a woman running by the side of a highway. She doesn't embody any signs of age, feminine features, a name or a background story. She is walking and oftentimes she is running by the side of a highway which cuts through the poverty changing the landscape and the lifestyles of people, people living in that area. Vinci depicts these differences through the protagonist's gaze, and it calls for attention since it gives details of the, of, of the objects and individuals who have been considered as not worth being looked at. Vinci tells the story of Il Mondo Visto dal Basso. Vera's gaze becomes the critical counter perspective to the ideals of modern life, with her focus on garbage, people, and abandoned buildings. She re-establishes her set of values regarding both people and space, operating from a newly ordered social position due to her appearance and lack of money. Her practice of walking activates fragments of the past that are not acknowledged in the dominant narratives of history. The same act of walking activates the decoding of the space and this enables Vinci to illustrate uh, the area in a constant state of change. In this, in this paper, I work on three themes, uh, walking, temporality, and queer ecology. In the novel, it matters where walking happens. Uh, um, sorry. And this theme will lead to explorations of walking as an ethical act, temporality as a concept of non-linearity, and queer ecology as a methodology to bring environmentalism and queer politics into a productive conversation by queering nature. Minchi chooses Strada Provinciale Tre, which dislocates Vera uh, from the foundations of her former life as a partner, a daughter, a draftswoman, and as a potential mother. And one more detail about the protagonist, she was working in a corporate company, uh, which was um, which was involving in um, in projects, uh, projects uh, of the organization of the Paul Valley, and she was part of that project. She was working as a draft, draft woman. Um, rather than reinforcing the traditional ideas of nature as an escape from the social world, the novel shows that nature is not a hiding place from ideology, and furthermore, solitude is a luxury for those who fit heteronormative norms. Vinci queers nature strategically by positioning the uh, nature of heteronormative kinship to an endangered landscape in order to portray relationalities as ways of healing and forming affiliation. Here, Vera's commitment to her practice of walking activates these relationalities, and she's performing what Lauren Dallan and Michael, uh, Michael Warner call a queer world making project in Sex in Public. For Bailana Warner, a queer world-making project can take place in all kinds of places at all different times and can include all kinds of people. It is neither organized nor strategic. 
To interrogate more on Vera's project, which is not a goal-oriented one, I work on Foucauldian ethics and working as a minor and chronic practice. Uh, it can be useful here uh, to rethink walking as a method of expanding <coughs> the boundary of sociability. Here I want to present uh, Elizabeth Freeman's recent conceptualization of chronic time in Beside You in Time. Chronic time, writes Freeman, reassembles individual and social bodies, opening them to one another in new ways. And this highlights the fact that it creates a collectivity which cannot be always defined as population, nor can it be considered as productive. Uh, in Vera's case, walking is a sign of her queerness, which inherits her experience of temporality. Her practice of walking does not resonate with habits that are regulated with rhythmic physical acts, nor with the intention of being goal-oriented. Vera's minor and chronic practice of walking might be this, a form of practice that is not habitual and that cannot be controlled by the heteronormative ideals of temporality and progress. Whereas practice of walking works as a minor strategy uh, rather than as a direct rejection of structure and more as a glitch. In Strada Provinciale 3, walking complicates the possible homogenizing actions of the highway. This potential for new relationalities is precisely a minor practice which Dorothy and Gautari described as a flight that is not an escape from stasis, but an, an increase in potentiality. Uh, whereas practice of walking does not intend to move the body from one place to another and it does not occur in a certain rhythm or pace. It, it, it loses its use value and meaning. It becomes a work upon the self, what Foucault called the care of the self as an aesthetics of existence. Vera also reanimates the tradition of flaneur in a polluted and commercialized area that makes the act of walking inconceivable for the flaneur. This space is not the welcoming area for the practice of flannery, since the traffic affects Vera's pace. Vera takes back the urban space from a consumer culture and actively adopts it to her own aesthetic practice. This calls for an ethics of living, meaning that the work on the self. That does not get caught in the limits imposed on individuals. In contrast to teachings of progress, in, uh, in contrast to the teachings of progress and productivity, whereas act of walking without a target. Uh, subverse heteronormative ideals, I, ideals where it dedicates her able body to the act of walking that is continuous and hectic. So here, um, at this point, uh, it is important to think about, pay attention to Vera's gender identity. To a certain extent, uh, Vera's practice of walking responds to the question of how one can walk queerly in an urban space. She negates the idea of femininity and gender stereotypes, defies to become the object of the gaze, and she is visible, but she is not an object of monetary transaction. Ephelinus is not merely a female equivalent of a philanderer, and in the 19th century, she was usually out on the streets because of economic reasons, working as a prostitute or, work, or basically as a working class woman. This could raise the question, who has the freedom to walk? As a white woman, her presence in the highway space is not directly linked to prostitution, but that does not protect her from being sexually violated by a truck driver. Along with her whiteness, Vera is not presented as someone to be desired. This provides her a chance to undertake a walk where she is not supposed to. If I go back to the sexual violence Vera experiences, there needs to be an important difference pointed out from that of a flaneur. The female stroller of an urban space becomes a target of harassment, judgment, and violence. She needs to have a valid reason to be in public sphere, and this makes her freedom limited compared to a male stroller. As a woman walking in a space where she is not supposed to do so, Vera does not display any signs of an agenda, such as walking to a specific destination. 
The crowd and the liveliness of the highway give her the security during daytime to see and to be seen, but at night, when she cannot show her self-determination to walk, she becomes a target of male violence. Uh, during her walks uh, by the side of the highway, uh, Vera is depicted as more into the physicality of her embodiment, and she is described in a certain way to display her mobility and her will to be in movement. Whereas practice of walking displays a commitment of a vitality that cannot be associated with productivity, uh, and it cannot be reduced to a mere act of disruptive act. For instance, as Vera walks along the side of the road, she identifies herself with an animal, specifically a dog. Vera uses her, uh, her able body and her senses as an animal would do, and she feels the freedom of her embodiment. Whereas otherness necessitates the inclusion of animality, and she is in a corporal relationality with the space she occupies. Whereas animalistic dwelling and her proximity to the landscape create instances in which the cultural scripts reveal themselves as construction. For Vera, walking is not limited as, uh, as a work on the self. She does not just observe and record, she interacts with the space, transforms it and adapts it to help others. She empathizes with people who also occupy the same area as her, she develops temporary relationalities based on needs and fragilities. Uh, Simone Vici's re uh, literary response to the ecological crisis focuses on radically degraded environment and how Dima, Franco, and Vera experience the consequences of this degradation. Uh, Strada Provinciale Trek projects readers into a here and now with a simple tone, which approaches environmental issues after nuclear disaster, global warming, and urbanization of a fertile area. The novel rejects the prevalence of maternal instincts and places emphasis on the practices of making kin, and Vera uh, making kin ex across uh, unshared histories, generations, genders, and nations. Vera exposes a family a model of family that does not conform to the norm, rather she disembodies and then undoes the ideology of the family formation by generating kings herself. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Irena Bozenk. She's Associate Professor of Italian Literature at the Faculty of Arts, Arts at the University of Ljubljana. Her, her recent research has focused on, focused on modern and contemporary authors such as Primo Levi, Claudio Mendes, Cesare Pavese, Valeria Parella, Milena Milani, and Adriana Assini. Today she will speak about narrate, narrating memory and loss in Milena Milani's Io, eh, Io Donna Gnocchi. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so, um, in this presentation, I'm going to speak about uh, the Italian author Milena Milani, who was a writer, an artist, a cultural promoter, and lived from 1917 until uh, 2013. So she passed away only seven years ago, nearly seven years ago, in July uh, 2013, at the age of 95. But she seems to be nowadays already a forgotten voice with her books largely out of print and impossible to order or buy, except uh, perhaps one. Uh, Milena Milani is an author who uh, defied the existing <coughs> order and the rules of society, partly uh, with her life and especially in her works, uh, particularly in novels such as A Girl Called Jules or The Redhead of Via Tadino. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to uh, talk about the writer and uh, one particular period in her life which is linked to the novel that I'm going to uh, present, uh, which was her 20-year-long relationship with Carlo Carrazzo, a gallerist and a patron of the arts. Uh, I'm going to give a short overview of Milena Milani's works and uh, I'm going to talk especially about Io Donna e gli altri, 
Uh, it's a novel that hasn't been translated into English. Uh, we could translate the title as I, a woman and the others. It is an autobiographical and an understudied novel, in my opinion, which charts uh, the year following the untimely death of uh, Milani's partner Cardazzo in 1963. Uh, it was written after Cardazzo's death and published in 1972. Um, and uh, in the end, I'm going to look at the ways in which Milani narrates uh, the memory of her partner, her mourning, her feelings of loss, and finally, the possible ways to accept and overcome such feelings. Um, so uh, Milena was, um, Milena Milani was an author of fiction and poetry. She was an artist, a journalist, an art gallerist, but she defined herself first and foremost as a novelist. This is what she, uh, how she described herself. Among her prose works, there are five novels, uh, the story of Anna Gray, A Girl Called Jules, I, A Woman and the Others, only Love and the Redhead of Via Cardino. Uh, she wrote several collections of short stories, including The Summer, Emily on the Jetty, Six Venetian Stories, and collection of essay, collections of essays such as Sexy Italy, Sexual Object, Moods and Loves, The Black Angel, and Other Memories. And she published several collections of poems. Uh, some of her prose works have been translated into other languages, for example, Storia di Anna Bray, La Reazza di Nome Giulio, or Emilia Sulla Diga. So we see that in English there are two novels, both of them have been translated by Graham Snell, and her most famous novel is A Girl Called Jules, uh, uh, La Reazza di Nome Giulio, uh, published in 1964, which uh, is well known because it caused quite a scandal for its allusions to women's sexuality and for a certain time was banned in Italy. Uh, not only that, but the author was sentenced to six months in prison in 1966 and then she was acquitted in appeal in 1967. Uh, the, authors, the author said that while the novel was not understood in Italy, it was, however, translated into French in the same year and into English two years later. And she, she always said that she felt that with, his, with this book, she was ahead of her time. In the afterword, which was written in 1978 for a new edition, she says, I went against the current, against the time which, times which were not evolving, against taboos which have always oppressed women, condemning them to marginalization. And this trust, this kind of joy, of certainty in my possibilities, was not conceived, but hope that in future women might be acknowledged. Uh, in another text, an article that she published in Italia Sexy uh, in sec uh, 67, she says, My novel, A Girl Called Jules, was published in English in London. They call it a sex bomb, and it has been reprinted four times. In Paris, the first French edition of my book has been sold out. A reprint is now available in bookshops. I find it ridiculous that Italian readers who want to read this novel have to order it in a foreign language. Italy is a strange country. So she wrote that in 67. Um, Milena Milani wrote about <clears throat> problems in contemporary society, about contemporary women's condition, and actually all of her main characters are women. Uh, in the Feminist Encyclopedia of Italian Literature, Martha King says her fiction typically deals with sexuality and women's identity conflicts from a feminist perspective. The women protagonists in her fiction often find themselves in unsatisfactory situations with little hope for an acceptable resolution. Um, as an artist, she was active as a painter and produced the so-called written paintings, quadriscripti, and also a ceramist, especially a ceramist, actually. She, but she <coughs> commented that uh, it was a male uh, world. So she said, I was only partly accepted into this world as an artist. Um, and sometimes she comments, uh, by, uh, she says, um, I was accepted because I was young and beautiful. 
and that's it. So I was tolerated, not really accepted, but tolerated, even in, uh, in this arts uh, section. Uh, so uh, as far as her life is concerned, um, this novel that I'm going to be talking about uh, centers on her relationship with Carlo Carvazzo. Uh, Carlo Carvazzo was nine years her senior. He was a Venetian gallerist, editor, art collector, art merchant, a merchant, patron of the arts, and he was also a married man. In Venice, in 1934, he founded the publishing house Edizioni del Cavallino, uh, which was active from 1934 to 2010 and published contemporary art books, as well as uh, Italian and foreign uh, poetry and prose. Then in 1942, he founded uh, La Galleria del Cavallino, and uh, it showed and sold works by major contemporary artists. Uh, Carlo Carvazzo actually had a very strong passion for Italian and international non-figurative art. He was, for example, friends with Peggy Guggenheim, uh, who wrote a book of uh, anecdotes for his Cavallino editions uh, with the title Una Collezionista Ricorda uh, in uh, 56. And incidentally, another artist, Kunderwasser, uh, painted a portrait of him in 55, uh, calling it Carvazzo Europeo. Um, Milani and Carvazzo got to know each other in Venice during the war in uh, 43. Uh, because uh, Milena took part of an artistic competition organized by Carvazzo's gallery and won the first prize. So she traveled to Venice to collect the prize. They got to know each other and uh, fell in love. In the beginning, there was a um, hidden relationship. Um, suffice it to say that divorce was not legal in Italy until 1970. Um, after the war, they uh, were obliged to leave Venice uh, so as not to cause scandal. Uh, Carvazzo's family asked Carvazzo to move and um, also they asked him uh, if they should ever return to Venice, which of course they did because they had friends, work and so on. They asked him never to stay at the same place whenever they returned. So they complied, they moved to uh, Milan in 46, and there founded another gallery, La Galleria del Naviglio, which was then active from 46 until 2011. Even in Milan, uh, they lived in a difficult situation in the beginning, because it was not easy to find a place to stay, because they were not married. However, the two eventually lived together until Carvazzo's death. Uh, as a couple, they were very discreet. They never talked to other people about their relationship. Uh, Milena didn't even tell her parents. She only told her mother after her partner's death. Uh, although uh, her niece said that um, her parents obviously knew, but didn't talk about that. In Milan, they never appeared as a couple in public. Everybody that knew that they were a couple and a very powerful one in the world of the arts, but nobody dared mention it in, in public. And of course, whenever they uh, would come to Venice, they came in two separate cars. Uh, Milena stayed at her flat, um, her partner stayed at the hotel and apparently never set foot in her flat. Uh, so they were that discreet. Uh, together, they collected art. The flat in Milan, which was about above the gallery, was filled with works of art and then they travelled extensively, uh, organised exhibitions of Italian art abroad, had many friends among the artists. Uh, we've seen this portrait of uh, Carvazzo, uh, but uh, Milena Milan was also very much involved uh, in the activities of the gallery and said that her days in Milan were spent among painters and sculptors who needed help solving their problems. Uh, Milani too was often portrayed by the artists from their circle and others, such as uh, Filippo de Pisis, uh, or Lucio Fontana, or uh, Pablo Picasso. These are some of her portraits. Uh, they used to spend summers in the Ligurian town of Albisola, which is going to be mentioned later in the text. This is why I'm mentioning it. Uh, Albisola used to be known uh, especially for its ceramic workshops and this is where Milani um, began to work as a ceramist. 
In uh, 1963, Carnazzo died suddenly of an incurable, aggressive form of leukemia in a hospital in Pavia. In memory of Carlo Cardazzo, Milani donated the works of art, the whole art collection, to the city of Savona, her home city, and founded the Milena Milani Contemporary Art Museum Foundation in memory of Carlo Cardazzo, Fondazione Museo d'Arte Contemporanea Milena Milani in memoria di Carlo Cardazzo. When Milani describes her life with Carlo Cardazzo, she tends to emphasize places. For example, she says, I vividly remember the 20 years of love and work with Cardazzo. We were always young in our life together. I have no regrets and I am proud of what we achieved. Nearly all our friends are dead now and cannot confirm what I am saying, but I think that sooner or later, in the future years, Somebody will write our true story and will be able to read a testimony of that love in my books. And then, the places. And there will still be Venice, Albisola, Milan, Paris, Rome, London, New York and many other places. Cortina Lampezzo, Savona, the Ligurian Sea and the Adriatic, the artist studios, the Dolomites and the snow, the animals who lived with us, Tigrina, the Venetian cat, Black the dog, the desire to do things, to leave a mark, a trace in this whirling and marvellous world in which we were born, grew up and loved each other. Milani, uh, Milani dedicated her books to Cardazzo, writing Questo libro è per TH, this book is for TH, uh, because Milena and friends called Cardazzo Tommaso with one M or Tommaso with, with two or simply TH, TH, that was his nickname. Um, Io Donna e gli altri uh, is dedicated as well to Carlo Carvazzo, so we read uh, questo libro è per TH. Not only that, but in the text, uh, Carvazzo as, appears as a character named Tommaso. So we know that she's talking about herself, that she's talking about Carvazzo, but she calls him Tommaso, and this is also uh, obviously the name I'm going to use. Um, the novel was written between December uh, 1963 and February 1965, and the first text was written just two weeks after Tommaso's death. <coughs> it's a sort of a journal, a collection of short autobiographical texts arranged in a chronological order. Uh, Milani says that this was and is her story, and uh, in the introductory text, presents the novel, uh, saying, This book is a human story which goes on from December 1963 to the beginning of 1965. In it, there is everything that happened to me, good things, bad things, great things, desperate things. And after these two first sentences in the uh, introductory text, she goes on immediately to talk about places, about narrative spaces. She says, I go from Milan to Venice, from Venice to Milan, from Milan to Savona, and then again, up and down, to the mountains, to the sea. It is a journey across the plain and the solitude, in search of something that cannot come back. I write about the days and months in which I continued to wander about without a stable point, because I no longer had one. In the same text, she also writes about a cemetery, um, it is the St. Michael's Cemetery in Isola di San Michele, which is an island in the Venetian lagoon between Venice and Murano, uh, which is completely occupied by a cemetery, and this is where Tommaso is buried. Uh, Milani comments, every page of this book is dedicated to a man buried in an island, in a cemetery that is unique in the world. But this is also an act of love towards the others, whom I have learned to understand in the years that have passed. I have freed myself of egoism. I have realized that pain is the same for everybody, that it is part of the human condition. I have humbly accepted it. Um, in this book, uh, loss is narrated as a complex process, which includes mourning, reminiscing, reflecting on the passing of the time, searching for means of coping, and finally, a renewed awareness of being connected to other human beings. 
Um, the protagonist, uh, the protagonist mourns the loss of her partner. Uh, she writes about how she suffers because of his absence. She knows that he will not come back, he will never talk to her again, he will not telephone. And the most difficult thing is for her not being able to talk to him ever again. She cannot accept that she's no longer there. She says that the Mazo and her felt young, but now she feels old. She says, I felt that my heart was as if it was a million years old, a dead weight in my chest that curved my, sh my shoulders. Apart from that, she, uh, the protagonist tries not to think. This is a recurrent motive in Milano's works. Also, uh, her other women protagonists try not to think, try to do things in order not to think, because thinking is often linked to suffering, not only in this book, which is about suffering, but in the others as well. Uh, the protagonist then remembers. She remembers, on the one hand, Tommaso's death, how she died, how she was with him, holding his hand. She, said that, uh, she says that he died almost without noticing it. And she um, narrates how after he, she, uh, he died, she touched his eyebrows and hair. She remembers the suit she dressed him in when he died. Um, and uh, uh, when she uh, talks about the memories uh, that she has of him, she remembers their life together. And very often these uh, memories are evoked by the places. For example, when she returns to Venice after Tommaso's death, she returns in the same car. Uh, on the same motorway, she parks the car in the same garage uh, in Piazzale Roma, and all these things bring back memories. Um, she remembers the object that uh, the objects that Tommaso gave her, and so on. And uh, another important part of her narration is uh, her reflection on the passing of the time. She regrets that the time that she passed with Tommaso is now over, and asks. Why did that time end? Why are those seasons lost already? Uh, when she has to leave the flat in which they thought they would live together for a long time, she says, the time has shortened. The years have become days, hours, minutes. And incidentally, she has to leave the flat because, simply because she is not married. He's still married to his wife and the family claims the flat for themselves. Um, the pivotal role in her narration is played by the depiction of narrative spaces. Um, as we have seen in the introduction, uh, as Milani explains, after Tommaso's death, the protagonist travels continuously between Milan, Venice, Cortina, Savona and Albisola. She travels to run away from pain, but this doesn't work, as she says. I travelled incessantly, but it did not ease the pain that I always felt inside. I analysed the description of these narrative spaces according to the terminology proposed by Hannah Worth Nesher in her work on the urban novel City Code, published in 1996. Hannah Worth Nesher divides the literary image of the city into four aspects, which are the natural, the built, the human and the verbal, and explains when authors import aspects of real cities into their fictive reconstructions, they do so by drawing on maps, street names, and existing buildings and landmarks, enabling a character to turn the corner of a verifiable street on the map to place him in a realistic setting. These urban elements signify to a reader within a particular culture a whole re repertoire of meanings. In uh, her de descriptions of places, Milan uses many topographical details which belong to the built element. Um, uh, very present is also the human element in the form of the people in the streets, the passers-by, and uh, also the means of transport. Milan, for example, is associated with crowds, with trams, with cars that pass in the street, which all uh, create uh, an image of the fast rhythm of the city. Um, she's also attentive to the natural element, which I have identified in descriptions of the weather conditions, uh, or the descriptions of the sky, 
Uh, the protagonist's gaze, not only in this novel but in other texts as well, is often directed towards the sky. So we have the protagonist which observes the sky. As far as Venice is concerned, which is of course the central uh, uh, town here, um, Milani says that it was Tommaso's town, but also hers. Uh, she says, La mia adorata Venezia. Mm -hmm. So she adored this, this town as well. Um, the, uh, the center of Venice here seems to be Tommaso's grave in San Michele. Um, on the 1st of December 1963, the protagonist comes to Venice to visit the grave for the first time, and she recounts it like this. She says, I came to Venice to look for Tommaso because I needed to see him, to talk to him. Tommaso is waiting for me. I am meeting him on this sad day. She indicates the precise spot when, where the grave is. She says that she goes there when there is nobody else. Um, I haven't been able to find out whether she was present at the funeral at all. It's very possible that she wasn't allowed to be present there. She mentions the funeral, but uh, we, we can't really understand if she was there or not. Um, so she goes there when, the, when there is nobody else, she leaves flowers and so on. And as far as the space is, is concerned, she describes precisely how she walks from her flat in San Angelo uh, to the Fontamenta di Nuovo, where she takes uh, the boat to San Michele. She says, I go to Campo San Luca, to San Bartolomeo, as far as Strada Nuova, to Campo dei Santissimi Apostoli. Oh, I know that I have to go straight on, and then right, and then right once again. There is no doubt about it. And we can follow her steps on the map of Venice. These are the stops that she makes, the, the places that she describes, and finally she uh, travels uh, by boat to the island. Um, the spaces, also other spaces in Venice uh, that she revisits, remind her of her encounters with Tommaso and elicit emotional responses within her. They represent a point of contact between the present and the irretrievably lost and much lamented past. However, when she leaves Venice, she feels pain because she leaves Tommaso in the cemetery and uh, in her there is always present the painful thought of Tommaso alone in this island. However, she's constantly leaving for other cities but always, in the end, always returns to Milan. She says that she always returns to their home. Uh, she comments, I am hoping against hope that I still have a stable point, a goal, a motive. Writing books, painting, putting my thoughts in order, I have so many plans which are daring and crazy and may remain just plans. Um, during this year, she searches for a means of coping with her loss and finally realizes that she shares the destiny of other men and women of humanity. She writes, other men and other women walk through the streets, stay in their houses, are born, grow up, love each other, bond and then die, and are born again, grow up, love each other, bond and again die, and everything goes on like this. So to conclude, as we have seen, uh, this is a very personal text, um, very personal, very uh, sincere, um, direct, which narrates memory, loss, and explores ways of coping. Um, however, these notions are often rendered through the depiction of narrative spaces, which elicit memories uh, and are connected to her search for a stable point. Although she moves const constantly and does not have this stability, uh, in the end, she finds out that the others, she's Actually, when she says the others, io donna gli altri, she's part of this humanity. But uh, we, we saw that in this uh, last quotation that the others are described in a connection with the space. Uh, they are walking through the street. This is her first thought. They are somewhere in, in, uh, in the space. So the others walk through the streets and she sees them within these spaces uh, and uh, in the end, establishes a connection with them 
and begins to feel part of the suffering humanity. Thank you. Marta Ricomono is a PhD candidate in modern languages and philology at the Scuola Normale Superiore of Pisa. She is currently carrying out research on the construction of Italian national identity in the poems of four Sicilian women writers. Giuseppina Turisi Colonna, Lauretta Ligretti, Rosina Muzzo Salvo, and Concettina Ramondetta Filetti. In the years of Risorgimento, and particularly in the years from 1840 to 1860. She published several articles which investigate the relationship between gender identity and literary expression that have appeared on journals like uh, The Italianist, uh, Gender Sexuality Italy, and Altre Lettere, and Nuova Informazione Bibliografica. Today she will speak about the difficult identity, Sicilian women writers, and their proliferal resurgement. Thank you. Thank you, Sara. I'm, I'm so sorry I'm not being there today, but <laughs> this is the situation. So, in a well-known essay about Sicilian identity, entitled Come si può essere siciliani, Leonardo Sasha stated that there is only one way of being Sicilian, and that is, I quote, with difficulty. By appropriating the words used by Montesquieu in Persian's letters to refer to Persia and its inhabitants, Sasha intended to reflect on the problematic nature of the concept of insularity. On the one hand, Sicilians had long taken pride in the partial geographic station, which was considered as a distinctive feature capable of protecting their difference, interpreted and promoted in the sense of an historical and cultural superiority. On the other hand, this insularity ended up slowing down the political, economic, and social process causing modernization, which affected the Italian that especially in the Mesopotamia. Between 1848 and 1860, the Sicilian peasants invoked the revolutionary movements which brought about the end of the battle of domination of Sicily, and to deal with the difficulty of holding together the attachment to the native land in the ambition to become an integral part of the Italian nation. In Sicily, just as in the rest of the Italian peninsula, the Risorgimento was not an access to the native land. Indeed, a lot of Sicilian women especially those belonging to the aristocracy and the upper middle class, took part in the struggles which characterized the revolutionary period. Since these women were usually well educated, their personal vision of the resurgent is often conveyed through their party, for the isolated, for the private and the public ones. However, while they had only experience in a cultural and geographical population, the Syrian women veterans were also marginalized before the gender. The work that of the women limited their participation in the social, cultural, and political life of the country. Fully aware of their peripheral status, Sicilian women writers expressed their patriotic views by publishing political verses and journal articles. Moreover, between 1848 and 1849, two female magazines called La Prima delle Donne and La Regione delle Sorelle published it in Palermo. Today, I will not like to representative articles in which they try to outline the wrong idea of nation and qualify the new personal and political identity, which resulted from the lawyering of multiple difficulties. And the breakout of the Antimor Constitution in Palermo on 12 January 1848 is commonly considered to be a key moment of the Italian Resurgement. It is usually claimed that after a decade of minor popular revolts started throughout the Italian peninsula to promote the press, the governors that prevented one of the point when the Sicilian to its most major phase. It was actually a start as well as autonomous to rebellion, aided by a group of realist intellectuals and politicians who belonged to the upper classes, sometimes even to the aristocracy. Actually burdened by economic troubles and increasingly despite the censorship imposed by King Ferdinando II in Rome. The Sicilian population supported the revolution enthusiastically. The rebel's main goal was to break apart the reign of two Sicilians, established in 1816 after the Congress of Vienna, in order to found the reign of Sicily, independent from Naples and put about the public monarchy. The project was secret. 
The new board of Reign of Sisi was a constitutional monarchy approved by the Council Committee of Savoia and provided with a parliament. But after 16 months of independence, on 14 May 1849, Ferdinand II was able to regain control over Sicily and restore its power. Nevertheless, during the revolution, almost the whole Sicilian population took part in the fight, and a lot of women expressed their engagement with the independent sports by writing passionate patriotic poems aimed at urging Sicilian men and women to free themselves from the country from the so called oppressors. Moreover, aristocratic women found that they coordinated several different organizations in order to provide assistance to the country's family, especially to the poorest ones and to women in particular. The involvement in this kind of charitable activities surely gave the women the chance to take the revolution in their own way, distinguishing themselves from men's action. During those months of the revolution, two magazines in particular, La Tribuna delle Donne e La Regione delle Pietrelle, testified with a commitment to the cause of Sicilian independence and to the cause of the Risorgimento in general. Both magazines were published in Palermo for a very short period of time. Their style and communicative goals were significantly diverging. After all, even the participation of women in the revolution was legitimized by ideological stance, which were sometimes not even La Regione delle Chiesorelle was the official magazine of a homonymous philanthropic Organization founded in Palermo in August 1848 by Father Antonio Lombardo, who was a priest belonging to the Pierist, the oldest Catholic educational order, also known as the Scolò. His main occupation was teaching children and youth in order to provide free education. The Legione had quite similar rules. Its statute dictated that its members had part at home only sociali and to devote themselves to the civic profession. According to the uh, statute, every year each member of the association was expected to give donation to support the development of the Asili Antilli, sort of a group houses for two children, as well as, uh, as, well as to enhance the medical education and provide and with books and newspapers. It was also agreed that the first gateway through self taxation and fundraising dinners and to be allocated for the widows, orphans, orphans, and iPhones. All the school families, especially those who lost their loved ones in the fight for the independence of the Congolese country and the world. The internal organization of the region was modeled on a military hierarchical structure. Its 1,200 uh, members were divided into the centurion, which ruled by a head mistress. There were, there were also a president, secretary, a treasurer, a controller, and a library. They were all elected and stayed with one year old. There was also a chaplain who was the only male member of the association. The statute claimed that every uh, woman, uh, every woman without a distinction of class, could be part of the legitimate, as long as she came from a honest family. However, only aristocratic and upper class women took part in the association, and that was part of the course. Most of them were already used to being involved in charitable activities. Even though other associations were not perceived as means of political participation. In October 1848, the Legion started to create of official journal. At the beginning, the journal came out weekly. Quite soon, it started to publish it twice a month and then monthly. For its definitive closure on, 12, um, on the 2nd January 1849. Even if the main aim of the journal was to publish the statute of the organization, means to meet an announcement. Since the beginning, there also appeared several articles written by the members of the association or by other women who wanted to support them. Thanks to a probe which brought together civic religion and gender consciousness, these articles tried to define the clear mission of the legione and to clarify the goals of these studies. The choice of published the kind of articles upon the journal aroused debate among the members, many of whom claimed that the magazine had been uh, published monthly instead of weekly. As Caterina Rossipa wrote an article published on uh, December 2, 1848, many of the years in were afraid of leaving for themselves, because they say, a quote, a week would be far too short a time to find any interesting to write. 
In the attempt to reach their comrades, Roskala expressed the social and attractive value of their treatment by saying that, I quote, keeping poor, abandoned girls away from danger by locking them in temple cases, end of quote, was just one of their duties. They were also asked to educate these poor girls and to provide them with good examples, not to help them become, I quote, good wives and caring mothers, end of quote. For this reason, Caterina Rossi Parlatore expressed to be sure that the Israel had to publicize their activities privately, so that also public rally would be possibly affected by the Kirchhoff's behavior. Nevertheless, a lot of members of the Legione continued to think, to think that it would have been inappropriate that uh, people from the outside should know the organization business. End of quote. In spite of these concerns, the German Avenger came out. It conveyed the idea that female distribution to the resortiment would have been more valuable if restricted to the traditional rules of mother, teachers, and caregivers who could loudly look after the national community, intended at the time as a big family. Even if the case were added to female education, they never claimed the right to receive the same education as men. They really preferred to preserve the distinction between the, the so called Sione Gabriel the Spirit. So it's education which opened up the tone, uh, which was still addressed to men, and the education which the forma il character, the education which shapes the personality, which remains the women's domain. In an article entitled Anti Nobis Family Story, we have rise again too. A main Iranian for the Lombardo views at the bottom of the monarchy of every bit should side and this party, especially against women. Who had been forced to be il sesso bimbo in negrito, the dismissive to ostracize itself, until the revolution broke out. According to Rinian Bank, the revolutionary government had made a difference, since it had given proper political value to the issue of female education. The Kiss Rally knew well that the social standard of women needed to be improved everywhere in order to make women aware of their duties toward the family and the country. As Maria Mira de Buzzi wrote in an article published on La Legione, the women of Italy must fulfill religious fervor and self sacrifice the so that she said, I quote, high and sublime mission of educating the good citizen, the honest lawmaker, and the outstanding peasant, I quote, who were also forced to be men. While the Kisura had decided to challenge the cruelty of the Bourbon's army by using, I quote, the weapons of thought, I quote, Another female journal called the Tatricca delle Donne began the Vivace di Palermo in the same months. Compared to the Giorni delle Chiesorelle, the Tatricca delle Donne was written in a more polemic tone. It seemed to be also less concerned with the social expectations about women and the gender rules they were expected to fulfill. The journal was published between the 25th of June and 7th of July 1848. Like the Legione, it was the official negative of a female association of the same name, expected to publish its full beat and official publication. As shown in the statute, Nelson, who now fully progressed in line with the Sorelle, had decided to consider their inequity. All of the women, all the women of La Tribuna, chose to serve not in so to recall the literary characters. On the first issue of the journal, for instance, it was written that during the opening meetings, the Mrs. Beatrice Portinari, like Dante the Trojan, was elected president of the association. It was also reported that during the same meeting, I quote, Lady Gemma, from Gemma Donati, the name of Dante's wife, Mrs. Uh, Margherita Stella and Madame Laura were all placed in the charge of holding on the position. Other members of the association, such as Mrs. Beatrice Genchi and Mrs. Francesca Larini, were mentioned. Were mentioned in the second last issue of the journal. The choice of such pseudonyms seems to reveal a will to recall Italian history and, above all, its new interpretation of the perspective of the resurgiment of the British change in Margherita Stella and Francesca Davini for respecting the opponents of the Italians of Francis and whose Italian was not. At the same time, the maps of that now probably want to highlight the women that hold in the inspiring moments even for the great enemies. Uh, whose success has been considered by the wives, sisters, or love. And uh, uh, if these women have been considered as uh, silent objects of someone else's speech, they could now become the speaking subject of their own narrative. It is written in the first uh, 
issue of the Tribunal de Fronte in the Revolution, uh, as it's written in the first issue of the Tribunal de Donne, during the Revolution, the Sicilian man became obsessed by the type of exactly the political field and started fearing that the law might compromise their patriotic mission. Consequently, they began to behave in a very grateful way to win, to the point of not even looking at them anymore. In the dialogue which was the first issue of the journal, the anonymous characters of Pontius C, Baroness B, Princess B, complain about the extreme militarization of politics, which has become today an arena where men really fought each other and quote, yelling like men and end of quote. The dream of the woman, women also separated the political and the revolution, which started to shift to its thoughts. Bothered by the exclusion of any kind of political participation, the speakers were reflected on their need to be expertly represented in the newly found Sicilian party. To achieve the, uh, that goal, the three other women decided to organize themselves in a political club in order to force the government to finally take women into account. As the Baroness said, I quote, Tomorrow we are going to organize our club, just like it in France. We will protest and publish our tenders until ministers and members of parliament meet with us. Then we will claim the right to vote and to act. We will also last for a third chapter and for a job from where the three grammatical dances may be made in neutral, will be properly represented. And the day after that announcement, a declaration was posted of the post of Calais, which claimed that the most previous young people invited them to the meeting to organize the 2018 PA with open house. The declaration was addressed to the generose donne di Sicilia, to Magnani, to the women, to whom it said, I quote, è suonata l'ora del nostro risorgimento. So, as run the bell for risorgimento. End of quote. The aim of the meeting was to declare war against the so called oppressed and put, uh, and put an end to the long standing domination of men over women. As reported in the journal, the one after 36 women gave joined the in the truth that the Italian law and officially published. The resolution came after a very critical report of the revolutionary events provided by the President Luigi Bordinari, who focused on the incompetence of the lawmakers as well as on the influence shown by the actual even of the 12th journey general. End of quote. In order to make the great and aware of the fact that women not, I quote, a mere declaration of nothing but the soul of the human community, end of quote. The members of the tribunal decided to play their rights against, um, the rights against the men's brutality and to propose institutional reforms in line with the president's. As reported in the second issue of the Puna, during the meeting which took place on 28 June 1858, Mrs. Chama gave a speech on the Seattle Association saying that La Tribuna wants to give women the chance to enjoy the human rights of men, since God created women as men's for pain, not as men's left. According to Article 2, two La Tribuna should have its affordance to Palermo and some attachments to the community, where each legislative proposal had to be discussed before the meeting with the Sicilian Parliament. And that the views of that, the members of La Tribuna are supposed to intellectual courts. Grounded on the belief that education could be the strongest and even the only weapon used by for their own regiment, but not used for it. However, when the peace plan has to for an education which would be in line with the traditional gender group, as educators and the caregivers assumed to be during the revolution, the development of the Puna tried to put them rights and foster status to the use of European women. In their identical society, women should be able to make political decisions about the management of the community in their plan to take a tax for them, so as to have acquired personal pride. Unlike the Israel, the members of the Tribuna were absolutely concerned that the anti war revolution and women who was dominated often by men. Those circumstances of women only had the chance to have a concrete goal of success. Try to take the other uh, events uh, um, as an example of their independence for the simple plan. So they wrote on their journal, I quote, just as men in the Indians free themselves from discrimination to the tyranny of the king, we need to be united to break the chain of our subjugation to men. End of quote. In this project, women 
and they would engage women from the Italian peninsula, wishing to create a solid nation of general unity, which could share the same world that its members had found previous in experiences of oppression. In an article published in 1978, which is this day the only extensive study that the journey of the Sorella by the Cuna di Donne, the student Giovanna Fiume considered the insistence of men's incredible lack of interest toward women as a limit of the political campaign made by the members of the Cuna di Donne, which had undermined the other way of close up of its claims. I think instead that by shopping up the resentment of men, <coughs> These women aimed at the uh, acknowledgement of their value, rather than at uh, the restoration of an the privilege. As the women who had inspired the pseudonyms, the members of that they were truly aware of the importance of having always, of having always inspired and supported men if silent. While the Israel was committed to a open and over attention seeking behavior, proved with its mission in the 1848 revolution, partly support men's politics. The women of La Tribuna, recalling Aristophanes and Sistina, tried, on the contrary, to influence the outcomes for a push which had marginalized them since the beginning, in order to finally release themselves from a condition of multiple insularity, as an evidence of the, uh, of the periphery of Italy at first, and mainly as women. Thank you. Um, I feel we are like a group of resistance. Just <laughs> part of the group. Super cool. Um, so our first speaker is Elena Krasnowska. Um, she's from the University of Bath. After completing her PhD in English at the University of Oxford, Oxford she moved to San Diego, Chile. <laughs> where she worked as a research assistant in art history. In 2019, she was appointed as a senior lecturer in English uh, literature at Bath Spa University. That's also cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, she's going to talk about um, Elizabeth J. 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 Authorship, Identity, and the 17th Century Spiritual Diary. Go ahead, have fun. Thank you very much. Um, so my conference paper explores the 17th century English woman Elizabeth Jekyll, um, specifically at her spiritual diary. So her diary, which she wrote between 1643 and 1652, it delivers measured instalments of personal reflection, as well as a response to and a retelling of really crucial moments in the English Civil War. So this is about, um, my talk is going to be about this sort of dichotomy and how these two things work together, this personal reflection and this um, national news. And the types of histories that she reflects upon, they include the local and the national, they include biographical and autobiographical histories. And so I will examine the ways in which middle class women such as Jekyll um, are situated in these, ex these localized experiences with friends and families and broader communities and this is happening all the time during this, um, during periods of, of often lengthy and frequent periods of separation due to war between these family members. And I'm going to interrogate how the presence of a personal voice mixes with a topical response to events. So this is very key to the diary genre, this personal, this topical um, and broader reflection on events. And so Jekyll is almost entirely forgotten um, as a voice of the English Civil War. But her role in the immediate years after her death was very prominent because she influenced Protestant subsets during the second half of the 17th century. So she was relatively famous during her day, uh, or actually just after her death. But the big issue for me, and the reason why I'm talking about this at this conference today, is that nowadays scholars tend to dismiss her diary as having been written by a man, and this is mainly her husband. Um, and scholars assume this, I say scholars, there are maybe two or three people who've written on this ever, but these scholars assume that um, it's written by a man, a man because she openly and overtly supports 
the parliamentary cause in the civil war and she is telling these national affairs. So there's this assumption that women are not capable of reflecting on national affairs because that was a man's territory, therefore this text might have been written by a man. And so in this paper, I argue that we must recover women's identities like Jekyll's from the periphery and reinstate them at the centre in this work of literature by considering that the diary was at least partly by Jekyll. And I want to suggest that the diary it significantly contributes to our present understanding of the English Civil War and that it brings what is often considered to be a private form of written meditation into the public sphere. So this part is making the private public. And in my talk, um, I talk a little bit about her husband and a little bit about her son, but if I'm, I'm going to call her Jekyll all the way through, so her husband will be referred to as John, whereas she, Jekyll, will be called in that way, just so it's less confusing. Um, okay, so the manuscript I'm looking back at is Osborne B221, and uh, Jekyll is the author, maybe, of this um, spiritual diary from the Civil War, and it's really important, as I said, because of these the effect that it had on the parliamentarian community in the British Civil War. Uh, the prose itself is possibly, maybe, originally composed by Jekyll. However, it's a first-person narrative, and it contains this medley of family records, of poetry, of reflections of political matters, on religious meditations, and it's all recorded between 1643 and 1652. And it bears sustained anecdotes that recount her home life, the births of her children, as well as the trials and tribulations of caring for her children. And it describes in some details her husband's journeys around England during the English Civil War. This is the only excellent copy, and it's held in the Vinecke Library in the US. So despite the excellent document's complex provenance, it's, I think its original author should not be overlooked. So she was the daughter of Elizabeth Lake and George Ward, a London cloth maker. And she was formerly called Elizabeth Ward, she was baptised on the 18th of July, 1624, in St Christopher's in the, peri of, in the parish of St Mary Wall Church, which is just here, just here. And she married John Jekyll sometime before 1643, and we know this because in her diary she talks about John Jekyll being her husband, but we don't know when they got married exactly, and we don't know when the ceremony took place. John was um, initially apprenticed as a fishmonger, but ended up practising as a haberdasher for most of his life in London. So these were very middle-class people. It's very rare to have um, diaries from this particular subset of society. The couple were devout Presbyterians. They had five children together. And the eldest of these children was somebody called Thomas, who grew up to become a very esteemed Church of England clergyman. And he was actually the author of many printed sermons. So her husband, even though he was quite a lot older than her, he was 13 years older than her, he lived longer. And she died first in March 1653, not long before her 13th birthday. And she died a week after the burial of an infant that she had just given birth to. And her grave lies in the parish of St. Stephen Warbrook in London, not far from here. And her widower husband went on to marry another woman and had five more children. Um, so, the, so Jekyll's diary, it hints at autobiographical details but it does not outline them fully, and most of this information has been painstakingly put together by the through parish records. So we don't actually know so much about her, this sort of uh, autobiographical detail from her diary itself. <coughs> but then there are problems of authorship. So other than her spiritual journal, no other documents written by Jekyll survive at all. In fact, I should maybe even say that no documents written by Jekyll survive at all, because Osborne, this, this manuscript, Osborne B221, contains 60 pages, enclosed in modern binding, and it's a handwritten copy. It must be a handwritten copy of the original manuscript. And this is because it's all written in a single hand, it's a very neat script of black ink, but it could not have been penned by Jekyll herself because the volume includes a dying speech made by a woman called Alice Lyle at her trial in, 80, in 1685. So what I mean is that Jekyll's spiritual diary ends on the 13th of January 1652, due to her death, yet the document continues afterwards in the same hand. So Lyle's execution occurred more than three decades after Jekyll's own death, so it's impossible that this volume was written by Elizabeth Jekyll. And you can see the photograph of the grave, which I've included, which is Lyle's grave, which says her death date of 8, no, 1685. 
So, importantly, we know that we're dealing with a manuscript copy of an original. Um, we don't know if there are any other copies of this text. We haven't found any, and we haven't found Jekyll's original. So, the volume culminates in Jekyll's signature. So, you can see it here at the bottom of the page, Elizabeth Jekyll, 1652. So, somebody was trying to imitate her, um, and we can hypothesize why. So, this must have been forged and, and a way of attempting to suggest her authorship. So, this is the volume that I'm trying to uh, understand. So, despite being described in Yale's library catalogue as a commonplace book, perhaps due to the compilation's wide ranging material and very anecdotal content, scholars broadly concur that this is stylistically a spiritual diary. But I'm just going to explain what a spiritual diary, diary actually is. It's a, a genre of life writing in which the author reflects upon personally significant religious moments throughout their existence. So unlike conventional diaries, spiritual diaries, they don't meticulously record everyday life. And instead, actually, they select sporadic yet very significant anecdotes. Although actually, it's unlikely that any one writers really differentiated between a spiritual diary and a diary. This is a modern situation. And spiritual diaries, they adhere to the Protestant emphasis on the individual's believer's direct connection with God. So this is thanks to the removal of the Catholic confession and the priestly mediator, and this demand for the relationship to be explored outside of the church. So the genre emerged and it became prolific in England in the 17th century, and it owes a great deal to this Protestant advocacy of self-examination and of widespread practice of, ex of expression of interiority that is really kind of central to Protestantism. And in the act of writing spiritual diaries, authors seek to further understand their lives on earth and prove themselves to God in the afterlife. So men and women from a cross-section of society, uh, they all kept spiritual diaries during the 17th century. The popularity is in part thanks to clergymen who actually prompted entire congregations to keep these works. Um, it was an encouragement of virtue in the practice of holy men and women, uh, as the minister Patrick Strachan preaches in a sermon published in 1693. Authors could display their faith through physical actions and achieve spiritual fulfillment by ways of written interpretation. Some spiritual diarists include conversion narratives, while others publish them alongside prophecies, but all of them explore how the Holy Spirit features in and shapes their lives in these measured diary installments. And the vast majority of religious diaries by women of the period, they're still in manuscript form, they have not been turned into modern editions. The most famous examples include uh, one by Mary Rick, uh, the Countess of Warwick, and Lady Hack Holkit, and yet these by middle-class women, such as Jekyll, are really rare. Women's roles as diarists in many ways allow them to exceed the gender expectations um, that were inflicted upon them. They could become, as Effie Botanaki argues, confessors and account keepers and lawyers. They could transgress in many ways the limits of what was acceptable for female behaviour. And they didn't need an excuse to do this. They could divulge their, form, their thoughts in this literary form and it gave them this opportunity to adopt roles that were forbidden to them otherwise. So, Jekyll's diary has attracted some scholarly attention, as I mentioned before. The diary's political purposes are alluded to sometimes, uh, but not always fully explored. Um, some scholars have really downplayed the importance of this work. It's a 60-page work of scholarship, and yet one um, academic who will not be named dismisses it as merely some jottings. So this is exactly the kind of damaging, dismissive rhetoric that we're working against in our to centralise women at this conference. Um, there are two really prominent scholars who worked uh, on Jekyll's text. And Susan Wiseman, she focuses on the text afterlife, she looks at how the diary contributes to this non-conformist writing culture in the aftermath of the Civil War, and she looks at how the text is a way of provoking political memories, and it's a way of martyring men. And then another key scholar, Elizabeth Clark, she says that the document, quote unquote, functions to vindicate Elizabeth Jekyll's husband. So it's designed by her husband and it's and it's there to function to comment on the end of the century's political climate. 
So these are, in, in many ways, fantastic works of scholarship, <coughs> and they are foundational to the study of Jekyll's diary. But Wiseman assumes that the manuscript was, pr was produced to promote mail and martyrdom, and Clark supposes that it, was in full, that it was solely functioning to increase her husband's business. So they are both saying that it's entirely produced for male ends. And as I stated in my introduction, I would argue that despite the excellent document's complex problem, provenance, um, its original female author shouldn't be overlooked. And we must somehow work out a way of recovering women's identities, like Jekyll's, from the periphery and reinstating them in the center by considering how this book, this was based on a text by Jekyll in some capacity, and how this reveals aspects of her own life and her own thoughts, rather than just functioning to reveal men's experiences. And Jekyll, I would say, needs to be considered as the author, and this needs to be taken seriously, as well as the protagonist, and as well as the political commentator. And although we know so clearly that Jekyll's hands were not involved in the extant volume's physical construction, we must somehow consider how the text's longer chronology functions in order to turn and return authority to its author. But, and this is a really big but, this approach is not without its problems, it's not easy. And I'm sure many of you have encountered this in your own research. It's impossible for me to determine how Jekyll's, how exactly Jekyll's words are replicated in this copy, because her original manuscript does not, as far as we know, survive. And as a result, there's always the chance that her spiritual diary never existed at all. While it's equally possible that the version of the movie 221 is a word-for-word -word transcription, so it could be that it's somewhere on this scale of extremes. Should we instead treat her like a character in this work of literature, as the protagonist, as the female protagonist, or should we consider her as the author, despite having so little evidence to suggest she is the author? Or should we not take such an overly negative view of editors? Should we not, we shouldn't assume that Jekyll's text was unsympathetically transcribed to detract from her recorded intentions. So should we necessarily assume that this has been changed a great deal from its original? And the source's potentially fragmented nature, it remains largely unexplored by scholars, probably because it's just too hard to draw firm conclusions. You want to write about this as a text by a woman, and you just don't have the evidence to back it up. But does this mean that we should forego forging connections between the author and her writing, or assume that the editorial impact on the work is necessarily harmful or monumental? So we, we want to centralise, we must centralise women, even if it's difficult to do so, and even if the evidence that history has left behind makes it really hard for us to do that. So now I just want to talk about the diary's content a little bit, um, in many ways assuming that she wrote it. A brief resume of Jekyll's most significant life events, as they appear to her. They begin, this is how she begins her spiritual diary, and all of these events are determined by God. They include four mercies that have done her good against her will, such as her bodily weaknesses and the deaths of her children and God's great number of mercies. And in doing so, she encompasses the continuation of her life into adulthood and her vocation as a Christian. The first page draws to a close with Jekyll's name and the date, 1643, and this, as I said before, alludes to the personal nature of the document, despite being transcribed. She discusses really difficult pregnancies and childbirths, and she features episodes from the Civil War that occurred at Selby, Bridgewater, Bristol, Marston Moor, Plymouth. And in doing so, she interweaves events that occurred at home and further away. Jekyll's spiritual moments of reckoning, they draw upon a lifetime of experiences, and they're all chosen in hindsight. And this careful selection process, it grants the author time to fully comprehend each of the event's spiritual significance, which might take a while after its initial conception. So Jekyll takes control of this text, and she asserts herself as a worthy author, despite the genre's inherent devotion to higher authorities being a spiritual diary. So although her religious dedication is established from the outset, 
by explaining her thoughts and actions are grounded upon the word of God, as she writes on page two. She clearly states that any opinions voiced in the text are entirely her own, she says. Conscience is my heart and mind and brain indeed with knowledge. God is electing her for the role of author, implying a divine appointment through an irrefutable democratic practice of election. He did choose her, she proudly declares. But as Jekyll repeatedly assures her readers, this worthy selection process, it doesn't jeopardize her autonomy over the diary's content. She says that while God hears prayers, the text comprises my vows, which my lips have uttered and my mouth has spoken. So Jekyll suggests that God receives her religiously inspired ideas, but it's not, she's not God's spokesperson. These are, she is the spiritual diary's sole creator. These are her ideas, and she makes that very clear throughout. And she insists upon her textual authority. And this allows her to deviate from rigorous self-criticism that commonly features in women's spiritual diaries at the time. And it contrasts actually to another example, uh, Elizabeth Morden's manuscript. And Ms. Morden, she has two columns. She, she writes things that she must uh, return thanks for and things that she must ask pardon for. And this is really the, the, the focus of her diary from God. Whereas Jekyll's is really different. And she has this authorial confidence and it allows her this creative space to describe a broad range of events. Women writing in the hands of, she, and in part, she vividly charts her husband's involvement in the war. And this is not unusual. There are famous examples of women who do this. So Lucy Hutchinson on the left and Margaret Cavendish on the right. And these publications were written by women and they are spousal biographies. So this is not uncommon. But Jekyll's is again different from these because she recounts her husband's journeys in her own spiritual diary. So it's not intended as a biography. This is woven in. And she discusses her journeys around England during the English Civil War. So the blue arrows are John Jekyll's travels that she describes. She remarks upon God's great deliverance of John at the siege of Hull in 1643. There came a bullet from the enemy and fell down at his feet and did not hurt him. So miraculously, John was saved. And similarly, the Lord did so deliver him during his travels to Barton upon Humber in North Lincolnshire, when the Lord put it in his heart to stay by the way. A delay was staying by the way, which meant that her husband escaped from being a prisoner. When her husband journeyed to Bristol in 1643, he was there to settle some debts. He was set free after being taken prisoner for a week, and thus you see the goodness of God expressed to us, she decisively concludes. So it's really clear that Jekyll possesses a detailed understanding of the events that she narrates, despite being situated physically hundreds of miles away in London, not near where any of these things were taking place. Jekyll does not determine the direction of her husband's travel, but she interprets it and she controls how these are recounted in her spiritual diary, and she decides exactly what is said and exactly why these events occurred. As Jekyll writes, I desire to take notice of God in the passages of his providence to me concerning my husband, how many ways he hath preserved him. When I know not, he was in danger, where God hath made good his word. So God is responsible for the events that happen to her husband. But Jekyll, as the author, is responsible for how they are written and how she retrospectively presents these in her text. And this is the history, the version of the history that we know, which makes her role as an author so powerful. So why, then, does Jekyll feel entitled to fit John's journeys into her own narrative and place her husband's travels within her own spiritual diary? And she says that this is because she, because God's mercy is so great and so all-encompassing that it gives her the, the courage to write about them. And God's eye allows her eye to stretch beyond its physical capabilities, she declares. And there she is entrusted as an interpreter of these events at home and around the nation. God has trusted her. And she explains in her entry for 1648, 
The Lord has made it a sanctified blessing that I may not only speak his praise, but live his praise. So the author reinstates this notion of that she can live her husband's travels through writing, that she can live these experiences through recounting. I've written analysis of her husband's civil war encounters and her appointment as this holy commentator. It enables her to exceed the parameters of her physical geographies when she's at home in London. The Lord has not shut me up into the hand of the enemy, but he has set my feet in a larger place, she writes. So she speaks freely and she lives broadly through the experiences of her rendition, and this is all facilitated by her faith. So the modern assumption that autobiography and interiority has been firmly linked is complicated in her diary. Because slip between these family-centered anecdotes are also shorter reflections that reflect on nationally significant events, and these are what I put in pink. So Jekyll writes of how, thanks to the great and wonderful mercy of God, Plymouth is saved in 1645 during the war. Similarly, she writes of God's mighty power, which is seen in 1644, when Selby, which is 10 miles of York, from York, is saved when our men who had lain in York to the besieged, they could not enter. And then the Earl, uh, she talks about how the Earl fled, and so York was saved. So Jekyll brings forth these events that would otherwise form the backdrop of her life, and she places them in the foreground, and she places them alongside these personal and these familial events. And she deviates, therefore, from solely providing these personal religious commentaries. And all the time she's you know, insisting that God is very supportive of her handiwork. But she instead is in favour of interpreting it at events that are, they might otherwise have been shut out of the bounds of these spiritual diaries. So she really deviates and supersedes what's expected of this literary genre. And by interdispersing national and biographical anecdotes with the autobiographical form of her writing, she shows that she has a political bias and a commentary that are very prevalent. And this is irrespective of what she physically experiences. So I would like to conclude by saying that by contextualizing the spiritual diary and its conception within the civil war, we can return to some extent autonomy to the author. And while the diary's events are informed by men's physical experiences, they're not necessarily prescribed by them. So Jekyll's interpretations of national events, it sets her texts apart from <coughs> other spiritual diaries that are composed by women. And what becomes clear in Jekyll's text is that writing enables a different kind of agency. Piety allows her to explore the Civil War's events across England, and writing it allows her to define its causes and its effects. Um, and that's the end of my presentation, but I, w I would like to hear if any of you also struggle in the, in the question section with issues of, um, of authorship, and if you feel as though there is almost a greater level of evidence required to prove women's involvement in there is of male authorship, or that we question female authorship, um, and we have to provide more evidence to suggest that, and how we can centralise women when their histories are so sparse or complicated, and this is something that I would like to hear how you deal with it too. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Jimini. So our next speaking is Suzanne Gimbrough. Uh, she's an academic assistant at the Pi University in Berlin. Uh, she's a PhD candidate also there in the binational doctorate program, something about literature. I work for also in German. <laughs> <laughs> um, she studied literature and linguistics in the Humboldt University uh, and in Cambridge University. So today she's going to talk about Lou Andrea Solomi, a central yet peripheral intellectual. Have fun. Thank you very much for um, the, the introduction and also for the organ to the organizers of um, the conference. 
I would now like to introduce to you Andrea Sanini as a central yet radical intellectual. In the case of Andrea Sanini, it is not exactly true to speak of a woman whose biographical identity needs to be rediscovered. On the contrary, she is a central figure of German speaking farmers of the culture and part of the cultural memory. Yet, this is primarily due to her association with Friedrich Nietzsche, Anna Maria Rilke, and Sigmund Freud. In this paper, I argue that despite her beyond all doubt interesting biography and relations to her male companions, her own literary and theoretical work received, by contrast, far too little attention. The male dominated discourse of the last century, but also some feminist positions seeking to reclaim her biographical identity, have assigned her a paradoxical position in which she is central regarding the influence on the works of the male companions, yet peripheral concerning the relevance of her own work. In the following, I will demonstrate the discrepancy between her well established reputation as an independent scholar at the time and her reduction to a historical figure over time. Um, I would like to do this by um, structuring my paper into these four smaller sections. Um, um, Duel Army undeniably lived an extraordinary life and reacted against the constraints imposed on her as a bourgeois woman at the turn of the 20th century. Born in 1861 in St. Petersburg and named after her mother, Louise von Salome, she was raised in a bourgeois aristocratic family. She grew up with five brothers and a profound cultural education, speaking German, Russian, and French at home. Although she received institutionalized education only for a short period, she dedicated her life to learning and was a central figure among founders, the Ecle intellectuals among them Leo Tolstoy, Gerhard Hauptmann, Frank Wiedekind, and as often documented, she had close connections to Nietzsche, Lilke, and Freud. She practiced as the first female psychoanalyst up until her death in 1937 in Göttingen. Throughout her life, Andrea Salome published books, partly due to the need of becoming economically independent. She wrote several literary works and novels, such as Im Kampf um Gott, Mut, Ma, and Rotika, besides many theoretical works and essays, for example, a critical analysis of Ibsen's Heroines in 1892, one of the earliest treatises on the works of Friedrich Nietzsche, essays on gender, as well as several psychoanalytical papers. At the time of their publication, her works were well received. Several scholars highlighted her well-established status as author, theorist, and psychoanalyst, quoted and remarked on her. Philosopher Karl Löwe described her analysis of Nietzsche's works as mature and elaborated. He also noticed that already in the half decade, decade after its publication, no other work had taken a more central approach, and yet there was none being noted less. This seems to apply to her publications in general. After her death, Andrea Salome's work received limited attention and was first rediscovered during the feminist movements of the 1970s and 80s. Looking into the literature published on her throughout the last decade, one may find some insightful monographs analyzing her literary and theoretical work, for example, these written by Katrin Schütz and Gisela Brinkler Schabler. Some of these works stress that lived experience and thought were in fact closely interconnected in Andrea Salome's thinking, and therefore read her work in conjunction with her biography and the triad Nietzsche Lilke Freud. Examples are Christiane Miller's account on Andrea Salome as a psychoanalyst or Billy Martin's book. However, the overwhelming majority of published work on her up until today concerns her biography. Without doubt, her biography is fascinating and perhaps of remarkable interest in the light of feminist debates. During her lifetime, she was both celebrated and criticized for her rather ambiguous role and attitude towards women's emancipation. Up until the present, an urge to reclaim her as a feminist idol was visible, 
Although some of our essentialist hypotheses on gender are dismissed by present feminist readers. In sum, the main research interest in Andrea Sala may over time concerns the rewriting and rediscovering of her biographical identity to answer Emil Buddha's remarkable woman's words. There are at least three types of common narratives in framing her identity as a femme fatale or a muse, either dependent on intellectual inspiration by, by men or enabling creativity of males. Or she is portrayed as a free living exceptional case, the ideal feminist role model. To illustrate this point, I now move on to analyze the present fictional works portraying her. With regard to an influence on cultural memory, fictional representations of historical figures generally address a non scholarly and thus larger audience, and therefore might have greater influence on framing identities. In some works, Andrea Salomi appeared as a central fictional character such as in Irving D. Yalom's international bestseller, Benicio Wept, from 1992, and its film adaptation by Pinchas Perry from 2007. Benicio Wept is a fictional story based on historical characters and intended to work as a teaching novel for individuals interested in psychoanalysis and its history, as well as aspects of Nietzsche's philosophy. The author connects the two main characters, Dr. Josef Breuer and Friedrich Nietzsche, who never met in reality, through the figure of Andreas Salome. In the novel, Andreas Salome is portrayed as a woman of strong will and direct in contact. Without minding other patients in his waiting room, she would rush into his office to speak to Breuer on multiple occasions. Dr. Breuer's character utters to be captured by her beauty and behavior. While his objectifying descriptions clearly illustrate the protagonist's male gaze, and while the novel explores the power of male desire extensively, some aspects with regard to Yuvandria Salami continue common narratives of her being a femme fatale and a direct dependence on inspiration through her male companions. This mostly becomes apparent through a direct monologue articulated by Andrea Salami's eponymous fictional character. Dr. Breuer and Luzan may look directly into his eyes. Forgive my imprecision. Perhaps I am unnecessarily indirect. I've always enjoyed basking in the presence of great minds, perhaps because I need models for my own development. Perhaps I simply like to collect them. But I do know I feel privileged to converse with the men of your depth and range. While portraying the character of Flandria Salome depending on external inspiration and in seducing for her physical appearance, Irving Nadov contributes to a problematic image of the historical person. His description of Andrea Salome reduces her to her feminine body in denial of her intellectual achievements. Perry's film from 2007 follows up by presenting her in extravagant dresses performing seducing smiles and gestures, such as leaning over Dr. Breuer's desk by letting him light her cigarette. And I'll show you some screenshots, and uh, I apologize for the bad quality of them, although the film is also not of high quality. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the, the scene I meant. <coughs> that's her with Nietzsche showing <laughs> And that actually draws on a, on a real um, photography uh, of her and the but yeah, in a very um, intimate way. In the film's appendix, that's the screenshot of it, Luandre Salami is explicitly described as having continued to collect the greatest minds of Europe. In summary, both works portray Andrea Salami as a femme fatale. This image had been assigned to her occasionally during her lifetime and a play on words with her birth name and its New Testament story correspondence to the figure of Salome. Following the great demand of female typologies around 1900, Lua Salome's identity has often been framed by the role of the muse, a diva of the depraved temptress. 
both works continued his narratives without acknowledging her role as a productive author and psychoanalyst. These representations are counterproductively in the current image of a former female intellectual. Hodder like Harvard's post biographical <laughs> 2016 clearly presents a more encompassing approach to Rwanda's sodomy. Yet, it seems primarily to aim at presenting her as an identification figure rather than engaging with specific themes of Andrea Salome's intellectual work. According to the demand mentioned above, I now will focus on a small section of her literary and theoretical work to highlight her intellectual progressiveness and independence. Anna Freud, and that's Freud's daughter, called Andrea Salome's book on Nietzsche from 1894 a precursor to psychoanalysis. Not only through this study, drawing on her close personal connection to the philosopher, but also in other work, she develops elements of psychoanalytic thought before both its actual origination as well as her personal contact with Sigmund Freud. In 1898, Andrea Salome published two novellas, Pinochka and Eine Ausschweifung, um, which has been translated to deviation, whose themes revolve around female identity and sexuality. Both novellas portray female protagonists in the time of transition, where they need to choose between a psychological and economic independence or a fulfilling romantic relationship. Benia, the protagonist of Phoenix Girl, tries to develop a career as a scholar and teacher. She refuses marriage, which would not allow for her to work. The novella is narrated through the perspective of a male character, Max Werner, whom Fania eventually befriends. Max learns about Fania's extramarital affair, and they engage in long conversations regarding the role of women in society and exchange opinions on love and sexuality. In one of these conversations, Fania and Max discuss a recent dream of her. While the sequence plays an important role in the, in the setting of the novella, I would like to draw your attention to the ideas of dreams itself, which are introduced by the character of Fania in this paragraph. So in case anyone knows some German, <laughs> Are you good at interpreting dreams? Um, she asked her, and then she goes on and tells him her dream. I don't quite understand, Finia, that this is a stupid dream. Not as stupid as you believe, but why should dreams be wise anyway? I believe it is not our intelligent thoughts that make up the fabric of our dreams. No, all those enlightened and sensible opinions we have gradually acquired, those we do not have in dreams. In dreams, we see ourselves differently, ourselves and everything else, confused maybe and mixed up, but totally naive. Being published in 1898, years before Andreas Salome meets Freud and studies <coughs> psychoanalysis, this section of the novella predates some central elements generally associated with Freud's The Interpretation of Dreams, published by the end of the following year. Benia introduces Marx to the idea that our intelligent thoughts, all the enlightened and sensible opinions, acquired throughout the day and our lifetime were not visible in dreams. In this paragraph, Fania assumes a clear differentiation between the conscious thoughts of the day and the unconscious thoughts which form the dream content in Freudian terms. She furthermore emphasizes that dreams are not stupid after all, but instead give valuable insight into a different perspective on the dreamer, which she calls naive, but clearly ascribes a certain value to. The character of Mia, moreover, uses a metaphor describing the unnamed opposite to the intelligent thoughts, the unconscious thoughts, and psychoanalytic terms as informing a fabric and weaving a dream. The ideas worded here express a similar concept to the dream as later published famously in Freud's Interpretation of Dreams, in which the unconscious thoughts through the process of dream work are transformed from latent dream thoughts into manifest dream content. In addition, they are articulated from a female perspective, 
and are grounded in reflection on, not, on lived experience, a philosophical focus often apparent in Nadia Sami's works. In summary, this novella already lays out some central ideas of the interrelation between consciousness, unconsciousness, and the process of dream work. Nonetheless, this work and its author are not considered as discourse representatives with regard to the two ideas corresponding to Freud's work, which by contrast is entirely identified as groundbreaking. In the second novella, Deviation, published the same year, the novella's protagonist discusses the role of early childhood memories with regard to individual development and desire. According to Ivan Roth, a leading sexologist around 1900, the story marked one of the most exceptional artistic and psychological established representations of psych psychic masochistic desire in females. Before and after her discovery of psychoanalysis, Andrea Sarmi had published many other works and papers addressing not only, but also the missing female perspective in the male-dominated psychoanalytic discourse. To conclude, I would like to address the question of why we may find this discrepancy between contemporary and present reception of the work. One possible answer may be a timely situatedness of the work. Indeed, some scholars claim her books would be too strongly attached to the specific historical conditions of their origin. With regard to a qualitative approach to a literary canon, a certain timelessness is often considered as one of the key elements to dis distinguish sorry, an interesting work from one less so. On the contrary, these characteristics of phenomenal practice still neglect a materialistic approach to writing and the obvious differing point of departure for a young female writer at the turn of the 20th century in comparison to a male writer in Central Europe. Furthermore, both contemporary as well as present scholars sometimes rightly admit that Andrea Salomi's writing style is rare, rarely straightforward, but rather follows a winding path that never loses sight, sight of its goal, as described by her contemporary Hans Sachs. Other current scholars put it more directly. Understanding her writing can be challenging, especially her theoretical. Although I would not go so far as to deny their observation, I strongly suggest there, that there are countless other authors, most of them male, being read and reread for decades to which a similar statement would apply. I, there, I therefore deem both of these possible solutions as invalid. I assume that the actual reason for the discrepancy between biographical interest and theoretical engagement is based on an undaunted desire for convenient narratives and female stereotypes, such as the muse, the diva, the femme fatale, and even the feminist idol, as which Juan S. Salome is often framed. Rediscovering women's identities outrightly therefore means avoiding simply admire, admiring their biographical identity, but engaging with their works and thoughts thoroughly. As goes for countless female writers and intellectuals, the case of Mordred Salome illustrates how visibility and invisibility of women's identities can coexist. While her biographical identity is central as a part of cultural memory, she has been peripheral with regard to a liberation from the archive and an integration into the canon for decades. Fortunately, she can after all be identified on some current seminar reading list, not only focusing on female writers, but more generally on founders the active culture. Interestingly, she seems to be more visible in Anglo-American curricula for German than in Germany. But this is yet to prove and question. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> in the history department, um, she studied history at the University of Bologna, where she graduated from Laude in 2017. 
uh, with a final dissertation entitled Female Association and Energy Consumption in England between the 20s and the 50s, uh, where she lies the consumption policy uh, of the Electrical Association for Women, interesting, and the Women Gas Council. Um, so I don't have the title of your paper because I don't have the sheet, but um, you can tell us. Sure. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. <laughs> In a hurry, and then I regret about this. <laughs> so, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for being here and to the organizers for this opportunity. So, I am currently a PhD student in Bologna, and actually, my um, my focus, the focus of my research, is uh, actually <clears throat> the 70s in Italy, and I'm studying how. You know, consumption and austerity uh, influence political movements and pop culture, basically. And so, this, so this is not linked to my current research. But I met TBJ as she, TBG as she like to be called, Teresa Billington Gregg, while studying, while researching for my MA final dissertation here at the British Library. And so I. I think she was a really interesting thinker that was a bit, I think, forgotten. And so uh, that's why I like to uh, try to, uh, you know, rediscover her thought and discuss about it with other researchers. Um, so what's the uh, uh, history of consumption? Basically, we study how consumption changed throughout history. And one of my interests is understand how consumption influenced the concept like citizenship or uh, gender, for example. Um, and so why gender is important? Basically, since the 18th century, consumption became more and more linked to gender. Uh, there was this sort of dichotomy uh, that um, just opposed masculine simplicity in a positive way and feminine consumism, which, which was seen in a negative Way, but uh, some women throughout centuries were able to um, take this sort of negative assumption and use it in a political way. A lot of uh, women from in, uh, inside different uh, political movements, like uh, in the anti corn law league, they used consumption practices in order to um, win their political uh, battles. And also in the suffrage campaign, they uh, they used you know boycott and boycott, for example, in order to sustain their campaigns. Um, so from another another important example of uh, this link between consumption and politics is the so-called consumer citizen concept. Uh, mostly at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, consumption, the, the consumer became, um, a, uh, the, the consumer became, um, as I can say, a, a responsible citizen. Being a consumer, especially at the beginning of the 20th century, I'm talking about the UK, of course, uh, meant to be someone who consume, who buy, and so on, uh, but thinking, and uh, sorry, uh, regarding, you know, um, uh, being responsible, try to be responsible in the regard of his or her community. And the Women's Cooperative Guild were an important female cooperative movement who tried to, uh, uh, and, and who tried to um, uh, be, in, sorry, um, who tried to uh, focusing on women's emancipation and uh, uh, women's work and so on. But starting from women's daily life, you know uh, how they how they vote, how they uh, had to deal with uh, uh, daily life issues. Um, also, a lot of socialist militants, such as Margaret X, theorized uh, consumption in a political way. Margaret X stated that women were chancellor of the of the exchequer of the home, 
So she tried to politicize the domestic world. And uh, also Clementina Black founded the Consumers League. So she, she founded this uh, association, female, mostly female association, in which consumption issues became uh, a political priority. And she organized boycotts of those companies that did not guarantee fair wages. So basically, basically all these women, militant women, um, try to um, uh, try to give uh, political tools to women who were not, um, who did not have an access into the, you know, uh, political world to who who did not have vote, who did no, were not, could not be um, protagonists in uh, uh, in male organizations. Uh, the, uh, both the world wars were really. Uh, fundamental, extremely relevant in shaping consumption and the role of the consumer citizen. Uh, one example is that in the First World War, um, there was this uh, Consumers Council, uh, which basically was a um, sort of uh, organization in which uh, they, the, um, the government tried to understand the consumers' needs during the war, the war and the women had a really important role inside this uh, council, uh, not just because of how much they work, because how many they work, because you can see the, pers the percentage was not that high, but actually women were, take, uh, were taken really into consideration because they were seen as the consumers. And so they, were, they had a lot of, uh, um, they could, I mean, they could speak a lot, they could have a, a lot, they were taken a lot into consideration inside this uh, council. So, TBG. Uh, she was born in 1877 in Preston. She had an academic career in Manchester, where she met Emily Pankhurst, and then she joined the Women's Social and Political Union. And um, because of, but because of some really deep political um, disagreements, she left the WSPU and founded, uh, together with a group of women, the Women's Freedom League. Um, she was a prolific writer. She wrote a lot of pamphlets and articles, for example, The Woman and the Whip, Suffragist Tactics. Um, but her uh, work that got my attention a couple of years ago is The Consumer Revolt that she wrote in 1912. Um, so, uh, this is a nice picture of three militants of the Women's Freedom League and their car, and you know. They campaign around the country. Uh, okay, first I would like I wanted to understand um, why you know she left the suffrage movement. Uh, basically, basically she um, she believed that uh, the suffrage movement. She wrote that in uh, 1907 when she left uh, the WSPU. Uh, the suffrage movement has confined itself almost entirely to politics, and in politics to the winning of the parliamentary vote. It has shut off, evaded or neglected everything else. So that, at this present time, there is no feminist movement in the country, but only a suffrage movement and chaos. So, uh, what, so basically she believed that uh, the suffrage movement just only focusing on the vote issue, on uh, changing laws, basically became detached from the, the real issues of women, of working class women, and uh, you know, from the masses. And she believed that f a feminist movement, that what, what she believed was feminism. In her opinion, feminism may be defined as a movement seeking the reorganization of the world upon a basic of sex, of a basis of sex equality in all human relations. A movement seeking to remodel social life to create another industrial revolution, to purge sex relations of the element of birth and property, to set, up, to set up a new type of home and family relations. So families should deal with this amount of issues, and not only the vote, uh, but the supporters of sex equality have reduced their public demands so far as to cut themselves off completely from vital things, from the lives women live, from injuries they suffer, it did not touch the mass. So that's the main issues uh, that led to her, uh, you know, uh, that led her to uh, leaving the WSPU. Um, so why um, she started to uh, study, analyze 
the, um, the nature of women oppression. And she said that women suffer under two oppressions, a sexual one and an economic one. Um, the sexual one, the sex inequality, in her opinion, uh, was persists today, not just because of the law, but because of, uh, of costume. So in her opinion, um, a new law is not useless if we don't change the culture first. So it depends much more upon costume than upon law. But focusing only on the vote, ignoring everyday issues, uh, led the suffrage movement in becoming more and more conservative. Uh, and she stated that other rebellions have failed, this movement has failed rebellion. It has gradually edged the working class element out of the ranks. It has become socially exclusive, punctiliously correct, gracefully fashionable, ultra-respectable, narrowly religious. I do interrupt meetings, but I'm a perfect lady. <laughs> <laughs> so, what about the economic oppression? Um, she believed, of course, uh, I mean, economic the, the, the disadvantage of women uh, talk when regarding of, you know, the uh, labor uh, issue was quite obvious even back then. Uh, so she was trying to understand which were the causes of this. And uh, she said that women are robbed of a certain part of their earnings because they are women. One can understand the employer doing this. Woman is voteless and of the lowest social industrial status. But one cannot understand the workman giving his support to the employer's injustice. So that is the main problem, according to TVG. Um, the main problem was the lack of solidarity from working class men. Uh, that's, in her opinion, this division, that was the, the cause of the failing of the workers' revolt. Um, so, she was like, why? She, she basically started to um, uh, try to understand why there is this division, why working class men uh, you know, don't support women uh, issues, don't, uh, don't, and, and so basically gave their trust to the owner, to uh, the landlord, landlord, to the profiteer. And so she wrote The Consumer and Revolt. Um, this is a gender reflection on capitalism, on the separation between private and public sphere, and on the complementarity of production and consumption. And that's the, a really fundamental concept here, the complementarity. Um, because um, she, she stated, she believed that um, we are split human beings, basically. We are split between being producers and consumers. And in her, in her opinion, that is actually a false belief. Um, because people are workers and consumers. They are organized only as workers, and they ignore themselves as consumers. And that's where all the problem started. Um, then she wrote one of the first chapters of her book, An Economic Divorce. She uh, created this concept to uh, justify uh, the, the, her, her, her current situation. There are some unions made by necessity, from which there is no escape. And one of these is the union of the consumer and the producer. It is not to promote industry, nor to provide products for consumption, that the profiteer steps between the two natural and necessary elements in the economic world. It is to promote profit making, the getting of something for nothing. And seeking this end, the profiteer has not only diverted the whole force of industry into false channels and confused the whole problem by his presence and exceptions, but he has succeeded in dividing the two natural partners in economics, the one against the other. So, it's not a matter of producers versus consumers, it's not a matter of men versus women. We have to all to unite in order to defeat the common enemy. Who is the common, common enemy? The profiteer. That's the common enemy of both uh, women, men, consumers and producers. So, what about the role of women? Um, then she stated in another chapter, the name of the national purchaser is woman. Under present conditions, with the narrow cutting off of women's interests and the stress of economic poverty, the quality has been pushed aside by the paramount question of prices of quantity. The, seg the segregation of women, each shut apart in her own home, tends in the same way to delay protest and organization. Not only does the exclusion of women from public life postpone the cooperative action between workers and consumers, 
and its consequent harvest of reform. But is, it is matter worthy of inquiry as to whether the subjection of women as not being in great part responsible for the diversion of produ productive industry from its natural object. The doctrine of profits is closely allied to the doctrine of the superiority of the producer. So, focusing only on production, on the figure of you know, male as the breadwinner, um, basically created, uh, you know, uh, led to the male dominance in the public sphere. And so, uh, woman as the consumer, as the national purchaser, was despised and underestimated. And so we need to revaluate uh, woman as cons evaluate consumption in order to revaluate also the women role in the public sphere. Uh, she also stated that it seems obvious that the domination of the world by the producer was the historical preliminary birth of the profiteering system. And the logical deduction from this fact is that had the consumer shared the world control, the diversion of industry might not have occurred. It would th thus seem that a very heavy price has been exacted from humanity for the sex subjection of women and the economic divorce which it has occasioned. Woman the consumer has been revenge for the degradation of woman the creature of sex. And it follows that the economic reorganization of the world can only come when woman is active and free. So, we need to revaluate consumption in order to reunite the two halves of this unity that was you know, split by the uh, profiteer. And uh, to defeat the profiteer, we have to be to unite. Um, and unity so was fundamental in order to you know, win the workers' revolt. Therefore, women were extremely important for uh, both the sexes in order to change the entire economic system. So it was not just a battle from women for women, it was a battle for, from women for everyone. That was uh, a relief. Um, but uh, the problem uh, of uh, uh, that she um, basically uh, wasn't able to, she decided not to get, after leaving uh, the WSPU and after uh, working with the Women's, Women's Freedom League, she started to um, uh, be not really, um, she didn't believe a lot in uh, uh, militancy. Uh, she for, for a long time left militancy because she wasn't able to compromise. She didn't. Uh, um, she didn't. Uh, well, she wasn't interested in short-term political actions. She didn't see any utility in working in parliament and uh, in, uh, in the involvement of women. Uh, you know, only uh, with, with the political parties, and so she wasn't able to produce also a specific. Um, uh, ensemble of policy measures. She didn't join a consumer movement or female association for a long time. Uh, then she changed her mind after the First World War, but uh, this is another another paper. And uh, there was uh, so there was no she she created this interesting female country public discourse uh, in which she uh, put together uh, consumption production and also the. Um, in the uh, you know uh, inequality in, uh, the inequality characteristics of the sex inequality of her society, but she wasn't able to um, to con concretize this uh, this discourse. And although she uh, never ceased to believe in the power of women for independent organization to make cultural change, so she uh, was in her entire life. She continued to be involved in a political campaign and to try to educate uh, you know, society in order to make a cultural change. And um, I would like to, uh, to conclude my presentation uh, by reminding you of the global women's strike in a couple of days <laughs> and saying that I mean, apart for the right to work, we should also fight, as, as TBG stated, for the right to enjoy. Thank you very much.
Elina Marquez Garcia Largo will speak today about uh, women and scapigliatura feminine rebellion in the Milan of the 19th century. Melina has a degree in Italian philology from Complutense University of Madrid and a master's degree in translation study. Among her publications, the co-authorship of the article Convivio de Dante Alighieri and La Traduzione de Rivas Sheriff in the Biblioteca de Traduttore de Cervantes Virtual, the edition of Arte para Aprender Danzar by Cesare Negri. In Papeles Barbieri and Los Italianos de Arrigo Boito, Reflexion sobre il posizionamento linguistico di Arrigo Boito intorno alla questione della lingua risorgimentale. As a translator, she has recently published La Playa by Cesare Pavese and Maloca Maloca, una pediatra in Amazonia by Michela Sonego, both by Alta Maria Visiones. The translation of Una Mujer, Una Donna, <laughs> by Sibilla de Ramo will be published in the next Now she is uh, accomplishing a PhD at the Universidad Autónoma of Madrid, editing a correspondence between the Scapigliato Arrigo Boito and the French poet Victor Hugo and analyzing their plausible artistic connection. Thank you, Kit. Uh, thank you for being here. Good afternoon. Uh, well, this um, is that's fine. Um, okay, as I said, I'm working already on the scapigliatura or scapigliato a uh, But this, what I'm doing today, is a new approach to the scapigliatura. Uh, it's a movement I have been working on for the past four years, PhD. But this is new for me because I dare to talk about women and scapigliatura and after this I would like to get to the conclusion, negative or positive, if these uh, two writers, uh, Cordelia and Marquisa Colombi, could be labeled as scapigliante, or better to say if they wrote a text which could, which could be linked to the poetic uh, of this movement of the 19th century. Also, I aim to extend the concept of rebellion associated to this movement and its new concept of uh, art opposite the tradition, scapigliatura. A movement to the female rebellion accomplished by these two authors, among others, to change the role of women in literature not only as characters but as writers. To sum up, I would like to uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about la, la scapigliata as a new literary identity. Uh, first of all, well, during this presentation, all the uh, all the citations are going to be in Italian on the slides. The translations, uh, sorry, are mine because these texts are, are not translated into English. I apologize for the translation. It's from Italian into English. It's quite difficult for me, but I'm going to read the translation in English. So, uh, what is scapigliatura? Arrigo Boito, uh, in his Manifesto della Politica Letteraria in 1864, said, and I quote in English. It will be a sick, vain art to say of many, an art of decadence, of baroque, of rationalism, of realism, and here it is finally the word spit. So was scapigliatura realism? Was it baroque? Was, was it decadence? Scapigliatura was many things, depending on the author, because the main aspect of the scapigliatura movement was the heterogeneity. But uh, um, let's rephrase the question. But what do we understand for scapigliatura? After four years, I might say that I still don't know, seriously. Critics and researchers do not agree about a definition, not even about the writers who could be labeled as scapigliati. Any new volume I read about the movement presents new names to increase the long, already long list of scapigliati. Just to say some names, we have the Fratelli Boito, Emilio Praga, Giovanni Camerani, Giuseppe Romani, Carlo Dossi, Tarchetti, Pandelle, Giacomo, Sacalando, Michele Uda, Gipi, Inchetti, Fica Fuana, Tony Vizzanzoni, Giovanni Cagna, Battuzzi, Verena Portana, Eugenio Troisi, and so on. But where are the women in this list? And how do we describe the Scapigliatura's literature? I will answer the second question in the first place, and the first question maybe later. Scapigliatura is for this moment and for this reflection, anti-romanticism, I mean, they, are, they talk about death, but not with the melancholy associated to the romantics. The dualism, uh, this ideal against reality, good, evil, beauty, ugliness, um, grotesque, uh, as an influence mainly by Victor Hugo, the grotesque, this mix between deformity, uh, sarcasm as a way of, of presenting the uh, society, and no moral purposes. I mean, they write for the, it's like the motto, art for the art's sake. Actually, sometimes they describe the scapigliatura as an avant-garde anti-literum. So, so you can see scapigliatura can be many, many things. 
But going back to the first question I did before, where are women in this long list of scapigliati? In this text, I quote, I'm going to read in English, um, you can find the very beginning of my reflection. Um, and I'm going to quote, in all the great and rich cities of this civilized world, there is a certain amount of individuals of both sexes. There are those who could say a certain race of people between 20 and 35 years of age. Here we have the text written by Gleb Parighi, Anagram of Carlo Righetti, in his novel La Scappiatura in Febbraio, published in 1862. Here there is one of the first definitions of the movement by a contemporary, and one of the Scappiatic, Gleb Parighi, a kind of a statement of intention of the revolutionary artistic movement. As you can see, I have highlighted individuals um, individual of both sexes, but again, where are women? Where were women Scappiatic? To answer this question, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about women, uh, this woman men mentioned by Clectori uh, in the Milan of the 19th century. To simplify, I have made these two categories that actually are directly linked. We have the Salotti, so these uh, cultural um, uh, meetings which take place periodically in a specific location, often in private homes. One of the famous ones was uh, uh, Contessa Maffei or Vittoria Tima. Uh, it is important to us because the Salotti were visited by the intellectual elites in Milan at that time. And in the second half, uh, at that time, sorry. The Scapigliati were part of these intellectual elites and cons consequently were regular visitors of these uh, cultural meetings. La Marchesa Colombi and Cordelia, you can see the pictures of there, uh, are also included in this Salotti category, uh, not only because both of them run Salotti, but because they visited also other salotti, like uh, they were regulars in Vittoria Tima's uh, salotto, and they meant and shared the space with the scapigliati, or the, the writers already labeled as the scapigliati, scapigliati. But these two female writers are also in, uh, part of the other category, the writers, the women writers. And above all, in the writers who published their works in the main newspapers of the time, such as in Fanfulla, Corriere della Sera, or La, La Perseveranza. We will see individually how Cordelia and Marchesa Colombi were part of this literary life of the Scapilla Villa. But, again, are they literally linked to the Scapilla Villa? Well, until now we have only briefly mentioned that both of them shared intellectual uh, elites, like intellectual circles, the Salotti, and also same, uh, we can say, publishing platforms, the newspapers, because they were publishing in the same places. In the next minutes, I aim to explain whether some works by Cordelia and Marchesa Colombi could be considered as scapigliate. Uh, with the words, I mean, I have only work on the shorter stories. I'm not going to talk about poems, I'm, <laughs> but uh, it's only a, about the shorter stories of a conti. Um, how are we going to elucidate this? Again, following some of the aspects associated in this case with the racconti scapigliate, to the shorter stories. I'm going to talk about insanity. Idea fissa, uh, like an obsession, grotesque as part of the reality, positivism, progress in science, and rebellion against the tradition. And with rebellion, I mean not only the rebellion uh, in art, but also uh, uh, in social I and mean, in society, political, and in the case of the woman, as uh, women. Let's start with Cordelia, Medina Tedeschi Treves. Cordelia was an, uh, her alias. Um, was born in 1849 in Verona in an upper class family. His uncle was the founder of the publishing house Raquel and Tedeschi, and Virginia was uh, early channel in the writing studies. In the 1870s, she married Giuseppe Treves, brother of the journalist Emilio Treves, and both founded this, the, two, the two brothers founded the publishing house Fratelli Treves. Virginia uh, would be published novels, short stories, and children's literature, and in her husband's publishing house. But also, her stories could be read in these newspapers I mentioned before. Uh, the work by Virginia Treves, taken into consideration for this reflection, is the volume Verso il Mistero, published in 1905 by Treves Editori. This uh, volume, some six short stories, where scientific progress is the lead thread, but also in which can be found similarities with some famous Racconti Scapigliati. There are two main topics in the six short stories. We have insanity and against uh, science, progress. The stories develop like the same kind of uh, topics, creating diversity, uh, diver uh, I, sorry, a diversity range of fantastic day-to-day -day lives, in which next to the main, main male character, there is always a female character in the same or similar position of knowledge. Uh, and the description of the reality includes the ugliness and the unpleasant uh, that is quite common also in the short stories by the Scapigliani. Uh, I have, uh, I'm going to 
the, the example here is, uh, belongs to Fosforescenze, one of the short stories of the uh, volume. I'm going to read in English. Here we have two aspects uh, that I'm going to talk about. And I put in English. Next to him, a beautiful girl, Marcella Montecchi, a graduate in natural science, was intent on removing the trails of some flies with a pin. <laughs> the two important things here are first, that she says, um, uh, Marcella Montecchi, a graduate in natural science. So it's actually a woman, laureata in scienza. Right. So uh, it's, uh, she's positioned the woman uh, next to the man in the same position uh, of knowledge. And the second, this amazing thing about the Vichelli di alcune mosche. <laughs> Sorry, because it's after lunch, I'm going to talk about unpleasant things. Uh, 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 that um, actually is uh, a way of describing the uh, the disgusting, that the scapigliati loft at that time. And she uh, does it also. Keep in mind the idea of flies, because I'm going to turn to it <laughs> later. Uh, but first, we have the idea, the idea pista obsession. In una tragedia di intervello, a doctor, the woman, help her husband to find, about, uh, to find out about his obsession. And I quote in English the first example, but obeying the impulse of his obsession, he entered the tavern. He sees this man, dead people, every night when dreaming awake. Somehow she heals him. So we have the woman who is a doctor who heals the man. So she, he needs her to uh, be recovered. The intervention of the woman is necessary. Another woman in the savior, is the savior of l'anima del mondo. The story is about Hugo, a scientist who is sent to an asylum for his obsession to find the soul of the world. But his aunt, Julia, a person always interested in Hugo's uh, scientific progress, helped him to be released from the asylum and also to continue with his important research. These both stories use an obsession to trace the main character conscience. And I call the second one in English with the obsession, idea fissa, of finding the soul of the world. Cordelia uses this idea fissa and fissazione as equivalent to obsession. This term as idea fissa has appeared previously in the history of La Scappigliatura in Arrivo Botto, short stories. He published two stories uh, under the title Idee Fisse because an obsession was the lead thread of them. Uh, from Versi Mistero, this is I use Goya, because I'm from Spain, I need to use him. <laughs> the story of Sforescenze could be treated as the Racconto Scapigliato by Cervantes, written by Cordelia. In addition to the scientific topic and the insanity of the male character, as well as the revolutionary character of the female character, sorry, <laughs> the description of some scenes following the unpleasant motto, uh, Abranchiarsi al Rendo, that is a motto by the Scapigliati, uh, as you can see again, the mosque flies. She says, in the early days of their marriage, they had to, ba to ban disgusting insects, a lovely honeymoon for them, like flies, and devote themselves to the observation of dazzling insects. Cordelia remains uh, in the superficiality, actually, of the orenno, of the disgusting things, but still she describes the topic of scientific research talking about disgusting insects, and uh, before we uh, have seen removing the entrails of flies. And especially uses the image of flies, an image used by Arrigo Volto in one of his most experimental poems, Balatella, again, I'm sorry for the translation, as in the midst of the dry summer, for the wide open fences, a cloud of flies enters, dark and golden, bizarre and gloomy fantasies, they penetrate my heart. The image of something unpleasant as a group of flies, like a metaphor of uh, his fantasies, or in Cordelia's short story, the flies as part of the dualistic comparison, we can say, between the disgusting insects and the dazzling insects. We could appeal in this case to the beauty, ugliness, dualism claimed by this capillatura to describe reality. And this is getting worse with the Marquesa Colombia. <laughs> Maria Antonita uh, Torriani Alessandra Marquesa Colombia was born in 1840, uh, then by, uh, sorry, yeah. Um, she, was, uh, she was a regular in Victoria Cima Salotto, one of the most popular salotti in Milan and one of the most visited by the revolutionary writers. Again, Enrico Volto was a regular next to his friend and poet Emilio Braga, part of his intellectual elite, was also there, Giuseppe Pedagosa, and the journalist Enrico Torelli Violier. The last one, founder of the Corriere della Sera, uh, Maria Antonietta, got married. She was uh, an acclaimed, she became an acclaimed journalist in the Milan newspapers at the time, and their marriage lasted until Torriani's near field committed suicide. After that, uh, she broke up with uh, Enrico Torelli Violier and she moved to, Turin, uh, to Torino, where she opened her own salotto. 
La Marchesa Colombi in her stories managed to use some of the unpleasant topics developed by the Scapigliati and introduce them as part of the plot without giving up her own cause, the defense of women's role in society. Let me tell you that La Marchesa Colombi entered one of the lists, uh, this famous list of Scapigliati that I mentioned before, in a volume from the 2001, uh, it's a volume uh, edited by Giselda Padovani and Rita Verdirame, the, the title is Il Verme la Farfalla, Autori e Testi Rai della Scappigliatura da Tarchetti a Calandra, the Marchesa Colombia, and, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> is there also. Uh, and the text they chose is Il Curare, is, is this, um, is this uh, short story. And here it is important to clarify that this connection to the Scappigliatura is not only to the works and writings of the main writers already considered Scapigliati, but also with the writers European and beyond, established as the inspiration for this artistic group of uh, Milan. Now, Marchesa Colombi knew Victor Hugo, for example, one of his, uh, one of the masters of the Scapigliatura, according to the, to the critics. In fact, she translated him, so obviously she read him, and also I'm sure she read Edgar Allan Poe, as we are going to see now. These influences can be traced in these stories, like in Curare, where the catalepsy is a motive for the whole story. And I quote in English, No human mind has ever imagined anything so cruel. I couldn't even turn my eyes, not even close them. My limbs were petrified. I was in prison alive in a dead body. The catalepsy is a topic could be traced in the shorter stories by Edgar Allan Poe. Also, the death of the body is a late motif in the Racconti Scapigliati, like the shorter story written by Camilla Volto, Un Corpo, where death and art are in the same category. Actually, uh, as Hermenegilda uh, Pierabon ends talking about the works of La Marchesa Colombi in her article Pazia, Amore, Morte, Spunti Scapigliati, in the La Marchesa Colombi, quote, the ideal sphere can be only fully realized in death and in art. The Morti Parlano is a funny story, believe me, <laughs> in which science, death, and irony are joined to tell a story about insanity and ignorance with Hamlet and the theatre as a frame. The main, the, the main character, Toby Reed, works in a theatre and he is obsessed with becoming an actor. But faced with his incapacity for acting, his madness keep growing, making him desire one of the main roles in Hamlet, the school of the monologue to be or not to be. So he wants to be the, uh, <laughs> the head. His obsession, Idea Fista, makes him believe that any time the actors rehearse this scene, they are saying Toby or not Toby. His name is Toby, so he thinks that they are, he, they are talking about him, questioning the possibility of him taking part in the play. He accidentally dies in the theatre, and here starts the second part of the story. His wife, who believes in the ghost of Toby, plans to accomplish the uh, last will that they hid in the dead body. So you can see that. <laughs> Unfortunately, before she can accomplish her plan, she gets involved in another crime. Actually, the description of the first uh, of the example uh, is connected to this other crime, and I quote in uh, English, The flesh of the dead woman, which was always hermetically sealed, had not decomposed, but it was softened, and the effort that the thieves had made to separate their hands, the thumb, the, the thumb of the left hand had torn and was closed between the thumb and the palm of the other right. This grotesque and ironic approach reminds to the to other racconto scapigliato, La lettera U, by Tarchetti, in which the main character, like Toby Reed, uh, uh, is obsessed with, in the case of Tarchetti, with the letter U. So he's obsessed with the letter U and he ends, he ends up marrying a woman named Ursula. So he drives, obviously, he is crazy. So again, the topic of insanity also in the Marchesa Colombi and in the Scapilla de Short Stories, as you can see, insanity, unpleasant, and in this case, dead body. On the other hand, with the Squalide, uh, it is a portrait of two women lives, a sad story about lives doomed by disease and ugliness. One of them, beautiful and engaged to her lover in her early days, loses everything, her lover dies, and her beauty is defeated by the smallpox. In this case, the description is in the passage of the novella when they find the body of the lover, uh, when uh, all the misfortunes of this girl began. And I quote in English, sorry, the young man lay with his head upside down on his pillows, the purplish face, his eyes injected and big as if they were about to get out of the sockets, and his twisted mouth, from which his tongue hung between his teeth and horribly swollen. He had died of apoplexy. The ugliness description of the body, the unpleasant description of the body, 
Uh, a recurrent topic in this capilla to that where the dead body assumes importance, not as an object of melancholy, like in Romanticism, but as a topic itself where unpleasant descriptions, descriptions are common. Uh, so, uh, interstellate is the dualism between uh, beauty, ugliness, and health, illness, establishing the scheme of the plot. Close to Tarkhetti's famous novel Fosca, love, disease, and madness set up a love triangle personified by two sisters uh, and a young man who falls in love with both in different moments of his life. The first sister dies as a consequence of his betrayal, which uh, she cannot stand due to her physical and mental weakness. The sister, an actress dispossessed by her family and only loved by the sister who died, will punish the, the man after finding out the truth and therefore he goes crazy. In the story, there is also an element, a picture with two heads with wings, testalate. The two heads are the two sisters' faces, an object which will become the idea fixa for the main character causing him his insanity. And I'm going to quote the second example. In a month, he became thin as a shadow. Before he spoke very little, then he ended up not talking at all anymore. The solitude and recollection that was procured with the persistent silence concentrated him more and more in that idea fixa and that obsession. And conclusion. <laughs> we should come back to the main question. Were they La Chiesa Colombi and Cordelia Scapigliate? As mentioned before, the aim of this reflection is not actually labeling the writers themselves as Scapigliate, because this would be a very restrictive perspective, uh, and also it would not be consistent with the reinforcement of the idea of La Scapigliatura as a rebellion against the tradition. So we are, only, we are also uh, be, um, continue this rebellion against the tradition, so I'm not going to label them as scapigliate. Due to this, we can use the label scapigliata, but not for the writer herself, but for the piece of work itself. La Marchesa Colombia and Cordelia were part of a society, uh, were regular in the same intellectual elites, sorry, um, read the stories written by the writers who define the scapigliatura, and consequently some of the characteristics can be found in their short stories. Probably, as mentioned before, they were influenced also by uh, Victor Hugo, Dragon Paul, etc. Cordelia and Marquesa Colombi shared some spaces, ideas, topics, and because of that we could say they were scapigliate, but maybe the actual link between all the main writers scapigliati under this label, and these two female writers that now I dare to include somehow uh, in this movement of the 19th century was the rebellion against the society, against the tradition. Uh, the first group, the Scapigliati uh, male, group, male group, willing to break the artistic tradition with a new concept of art and the women uh, to change the role of women in society. Uh, also, even uh, both shared the same fate. Both were rejected and then forgotten by the history of literature. The Scapigliati were rejected by the criticism for different reasons, but they, they were pariahs of the contemporary critic and after. The new ideas were seen as a danger because, and here I dare to use, I'm daring a lot, to use the <laughs> words of another famous Scapigliata, uh, from the 19th century, who explained the fate of the Scapigliati Scapigliate in a sentence for, for, from her famous novel Frankenstein, nothing is so painful to the human mind as a great and sudden change, Mary Shelley. Thank you. Valeria Necronis, she will speak on uh, genealogy on paper, the Italian journal La Chiusa and its, its transnational panel reception. Valeria Necronis is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Zurich. Recently, she has been granted a mobility fellowship by the Swiss National Science Foundation for the project Il Perché della Chiusa Transculturality and Identity model, Models in a Women's Magazine during the Fascist Era, carried out with the, with the incorporation with the University of La Sapienza, Italy, and the Volga University, Norway. She received her PhD in Italian literature at the University of Zurich in 2018. Her research focuses on Italian women, Italian women's writing, writing in the 19th and 20th century. Thank you. Thank you. So I would like to start with an apology, because, because all the quotations in my, my presentation are going to be in Italian but you can find uh, um, always a translation and self-made translation just uh, in the slide. So, in 1922, after reporting the news of the uh, educational achievements of La Roche-Foucault's and Liebersack's daughters, 
an anonymous journalist wrote on the weekly journal La Chiosa. Ah. <ride> la signorina del XX secolo sarà in vita. In fondo farà bene. Del resto cosa fa ella, almeno in Francia, se non ristabilire una tradizione? This observation leads to the recollection of some of the fonds savants of the history, thus confirming the link between women's achievements in the 20s, so in the contemporaneity of the right, and the tradition of women's intellectual authority, which is both recalled and legitimized. I will introduce you to the journal La Chiosa as a relevant example of Italian women's press in the 20s, and I will follow a twofold perspective. On the one hand, I will consider women's magazines in their documentary value. Because of their strong link to coeval events and personalities, they are now a precious source of information about forgotten women's identities. On the other hand, I will underline how female journalists proactively challenged coeval stereotype notions of femininity by means of a recovery of the women's intellectual history. La Chiosa is a weekly review founded in 1919 by the journalist Flavia Steno in the framework of an increased female emancipation after the Great War. Specifically, the journal was founded against the backdrop of two pivotal events in the legal definition of Italian women. The first one is the approval of the Sacchi Law that abolished the Italian coverture and decreed the legal equality of the sexes for professional and public employment. And the second one is the discussion of Nitti Project's law uh, on women's suffrage. Both measures aim to a redefinition of women's access to the public sphere. Instead, instead imagine La Chiosa as a tool of information and a cultural and political education for its female public. The activity of the journal was carried on from a peripheral location, namely the city of Genoa. At the beginning of the 20th century, Genoa was an important economic and industrial center. Still, it was culturally and politically marginal compared to the traditional Italian headquarters, Rome and Milan. Therefore, we can consider La Chiosa as the expression of a double minoritarian point of view, in both in terms of geographical location and gender, since the editorial board of the journal consisted mainly of female journalists, Esther herself, Willie Diaz, Donna Paola, and Matilde Serrano, for instance. The review was active from November 1919 until December 1927, and its editorial history is strictly linked to the rise and establishment of fascism. Indeed, the founder and first director, Claudia Steno, was a declared anti-fascist who openly criticized Mussolini's movement on her journal. For this reason, she was removed from the editorial board at the end of uh, uh, 1925, and substituted at first by the poet Adriano Grande, and then by the journalist Elsa Goss, whose loyalty toward fascism was not uh, Due to this historical overlapping, La Chiosa is a precious source of information about women's reactions to a fascist understanding of gender identities and to Mussolini's regulation of womanhood. Indeed, the journal reacted to the rising anti-feminism of post-war and fascist society both by reporting examples of coeval um, women's cultural and political achievements and by providing proofs of female intellectual authority in the past. As we shall see, these operations hold a chronological and transnational perspective. The full scrutiny of more of 100 issues of La Chiosa aim to identify the extension of the cultural reception performed by the journal. I collected more than 4,400 entries of what I would call cultural objects. By this label, I mean every reference to people, both male and female, to literary and periodical publications, events, and associations, both Italian and international. All the data will be entered in an online database, which is now under construction. I organized the entries according to um, the article bibliographical references, namely the author, the title, the issue, and the year of publication. And I also tried to determine the reception type. This is a relevant criterion in order to understand the importance given to each datum. As you can imagine, there is a great difference if a datum is uh, uh, the subject of an article, or if it is just mentioned or uh, um, enumerated as a part of a list. Thanks to this organizational criteria, I'm now able not only to see how many times a cultural object was thematized, but also by whom, in which ways, and uh, 
uh, let's say, uh, its relationship with other cultural objects uh, uh, that are referred to in the same articles or by the same author, for instance. What I'm going to show you now are the first results of the scrutiny. They correspond to a relatively small part of the internet data since they pertain only to the women that for different reasons were recalled in La Chiosa. I also have to admit that I wasn't able to recognize all the mentioned women because sometimes the articles refer to personalities, so both to men and women, only by their surname or not the title. And you can imagine that nowadays it's quite impossible to identify a, a Countess Rossi or a, a Miss Bianchi. So anyway, also under these conditions, I could observe that during its eight year of activity, La Chiosa gave visibility to about 1,200 women. For each item, I integrated the information given by La Chiosa with biographical data from online and offline repertoires. Finally, I grouped their identities according to the period in which they lived, their nationality and their main activities. Relevant information are also going to be provided by the database as additional data. So the criteria of the uh, periodization uh, allows us to see the chronological extent of uh, the reception activity of La Chiosa, which is displayed by the graph where each column represents a chronological phase. We have women from the Middle Age, from the early modern period, from the long 19th century, and finally from the contemporary period. It's not surprising that the large majority of uh, mentioned women are coeval with La Chiosa since one of the aims of the journal was to inform the female audience about the current personalities, events, activities, and movements. Besides that, we, could also, we can also observe that uh, references are made mostly to women of the recent past. One of the reasons could be the fact that the journalists could access to much more detailed documentation about the long 19th century, and, it, and in many case, uh, cases, it's also proven that the, the author of the articles had a personal connection with the mentioned women. Finally, as we can see from the graph, uh, there is a decrease of interest in the most remote ages uh, of the early modern period and middle age. In these cases, what is worth considering is, of course, which women were received and why. As for the middle age, we have 17 women. You can see their names and data on the slide that shows you also how the infrastructure of the database is conceived. If we contextualize each woman within the article where she is mentioned, we can see that women from the remote past are recalled yeah. as sorry? Something else. Ah, <laughs> from the remote past are recalled especially when the topic involves the construction of a women's intellectual tradition. For instance, all the women in the red boxes are mentioned in the article Cultura Feminile that explicitly thematizes the lack of knowledge about the history of women intellectuals and the need for the recovery of their identities. As the author states, nessuno ha mai scritto una storia della cultura femminile. Abbiamo, sì, accanto alla narrazione storica o estetica, critica o biografica dei grandi uomini, quella delle più celebri donne. Incontriamo, sì, quella, il ricordo di quante segnalano un'orma del tempo, nel loro tempo, e di poche altre che fecero corona alle più luminose e che della loro luce ebbero un riverbero calore. Ma di tutte quelle che furono e sono note, o lo potrebbero, per una qualsiasi loro elevazione dalla mediocrità, no, non sappiamo per poco o nulla il loro nome o neanche quelli. In order to contribute to the reconstruction of a female cultural history, the same article recollects the identities of 22 women intellectuals and distinguishes between few already well-known women, as Victoria Colonna and Gaspara Stanco, for instance, and the many forgotten ones. You can see all the uh, mentioned women on the slide. This shows you also how the uh, organizational criteria of the database uh, work. Lo studioso concludes the, uh, the author of the article avrebbe molto a mietere in un campo in cui pochi sono venuti a spigolare, which basically means there is still a lot of work to do. So going back to the Middle Age period, you can see that the list includes not only Italian women, but also traces of Japanese, French, and Serbian women. This proves the nationality to be a relevant grouping criteria. After the old scrutiny, I believe that it's quite impressive how transnational the cultural reception of La Chiosa is. 
The map shows the reception of women according to their nationality. The intensity of the color in the map increases according to the number of women coming from that area. However, the graph does not show those cases, and there are many, in which one of these women left her home country and moved to a new one, sometimes even by changing her nationality. Since the information can be extremely relevant, it is however recorded in the database, but uh, as I said, not shown here. What we can draw from the map is an immediate idea of the transnational reception of La Chiosa. As you can see, the most represented nation is still Italy, and that's again not a surprise given the already mentioned aims of the journal. Still, together with some predictable occurrences of French, English, and uh, American women, we can see that most of the West is represented, and that there is at least a partial interest in the Eastern women. The transnationality of La Chiosa's reception is partially linked to the structure of the journal and to the introduction of some foreign correspondence columns, uh, such as letters from uh, Paris, New York, London, Switzerland, and Scandinavia, just to name a few. But this transnationality is also related to the topic of feminism, and in particular to the detailed account of the international expression of women's movements and to the careful description of, of women's condition in different countries. I collected here some uh, relevant examples that shows you also how sometimes the link between uh, feminist contents and the transnational point of view is clarified already by the title itself of the articles. Moreover, beside the reports on, on, on current expressions of feminism, the editorial board of La Chiosa showed a vivid interest in recalling the origins of feminism and dedicated to this topic numerous articles. The recovery of the first feminist identities has two main meanings. On the one hand, it contextualizes the current women's instances, and on the other, it is functional to the legitimization of a women's genealogy that involves La Chiosa itself as an heir of the previous files. It's not a coincidence that the direct model of Steno's journal is Marguerite Durand's one, uh, one, namely the Parisienne Lacan, and that the trends are repeatedly mentioned in La Chiosa. You can see here a small occurrences table uh, with a list of uh, the, the different dos uh, that are um, quoted. So my third and last grouping criterion was uh, uh, according to the main activities of the mentioned women. My, my aim in this was to at least try to identify which role they were represented in La Chiosa's columns. To this end, I defined 10 categories. The literacy and culture uh, label includes not only writers and translators, but also cultural promoters and organizers of activities, both at specific cultural centers, as the Lice Feminili, or in private circles, the Salotti or the uh, Salotti. <laughs> Uh, while the politic and feminism uh, category pertains both to militants in the feminist movements and to women involved in the, institutional, uh, in the institutional and political life of specific countries, the work and profession one includes all professional activities, regardless if they are typically feminine, as the nursing or the teaching, for example, or not, as in the case of the engineering. As you can imagine, the need to organize a complex and rich range of data led me to make some difficult choices. I decided to tag each entry according to the specific facet of the cultural and or working activities that La Chiosa wanted to emphasize. In some cases, that was complicated since uh, some personalities uh, fit in more than one, uh, than one category. The, I mean, I already mentioned Marguerite Duran, who is an actress, a journalist, and a feminist. Therefore, additional biographical information are still recorded in the database as uh, additional information, but not considered in the following graph. What you can see is a quantitative report of the main spheres of action of the mentioned women. This activities criterion was useful to have a first insight into the range of women's activities that the editorial board of La Chiosa was interested in. As you can see, the most considered sets of activities are um, regard 
the cultural and political engagements of women. On the contrary, Scott's consideration is given to traditional sets of role models here collected under the label uh, family and domesticity. Nevertheless, the reception still includes, among the others, also examples of maternal heroism, as Josephine Alberta, and of pride and love, as Ernesta Battisti or Enrichetta Blondel, for instance. Finally, uh, we can see that quite the same importance is given to the artists and to stage women. However, during the scrutiny of the corpus, I noticed that uh, the reception of the two categories changes according to La Chiosa's publication period. In fact, under Flavia Stem's directorship, a great visibility is given to women painters, sculptors, and musicians by means both of monographic articles and of reviews of uh, exhibitions and concerts. The situation changes uh, after Steno's removal uh, from the editorial board in uh, 1925 and the consequent fascistization of the journal. From this moment on, La Chiosa's reception activity suddenly decreased and was mostly limited to American cinematographic pillars. This is a confirmation of the impact of the dictatorship also in women's magazines which were nevertheless not so affected by the censorship as, let's say, uh, national newspapers. In order to get a much more detailed uh, picture also about this matter, my next step will be to examine in detail the timeline of the reception activity of La Chiosa and to develop also the entries regarding mails and publications. Still, I believe that this preliminary research already shows the richness of the cultural reception of La Chiosa that, despite its geographical marginality, could display a complex set of, uh, a complex set of role models. Moreover, its reshaping of femininity, even if focused on Italian women, is obtained both by a clear openness to international experiences and by an intense recovery of a women's tradition. In this respect, the best definition of La Chiosa's attitude is given by the article Girazza Guardare by Antonietta Parolto Fontana that will conclude with a quotation from it. Il cammino della vita corrisponde ad una lunga scala. Sarebbe bene munirsi di uno sgabello e sedersi ad ogni pianerottolo, guardare in basso le scale superate, riprendere l'era per quelle che rimangono. Io, donna, mi siedo oggi sul proprio sgabello. Senza timore di vertigine, guardo in giù la faticosa ascesa che altre donne hanno compiuto da secoli per portarmi dove sono. Thank you. Anna Ferranda has a PhD in contemporary history. She is a cultura della materia, that is a professor in contemporary history at the University of Pavia. She has published in various articles concerning uh, in various journals, sorry, articles concerning the relationship between publishing and politics in the transnational perspective, in particular investigating the, figu the figures of mediator and cultural meditation, mediation in the first half of the 20th century. Her monograph, Cacciatore di Libri, Gli agenti letterari durante il fascismo, and her curatorship, Stranieri all'ombra del Duce, Le traduzioni durante il fascismo, focus on these themes. Today she will speak about women beyond borders, emancipation through translation under fascism. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. And I'm very sorry not to be there with you and to meet you in person. So in more so, I, I'd like to, to thank the organizer of the conference, in particular Sada Medico, for giving me the, me the opportunity to to participate uh, at this um, Thank you. So I am sharing you with my screen uh, on my computer, so I, uh, you can better follow my speech, I think. Okay, I try. <laughs> One. Okay. Can you see my yes. power? I, okay, perfect. So I... I start. Um, I'm really happy to, uh, to have the opportunity to share with you the first text uh, of what should be a long-term research on women, translation, and the perspective of emancipation through the editorial work between uh, uh, the 19th and 20th centuries in Italy. Um, in this speech, 
I will focus on the 20 years between the two world wars. This time frame is interesting because, as Christopher Randall has already pointed out, fascist Italy became the most important consumer of translation in the world, while nationalism, dictatorship, and protectionism were spread through Europe. So, foreign authors invented peninsula embarrassing the regime and its aspiration of oligarchy, hegemony, and cultural imperialism. So, following the idea raised in translation studies and with the emergence of the interpretative category of cultural transfer, uh, translation has become a subject of study also for the historian. Andre Lefebvre has explained that our translation could be a potential threat to political, cultural, and social institutions. So, however, there is still a considerable work to be done in order to illuminate biographical and intellectual profiles of translators at the turn of the century. Um, even if there are isolated portraits, in fact, the one can observe from its collective Pascal's practice the choice of translators' profile who are started. In fact, the principal known how Cesare Pavese defined the third is in Italy like the uh, aid of translations. Less known are the protagonists of the massive cultural migration that women most think. Available sources, in fact, clearly show how women progressively became the ones dominating the translation business. It entailed a flexible task, easily done in the privacy of the house and mostly ancillary to the author's work. That's why it was a job accepted by a society for finding women to the private sphere. And yet, this is what I argue. For a great number of women, this appropriated job Men getting involved in the public sphere and acquiring a sense and act of emancipation and freedom. So, that is the, what happened, for example, as they were selecting books to translate and proposing them to the publishers. Um, when in 1938, the year of Nath or Cholos in Italy, Ada Gubetti translated one of the benchmarks of American black feminism, Zora Neale Huston thereafter watching. It was certainly not just a literary project. Among these intellectual women, the most known and studied by Italian scholar is the journalist Lavinia Zucchetti. Publishing and translation became for her the only work of a In 1929, she was prevented from collaborating with newspapers, and the following year, she was excluded from university because she was not a member of the National Fascist Party. So, in order to explore this uh, subject a little further, I like uh, to highlight an important question. So, first of all, who are the women who break to engage in the challenge of pre Italian culture from uh, in the strain of oligarchy? Um, as far as I'm concerned, it is possible to give an idea of the female present by standing in the translator. Some of the many important publishing houses uh, of international literature between the two worlds. The qualitative data concerned an evaluation of the cultural mitigation carried out in the choices made. So, the second question is uh, which text did these translators choose? And then the major issue is that did this process of cultural exchange mediation? affect the practices, lifestyles, and mentalities of the, these women. Um, I try to answer this question uh, through the perspective provided by the private archive of Alessandra Scalema and her chief sister, Liliana Maria Teresa. Uh, mostly unknown, Scalema had learned the profession on her own during many travels to Vienna, Berlin, Paris, London, and New York. Um, and even if nobody remembers it, she was the, the one bringing to Italy uh, authors such as Virginia Woolf, Richard Alvington, and as there is not uh, Alfred Dublin, and others. So, first of all, I'd like to focus on a called gender quotation, quantitative and qualitative. 
I will make the only few examples because we don't have enough time, so let's start uh, with 19 In 1919, the most prolific translators were all men. You can see the name of uh, uh, this time. But in the following decade, the number of women as translators within the editorial offices of magazine and publisher gradually increased until they represent almost all the external collaborators who were expert in foreign literature. As can be clearly seen, the Talani case between 1922 and 1945, uh, when almost all of the Talani's collaborators were women. Out of 77, uh, 77 books translated into Italian, 54 were signed by women. And this is also interesting. In that case, they translated books for um, female audience. These were often intellectuals, totally unknown today, revealing large female presence in this industry. The third case that is that of Mondadori. Mondadori was the most famous for such as that period, not only in that period. And in Mondadori, out of 29 books reviewers, 20 or were men and only five women. But the most product productive ones in that group were three women, Lavinia Mazzucchetti, Diana Tozzo, and Alessandra Scalero herself. The contest. Well, since in 1934, the fascist regime in public employment and masculine prerogative, and thereby limiting the access to women in the private sector, the challenge of bourgeois women concentrated on the little field of publishing sector. Nevertheless, the emergence of this translation industry aroused many hostile reactions, but it took until 1937 to see the first deep measure affecting the translation words, while the chances on translators was imposed in 1956. If we are there to this, the provision of the law decree of September 1938, which obliged public and private offices to reduce real staff, it is even more surprising to note that in 1914, out of 30 book, foreign book reviewers hired regularly by the Minkul Pop Books Division in Rome, as many as 60 were women. So it's interesting because why trying to limit the, to flow, the flow of foreign work, the regime was obliged to rely on that female staff to be trying to reduce and marginalize. I pass over some slides and let's see another paradigmatic example. Um, I refer to the most prestigious and of the very serious for Reduzza. The collection that mostly contributed the, the spreading of contemporary English novels. Considering only the Italian version of 20, uh, 33 books in English, 12 were signed by you know, Doletta Caprin, Barbara Posati, Gilma Vittoria Tonsky, and Alessandro Scalero herself, who translated eight of, of these books. Uh, for example, Eugenia Woods or Andrew Flash, Mary's Backwood West, Old Fashioned Span, or Richard Alvington's Human Mass Work. These books were significant precursors of modernist literature, which Italy could have been fully recognized only after yet the Second World War. Um, so, if from the samples that I mentioned before, we, we have seen that a lot of translates. Translators in publishing houses under fascism were women. So the next question is how did women learn foreign languages during fascism? Um, we, we know that in the 19th century, young women of the elite privately learned foreign languages, and also the first half of uh, the 20th century, the way of learning foreign languages remained informal. But during fascism, there is a year that's a, that it's a turning point in the history of the education system. It is the 1923, and it is the Gentile Report that reformulated education on the basis of rigid gender differences. On one hand, the traditional classical high school regained a prominent position, welcoming mainly male students. 
And on the other hand, the female high school in a natural secondary position that offer young women who wish to cope with higher education the opportunity to learn how to read foreign languages. Almost as, as if for the fascism, foreign languages were not so important. So let's try to see, um, in order to better understand that the connection between translation work and emancipation, I now propose the case study of Alessandra Scalero. Alessandra Scalero has been described by her sister, a faithful translator of restless spirits, the wuthering spirit. Um, from this first time I mentioned before, the name of Alessandra Scalero emerges repeatedly. She's an emblematic figure of the legend or not today of the gender transformations for which that universe was cause and consequence. In this photo, you can see Alessandra Scalero on the left with the Francesca Scalero, Jan Scalero, the right. Diana was also a journalist, a translator, and a writer. And in the middle, Maria Teresa, the youngest. And the other photo represents uh, Rosario Scalero, uh, the father of the, of the three sisters. Uh, Rosario Scalero was uh, a violinist and composer, found his consecration in the United States during her. Alessandra Scalero translated almost 50 books from German, English, and American languages. The foreign spirits Alessandra wanted to bring to Italy were set restless spirits. The author she translated the complicated years of the fascist machismo were, for example, the inner and rebellious romance of Mrs. Dalloway, or the pages by Ricarda Hack with twice divorce and very creeped up a new Nazi regime. Not only the authors, but also the protagonists of the literary fictions were examples of, made, of a female model very far from the, the ideas of women propagandized by fascism. This is the case, for example, of Katrina in the homonymous novel by Sally Sarminen, translated by uh, for Montadori. Katrina was a woman tenacious and strong, capable of fighting and without waiting for herself. So Alessandra Scalera was a woman, a woman who selected, translated out of place female authors who wrote about out of place women. Out of place because they bypassed the gender parameters in which they were expected to find not only the fiction of the page but a bubble in reality. Another paradigmatic example was of Scalaire quality in the communication is the project to import into Italy the German speaking authors' thoughts to come elsewhere. Uh, in a story, a small free port overlooking the Ticino side of Lake Giovanni, Scalero met many writers exiled from Hitler's Germany. It was priceful in the thought that one of these writers has a thought to meet with his potential translators. And Eric Knott wrote to Alexander Scalero in 1935. The Italian writer met Casetme at three once again. Would you like to introduce it to another publisher you can trust? However, as can be mentioned, not become a publisher to risk publishing such a novel, which was immediately burned in Hitler's bonfire in May 1933. The Amit Caserma had not played the computer level, but it wanted to be a testament of the complicated years immediately preceding Hitler's time. Power. Answering not for the stubborn fascism was opposed to force the run. And with time, as there is not forgotten, that it is only recent that German publishing houses have rediscovered this work and have started reprinting it. Now is another example of Alessandro Scalero inside. And also in the 20s, during the 20s, when she was uh, in the United States, that she tried to launch John Dos Passos' transfer 
for uh, the, uh, the words of Eugene O'Neill. Alessandra met the young playwright O'Neill in New York in a family's second with village. She recognized this value well before the Nobel Prize in 1936. This is also because when she followed her father in New York, she was not unaccustomed to theater. For some years, she was a costume designer with her sister, Maria Teresa. They had collaborated for the famous Greek theater of Sipacus and then for the experimental theater of development. A fundamental experience that offered Alessandra a network of contacts that helped her enter the publishing world. I did call Alessandra Scalero a pioneer single woman. Let's see why. When in the 30s, Scalero returned from the United States, she decided to invest all her energy in the publishing world. She immediately tried to diversify the source of income, knowing that the publisher were on the hunt for good translators. She wrote to her sister Liliana in March 1931, I am struggling with various publishers. They are, they are uncertain, and this takes a century, kilometers of energy before they have done anything. So from these words, emerges, emerges the effort, legal and physical, of the mediation method. The main project conceived, proposed, the projects started, but never completed due to the indolence of the publishing axis. A lot of time wasted, letters trying to get the money of it. Even with important publishers like Carapa, she found herself forced to clarify her position. I just want to point out that those who work for a living and not a sport need to somehow make the living from their work. She wrote to Carapa in 1934. So Alessandra did not hesitate to call herself a professional translator. Underlined with this word, an awareness to have become the protagonist of the public sphere, defined it on the basis of specific linguistic pattern and editorial skills. Alessandra Scalero was also a pioneer of trade, so much so that at the end of 1933, the Dopey Act of the work consisted in an exclusive service as a translator, a fixed and very valuable monthly salary. Alessandra not only managed to be appreciated and paid as a translator, but with the mafia, she both took the kitchen in Milan. Even as a young woman, both during the Great War and the 20s, Alessandra always managed to support herself without the help of the family. First as a nurse, and then as a costume designer. If her mother, Clementina del Grosso, came from an upper middle class family from Turin, her father was of the contrary of modest origins. And at least until the beginning of their days, he was often short of money. This is an important when, the, when the, sorry, when the earth is started. To, to, to go well, Alessandra was a bit older than 40 years old. Uh, she was a maiden and childless. This is an important uh, ish aspect I'd like to stress because it represents a total counter trend in relation to the new ideology of fascism where family life and maternal figure were central. As pointed out uh, by Angela Brotti, for many pioneers from new professions, not getting married and not having children was an imposed condition. The unmarried staff and the assets of maternity were the price to pay for all those women who wished to try those professions that were not fully formalized yet and considered typically male. Furthermore, it was difficult in intellectual activities. Uh, because men were defining their mono monopoly with greater determination. At the beginning of the 30s, Alessandra Scalero and her sister thought of launching their own magazine 
together with the painter Alessandro uh, Roberto Lenni. Um, I read only the two sentences of the letter uh, Liliana wrote to Alessandro in 1931. Of that people like Emanuele, Emanuele is the man in the photo, was a journalist and the translator. Of that people like Emanuele would leave me some place and will not oppress me with the masculine authority. You know that I have too much talent and culture to consider a woman, which on the contrary is so convenient excuse for men to throw you into the background. From the words of the young Alexander, mercy the effort for the young women to make their way in a literary and material world that crowded by men. Even Liliana, while disregarding male authority, could not define female models. So, so, so much so that she claimed to have too much talent and culture to be considered a In the Unpublic Feminine Memoirs, Liliana Scalero described Alessandra as an independent woman who played tennis, kids, and loved social life. If Okay, um, I propose that we start with um, the substitute of Inga Nucci. Uh, because she's going to be here, she's from Milan, and we all know that the union in right now is not the best thing ever. Uh, so she sent someone for reading her paper, and it's really cool. Um, so, Inga Nucci, she's professor of early modern history, and she teaches at the University of Milan. Uh, her field of research is European intellectual and cultural history, and she specializes specialized in French revolutionary period. Um, her, her substitute, she's really cool to find, uh, her name is uh, Sonia Perovic. So she will read the paper, um, and we will not have any questions on this paper as the speaker is not like here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> we, sorry, but we never know. Um, the title of the Paper is, is, is a strong identity in context. Marie Armande d'Acondufo from, from the French Revolution to the Empire. Have fun. Yes. Uh, I will try to keep it to the point, but it's not my paper, so I feel like I need to read it all. So I speak quite quickly. Okay. What kind of evidence can show that a pre modern bourgeois woman? was ready to challenge the constraints imposed upon her. For example, divorce, an act in itself which challenges the separation of private and public. In a Catholic country, it also meant refusing the ingrained sacramental value of marriage and showing a personal secular attitude. In Paris, at the age of 40, Marie Armand Gacon took advantage of the new revolutionary law, secularizing marriage and legalizing divorce, voted in September 1792. This law was deeply political. Its more general framework was a great movement of opinion, or public opinion, and political effort to transform and secularize the traditional patriarchal family as a basic social institution. This meant challenging old regime practices and ideo ideologies, for example, the stigma on illegitimate offspring, to forge the basis of the new state. Revolutionary legislators and opinion makers consider the law on divorce a breakthrough for women. It challenged absolute male dominance in the family, 
and allow both genders to expect companionship and reciprocity in marriage. I should just say, because it allowed you to divorce um, on the basis of personal incompatibility. So it had, this was finally allowed. A Republican marriage based on an emotional bond was essential to the new nation. The revolutionaries, as historian Suzanne Desson has summarized, saw how profoundly politics and the gendered matters of daily life were intertwined. Private matters during the revolution were deliberately politicized, especially between 1792 and 1794. We find cultural evidence of this in the theatrical repertory of the time. Republican comedy shows very well how a new patriotic vision of love and marriage might function as a way of involving women in the revolution, framing and, of course, confining their participation inside a newly defined gender role. In Le Pitre's Arlequin Imprimeur, a play which debuted, debu which started with, debuted in Paris in June 1794 at the climax of the terror, Columbine talks with a friend who misses women's political clubs, now abolished by law. Columbine replies with an equally political notion, saying that her own club will be her family when she marries. When her father wants her to marry a young man she does not love, though she learns from the other woman to object using the Declaration of Rights and the notion of resistance to oppression. In Republican theater, conflictual couples are reconciled, primarily because divorce is not a gratifying conclusion in a comedy. But this also tells us something about the emotional difference between collective ideas and individual initiative. Divorce for a woman was a public act, an act of both private and public self-assertion, and it meant being talked about. Traditionally, this was something a virtuous woman should avoid if she wanted to keep her reputation intact. Not accidentally, in a review attacking Marie Armand much later under the empire, a journalist wrote that a woman author did not deserve the respect due to a woman. This, of course, was because an author went public. Divorce in the 18th century had been a scandal even when it existed in some form, like in England, where it needed to be granted by parliamentary procedure, or in colonial New England and later the US. It was also a very delicate move from a practical and economic point of view. In revolutionary France, it was most likely among couples with artisanal backgrounds. Not that many respectable upper class, upper middle class French women divorced. In Paris, from 1792 to 1803, when Napoleon restricted divorce, there were less than 4,000 applications for divorce by women. More than 1,000 of these were for desertion. Women could not serve as officials, so no woman could be an arbiter on a family tribunal where divorces were decided. Divorces were most numerous between 1793 and 1794, the time of war and terror, but also of the most creative plans and policies for social change. Contestation of both the law and the social practice was renewed after Thermidor, confirming their deep political value. In this context, in February 1793, Marie Armand divorced Jacques-Antoine Philol Dumier. While she came from a family of jurists, her husband was a nobleman, a member of an important family of the Calvados region, where she, had been where she had been educated in a convent, although born in Paris. On her husband's lands, she had been able to experiment for years as a physiocratic reformer, and she wrote about this in a novel in the late 1780s. She was a member of the Paris Société d'Agriculture, where she met cultural and political protagonists of the pre-revolutionary and revolutionary periods. She was also a contributor on farming and housekeeping, and later one of the editors of the Bibliothèque Physio-Economique Instructive et Amusante, a long-lived journal of applied science and economic information, founded by agricultural reformer Parmentier and naturalist Sonini. We do not know much about Marie Armand's first husband, but he not, does not seem to have been an emigre, while it is possible that they had different political visions. The revolution had changed her a lot since the 1780s, when according to some sources, she had been a reader at court for the queen, who did have Gacon's pre-revolution books in her personal library, of which we have an inventory. After the minimum waiting period of one year after divorce, in March 1794, Marie Armand remarried. She was not in hiding in the countryside of saint -Emain, where the groom had lands. She was still in Paris under the terror at the time of the arrest and trial of the Ebertistes, and then just a couple of weeks later of the Dantonists. The groom, Julien Louis Michel Dufour Saint Pathus, a bourgeois jurist, was also marrying for the second time. Speaking about reputation, it must be noted that her divorce is not mentioned either in early 19th century notices nor in later biographical sources on Gacon 
like Proudhon's 1830 Biographie Universelle des Femmes, or the second 1850s edition of the Michaud brothers' Biographie Universelle Ancienne et Moderne. This information remained the great unsaid about Marie Armand, as biographers just mentioned the two husbands without saying if the first had died. Retracing women's lives can be difficult. We often do not know much. We may know a woman from, from just one pamphlet or book she wrote. If we cannot contextualize it, we risk misinterpretation and anachronism. Gacon's case gives us an example of that, as she herself has been treated by gender historians mostly as the author of one, wor one work, her 1801 reply to Sylvan Marshall's provocative fictional proposal of a law forbidding teaching women to read. And uh, Erica will discuss this later in the, in, the, in the paper. This is the Projet de loi pour tomber pompes d'apprendre à lire aux femmes. Consistent omissions or gaps in biographies of both women and men of the past can be illuminating as well. And that is one of the reasons a biographical or a prosopographic approach can help us formulate or reformulate more general questions about political and cultural history. Knowing Marie Amon's novels and writings, I suspected there might be something to unearth, and I was finally able to find the evidence of her divorce in the Font Andre Beau, a recently digitized 19th century genealogical collection containing a reconstruction of marriages in 17th and 18th century Paris. As is well known, Parish Parish and Etat Civil records up to 1859 were destroyed in the May 1871 burning of the Hotel de Ville during the Commune. So all we have are incomplete reconstructions. Is Marie Armand's personal agency challenging traditional social and religious constraints in a revolutionary context enough to show that she was also a political radical? How can we define political and cultural radicalism within, within a gender perspective? This was the time when modern Republican notions of citizenship were forged but also immediately showed their gendered ambivalence, that is, both their inclusionary and exclusionary potentials. The prevailing understanding of those notions produced, particularly for women, both the promise of individual autonomy and recognition and novel forms of restriction. Nevertheless, some women successfully appropriated public spaces of expression. Marie Armand not only divorced, she wrote about divorce as a woman's salvation in her novel, Voyage de plusieurs émigrés de leur, et leur retour en France. Its date of publication was significant, 1802, mere months before the Napoleonic regime launched its gender policy with the new law limiting freedom to divorce. Since Bonaparte's concordat with the Catholic Pope a year before, there had been an ongoing cultural struggle regarding women's condition in France, in which Gacon had been participating in her typical controlled and unemotional style. Her cultural and political struggle was significant in that time of transition and rapid weakening of Republican values and acquisitions. It covered many important topics, religious freedom, freedom of expression, democratic diffusion of scientific information, or the issue of the control on memory of French history. Her perspective was gendered on all subjects, and she made a point of finding female role models, like the late antiquity philosopher Hypatia, uh, butchered by Christians in Alexandria and still remembered in the martyrology of free thinkers in modern times. The title of Marie, uh, Marie Armand's two volume novel, Voyage de plusieurs émigrés et leur retour en France, a book I read as a novel on divorce, played on political ambiguity as Napoleon, having granted a partial amnesty in 1800 to émigrés, mostly nobles and clergy, had just decreed a general amnesty in April 1802. Her choice of title did not imply approval of this decision. Rather, she may have intended to surprise the reader, stimulating reflection. Her heroine flees France before the revolution, going to England, the United States, and Prussia. She is escaping the aggressive power a bad husband exercises over her life. If before the revolution the reason for her exile, self-exile, looks like a strictly private matter, the revolution shows it to be political as well. The heroine comes back when divorce becomes possible, thanks to revolutionary law, and when her rights, including her property, are protected as they were not before. We should not forget that married women in France could not sign contracts before 1793, including contracts with publishers, as historian Carla Hess has stressed. Napoleon's 1804 civil code 
whose articles were being debated since 1801, would cancel the independent legal status married women had obtained under the Republic. In Marie Armand's fiction, admittedly a bit boring and slow for today's readers, it is always possible to detect contemporary political concerns. When Marie Armand wrote about old regime contexts, she did not miss opportunities to describe through her stories the forms of private injustice the Republic had overcome with its political decisions. If we go back to her production in 1798, we find her novel, Georgiana, ou la vertu persécutée triomphante. Here, it does not seem accidental that the heroine was an illegitimate daughter, a member that is of a category the revolutionary legislators, legislators had socially and legally redeemed, responding to a movement of public opinion. Under the consulate, as we saw, Marie Armand was still defending the revolutionary experience, including the opportunities it had offered to women, even if it had refused them full civil rights. Another notable example was her 1801 epistolary novel, La Femme Grenadier, set toward the end of 1793 during the terror. It was the work where she most boldly let her political attitude transpire. Basically, she defended the memory of the period of the Jacobin Convention, espousing what had been the position of the indulgents, like Camille Desmoulins, whom she may have known personally. The novel's heroine, a woman posing as a man to fight with the revolutionary army in Western France against the rebel Chouan, became the representative of a militant but humane republicanism. Thus, she risked imprisonment for insubordination, but was saved by her comrade in arms. Comrades in arms. Under the empire, Gatman dissimulated her, her ideas a little more, but not enough. In early 1807, she's attacked by the authorized press for her writings on powerful women in the history of the French monarchy. Those venomous attacks on an author who dared to publish untimely ideas targeted her as a female writer, as we have seen, insisting on her unseemly, unreligious opinions. Her reviewer in the Mercure de France denounced that her guiding principle is that all religions are all the same, or that religions are all the same. That's a quote. In reality, she, she tended to keep these ideas and her disapproval of Bonaparte's religious policy relatively implicit in her writings of that period. She insisted chiefly on the still recognized principle of freedom of worship and on secular education. However, how could her unreligious ideas not be noticed when Gatmont in 1805 had allowed herself to be included in astronomer Jérôme Lalonde's 1805 supplement to their deceased friend, Sylvain Marshall's Dictionnaire des Athées, a list that many in that time of recantation considered infamous. This made her the only living woman mentioned. This is a huge dictionary, by the way. It goes, it's transhistorical, goes across all the time. Lalonde also announced that Marie Armand was writing Marshall's biography. As punishment, Napoleon ordered Lalonde, a member of the Institut National, to stop publishing altogether. Marie Armand published the biography in 1807 as a preface to Marshall's posthumous De la Vertu. Her name was not printed on the volume, and she posed as a male friend, probably again to protect not only her reputation, but that of Sylvan's wife and her own husband's. Actually, I first became aware of Marie Armand while researching the figure and cultural network of Sylvain Marshall, a Parisian poet known and censored before the revolution for his atheism. He became a revolutionary journalist and then one of the leaders of Gracchus Babeuf's Conspiracy of Equals. Marshall was undoubtedly an anti-feminist, but Marie Armand was part of his inner circle of mostly atheistic and republican friends, and they were intense interlocutors, both privately and in print. As I said, the best known debate between them was the one occasioned by Marshall's 1801 tract proposing, only partly as a joke, a law to forbid teaching women to read and of Marie Armand's fine reply, contre le projet de loi pour ton défense d'apprendre à lire aux femmes. Maréchal, an enemy of Bonapartism, was an almost silenced political loser at the time. We can probably say that his farcical provocation was made mem memorable only by the two replies by women, Gacon's and Albertine Clément Emery's Les femmes bongées de la sottise d'un philosophe du jour. I will present this last illuminating example to conclude my argument about gender and political radicalism. 
In her reply, Marie Armand signed herself ironically, pour une femme qui ne se pique pas d'être femme de lettres, and rightly declined to prove that Maréchal was wrong, stating that this was simply obvious. She thus put herself on equal footing with him, avoiding the typical defensive argument based on a gallery of good women counterbalancing the few bad examples. The main argument in her deliberately unemotional and rational reply was that Marshall's provocation was self-defeating at the dawn of the new century, while Bonaparte was signing the Concordat with the Pope. Women's education was the most important bulwark against the historical defeat of the legacy of the Enlightenment and the revival of clerical superstition. Her position was thus feminist, more in the sense that she managed to express a gendered identity in discussing a general political and cultural issue, then in the more obvious sense of focusing on what concerned women's condition and oppression, an attitude which was more prominent in Clément and Marie's reply. However, Marie Armand also stressed that the law Marshall proposed would be voted by men, condemning their, lives to, their wives to illiteracy without listening to their opinion. In other words, Marie Armand thought that women were not represented by their husbands and would not be represented until they could vote, although she never openly mentioned the right to vote in her tract. This is an example contrary to the familialist thesis of historian Anne Ferjou, who argues that women who did not fight for voting rights during the French Revolution, and this explicit claim was in fact very rare, that they did not do so because they accepted the principle of family versus individual representation. Marie Armand thought that women could at least be represented by women writers, ergo the, the focus on the right to education. She would then argue extensively for this right in her book, De la Nécessité de l'Instruction pour les Femmes, published in 1805. Historian Genevieve Freyse, Freyse, sorry my accent, in her seminal Muse de la Raison, Démocratie et Exclusion des Femmes en France, which was first published in 1989, considers Marie Armand less feminist, less radical than Clément and Henry, the second reply's author, precisely because this second text was entirely focused on the attack on women's dignity. In fact, while Clément and Marie's tone was more antagonistic and harsher than Gacon's, her arguments were mostly not very far from the tradition of the Carrel des Femmes role-playing between misogynists and pro-women authors, and as a result, her tract seemed more detached from the political and cultural struggles of 1801 France than Marie Armand's, despite a few general quotations of contemporary poets or playwrights. Historians are still debating what in women's history is the most significant legacy of the French Revolution as a founding moment of modern European representative democracy. Is it the exclusion from citizenship which can disqualify democracy itself as we know it? Or is, it, or is that legacy, on the contrary, the beginning both of conscious appropriation of private and public spaces and of a long-term human fight for the continuous expansion of rights. If we research persons like Marie Armand, putting them in context, we will tend to incline towards the optimistic answer. We will also see women of the past as full participants in the struggles of their times, whether men recognize their right to their own opinions or not. And even if their presence in places where opinion was forged is less documented than that of men. We will discover and interrogate them as real people of their time, instead of simply figures in a gallery of forerunners, admirable, but almost inevitably judged less advanced than we are. Thank you so much uh, for reading this paper. It was a really, as you can tell her, that it was a really interesting paper, and I'm pretty sure we would have uh, questions. I think we should email her. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm sorry I spoke so fast, but you said time was limited. So. Yeah, yeah um, and you keep your time. Okay. Perfect. Our next speaker is Nan Gerdes. Um, she has a background in comparative literature. Uh, she did her PhD and postdoc at the University of Copenhagen and at Bentley, cool. <laughs> in early modern and pre-modern area. And now she just started uh, as a new researcher, as a researcher in a project named Another Humanism, Gendering Early Modern Liberalism and the Boundaries of Subjectivity at Stockholm University. Her paper today is 
between identity, pseudonymity, anonymity, the resistance of female authorship. Isn't it French? Just how do you pronounce it? Introduction to go back to the question of pseudonymity, which that is also part of, of, uh, of this paper. So, yeah, um, like Elena just mentioned, the project or the paper that I'm presenting now is part of, part of a larger research project titled Another Humanism. Um, and I'd like to just briefly introduce what this project is about because it's probably going to make what I'm going to talk about more sensible. So, the project addresses the history of subjectivity through an explanation of female libertinism and free thinking in French literature in the early modern era. Uh, our purpose is to highlight the diversity of early modern subjectivity and to give new historical insight on present critical discussions concerning the modern subject within post humanitarianism, ecological humanities, and new materialism. So the theoretical renewal that this turn in the humanity implies will be put to critical use in a study of early modern female writers and free thinkers from France. Uh, and among those, the, um, the pseudonymous writer, Elisène de Crème. So overall, the project highlights other forms of subjectivity than those that are usually related to a humanist narrative based on the idea of human sovereignty that was first articulated during the Renaissance and that later only became established as a rational, <coughs> autonomous, modern subject. So the larger aim of the project is to enable a re-evaluation of the humanist tradition and its relevancy today by looking at female authors. Um, this, for me, this research project grew out of the postdoctoral research I had done before then, which was about, which was, where I was trying to trace a literary topos in French literature from the Middle Ages and yeah, and 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 for later on, which is which is the topos of the confined woman, which is prevalent not just in reality but also in French literature. And what's pretty scary is actually that it's quite prevalent today, even if you really start. Um, looking for it. But what's interesting is that while it might seem at first as if this topos is kind of like putting into write, writing the quelling of women's resistance in literature, at closer look, the opposite is, quite, is very often true. Um, and that is, I think, what is the case with uh, Elisa de Quen, um, who I'm going to turn to now. So, I need uh, to multitask here. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah. with the authorship of Elise and Ducren, we are encountering a problem of identification since Elise's name is a nom de plume. It's a cover for an author whose identity researchers are still not 100% sure of. Um, not to bypass important exceptions among male authors, what's at stake here is the practice of female authors hiding their identity between uh, a pseudonym. And one of the reasons for this could of course be the provocative nature of their work that threatened to severely damage the honor or reputation of the real author. Um, when female intervention in male-dominated literary discourse could be considered a moral transgression, it sometimes resulted in fabricated identities, as it did in this case. Um, so while authors are actually still discussing, okay, was she was uh, Elise Dupin, was she actually a man, or does it does the name does does the name actually stand for multiple authors? Um, there is a consensus among scholars that. The author's name is um, the, the author's true name is Marguerite de Pays, 
And Marguerite de Brie is a woman who is remembered today only because the French literary scholar Louvier in 1917 identified her as the real author of uh, a number of works that were signed with the pen name of Elisabeth Dupin. Um, the identity of de Brie as a biographical author rests on circumstantial evidence alone. Documents have yet to reveal if there is direct linkage between author and pen name. And we may, may never recover the real identity of, of the author, um, as little, very little is known about Marguerite de Brie. She was, a, she was a woman of some privilege. Uh, she, belonged to the, she belonged to the lesser French aristocracy and she lived in, the, in, uh, she lived in Abbeville in Picardie, so up in the periphery of France today. Also worth mentioning is that the works uh, reveal an author who, whoever he or she was, uh, was deeply embedded in Renaissance humanistic culture and thus also committed to the recovery to the rediscovery of classical antiquity. Um, documents, the, the historical documents that we do have at hand about uh, Magritte de was that she was in fact wealthier than her husband, uh, whose name was Philippe Fournel, Sieur de Crenne. She was legally separated from him in, 15, in 1552, and she had a son with him, and the son's name was Pierre. Um, it's worth mentioning, of course, that the, that the reason why Magritte de Brie has been found is because of this name, the patronym of her husband, de Crenne. So, um, so we might say that the rediscovery of Magritte de Brie is, I mean, we owe, kind of owe that to the patronym that her, that, that, uh, her husband had. So turning to turning to um, Les Sangues d'Amour, or in English, The Torments of Love, it's a book that has attracted attention for several reasons. Um, it's a book that consists in three parts, and especially the first part uh, has received much attention among critics for its novelty. It's a first-person narrative that's uh, that's written by the by the protagonist, whose name is Evisen Dufan. It's, so it's featured as a autobiography, in fact. Um, and through her testimony, the reader gets insights into the depths and the torments of her haunted heart and psyche. The stated purpose of the novel, which is intended for a female authorship, is to warn against the torments of love. But as we shall see, it's also, in that event, also pioneering a number of, uh, of pretty radical ideas. Um, in its own time, the book was a bestseller. It was published the first time in uh, 1538, but it was reprinted at least eight times by 1560. It was then forgotten, but rediscovered in the, 20s, in the early 20th century. Since then, the book has earned a reputation as the first sentimental novel in France, um, due in great part to the first part of the novel that I'm going to talk to you about today. The book, I mean, for obvious reasons, the book has also earned a prominent place in feminist scholarship and also in the study in the study of subjectivity, um, which is a topic that I'm going to talk about now. Um, trying to explain, okay, why is, this, why is this book important in the study of subjectivity? And I should mention that I'm sort of like, I'm approaching this, this topic from a historical angle rather than from a psych psychoanalytical angle. Um, but what is, I mean, just to begin, so we think of what is subjectivity even? And to offer just one definition here, which is Foucault. Um, subjectivation entails the formation of a definite relationship of, of self to self. And this is a conception of the self that we find burgeoning in Montaigne's essay that simply, simply conveys in writing a relationship of self to self. Um, Montaigne published his essays around 40 years later than than the torments of love. 
Montaigne family famously opened his essays by stating, Here I want to be seen in my simple, natural, everyday fashion, without cunning or artifice, for it is my own self that I am painting. Here, drawn from life, you will read of my defects and my naive form so far, so far as respect for social convention allows. Thus, reader, I myself am the subject of my book. So if one is looking for a precursor to Montaigne, clearly the first psychological novel in French, in French uh, attracts attention. And that is, of course, precisely what has happened in the scholarship. Um, because we hear with Elisabeth Dupin, we find a precursor in some ways to Montaigne. Um, we in the torments of love, we see the making of female self's relation to self evolve partly as resistance toward male oppression, something quite different than Montaigne. I shall return to that. Um, I think the torments of love is interesting for several reasons in the history, very history of subjectivity. And for me, it's very interesting because it, it kind of like, it, it makes manifest a watershed moment in how we historically have thought about okay, so what is a subject. Um, when you work with concepts such as self or selfhood, subjectivity or subject, it really requires historical accuracy given the different senses attributed to the terms over time and in different contexts. Now, as you may know, the term subject comes from the Latin root, root subjectum, um, which pretty much means the one who is being thrown under. That is the one who is being subject to another power. But subject in a modern sense refers to something that's pretty much the opposite. Um, it's a self as consciousness or ego as the ultimate foundation upon which entities are rendered intelligible. It's a reversal of meaning that's attributed to Descartes, at least since Hegel. So yeah, my claim is that so like at the intersection of these two historically different conceptions of, of what a subject is, we find extended men. So turning so now I'd like to turn to how Ilsen is a subject in the first sense of the term, because the whole novel revolves around her subjection to Amorous love. Love in the book is described as an eternal force to which she's, she must surrender by falling in love uh, because she falls in love with another man than her husband. It's a man below her own station whose name is Benedict. The illicit relation between them is never consummated, and that is in great part due to how it is in suspecting husband brutally subjects her in order to stop the affair from developing. He beats her and he ultimately locks her up in a tower um, until her lover liberates her in part three, but only for them to die together um, not long after. So you know, we can say that Elisen is, I mean, she's subjected in a double sense. She's subjected to love and she's also subjected to her quite sadistic uh, patriarch of, of a husband. And yeah, and I have some, I put up some quotes here to where she, in the book, describes this subjection to love. She states, for instance, that love, or this love, she feels that it makes her bereft of myself. It is as if, so like, that love makes her, yeah, the opposite of, of a modern subject. I have become slave and subjected to the passions. I mean, she literally is subject in the, in the old sense of the term. She also describes love, love as nothing but an oblivion of reasons. It weakens all strength. It makes the person sad, angry, prodigal, bold, proud, harmful, forgetful of God, the world, and importantly, one's self. Um, because of love, she has this feeling that her thoughts, her senses of judgment, and her free will is caught unprepared, subjected, and enslaved. So, but the way in which that 
ASN is subjected to outside forces because, because of love, kind of only explains for half of her experience described in the book. She goes, a side effect of this subjection to love and to the dominance of her husband is that she undergoes a radical transformation of character because she becomes a rebel, finding herself, we might say, in that process. Um, at one point she notes that I have become bold and audacious, audacious, and until that time I have been shy. Um, she, in reaction to, I mean, she becomes, she even becomes, she becomes disobedient to her husband. She lies to him time and again. She really becomes an unruly right wife that renders all the accusations against women that came up in like a little film about women being inconstant, deceitful, she really renders them true. Um, and in, the, in important scenes, she does not She does really question this dominant that she is subjected to. She's developing her own ideas in resistance to this subjection. For instance, according to me, my husband did me wrong, or, and, or she inquires, what law in the world is so unjust and just drivel that it commits tor torture before the verdict? So, in this book, because it's kind of like a prototype of an, of an autobiography, writing is of, course, is, is of course a vital element in this becoming a self of resistance. And interestingly, I mean, Elisen's prison, the prison that her husband puts her into, becomes a remarkable writing lab for giving expressions to a new sense of selfhood through the to the protagonist's writing activities in the privacy of her confinement. This is a time in history, of course, when privacy wasn't, I mean, it wasn't, it was only in the making. There wasn't, there wasn't much room for, for privacy in, in the early, early modern world. But actually, um, Edison finds some kind of privacy here. And she really, I mean, she really, she, she redraws in, she redraws into herself, into her confinement, finding some sense of, some sense of, of, um, of, um, of, I wouldn't say agreeable, but it's a tolerable life there. She would rather be alone than be accompanied by someone. Of course, this is, I mean, her, so her tower and her prison, I think is a pretty interesting parallel to Montaigne's library, because when he's also sort of like, um, exploring how to make yourself through writing, this happens very much because he secures himself into his private library. Of course, these are two, <coughs> two very different architectural rooms to compare. One is a prison, the other is a library made by uh, someone who was influential in society, um, like Montaigne. So, in Elisen's work, I mean, her securing herself into her room is not a resistance against the arbitrary violence or the senselessness of the religious wars and the increasing, increasing centralization of power that Montaigne was clearly writing up against. Um, her withdrawal is more a resistance against male supremacy of her husband. So for the literary scholar Timothy Rice in his Mirages of the Self, he has noted that Elie saint Dufresne and similar-minded female writers of the time, and I'm quoting here, glimpsed for the moment a new articulation of experience that men were unable or felt no pressing need to affirm, precisely because they were subjects of oppression in a very different way than Montaigne were, was, or, other, or even or other male uh, writers. So, in other words, the women were in fact pioneering a new sense of selfhood. Um, Rice also notes that Edison was fighting for a recognized place in what would be a new authorizing system understanding that to do so meant fighting for new sorts of community and identity to accompany it." End quote. In his analysis, writes jumps from an analysis of the torments of love and then over to some of the letters that were here on the slide before. 
Meaning that he... That's nice. That he... <laughs> yeah, <everyone. laughs> Meaning that he jumps from he jumps from the genre of of, uh, of a novel to letters, and in, it's in the letters that he finds a more articulated sense of anger, an anger that we don't find as uh, as uh, yeah as stressed in the torments of love. And while I I mean while I really agree with Bryce, I think it's important to return to the to topic of fiction in this discussion, the importance of, of, uh, of fiction in this making of self. Um, and we can note this on different levels. We can discuss it over the topic of pseudonymity, um, the name that I started, that I, that I, that I started, that I introduced to begin with, um, the patronym that came from, from Marguerite de Brie's husband. But another scholar, uh, Christine de Busson, she has actually suggested that the name of Elie saint Dufin is actually taken by putting together uh, the names of women who are forever famous for their passions of love. Uh, we should read the name Elie saint Dufin as referring to names such as Elin, Isolde, Medea, Lucretia, and Genevieve. So rather than seeing the passion, I mean that is that is that would be what she thinks the author's intention was. That is her way of inscribing herself into eternity. That is by referring to these female authors rather than referring it to a name to a man that she later divorced. Um, I think for me and in relation to the research I did before this project, it's it's. Uh, it's interesting to note how Elisa Dufan is really remaking the tokus of the confined woman, how she's really taking ownership of this tokus of, of confinement um, to find in seclusion a sense of liberation through writing, perhaps even a sense of, a sense of happiness or a principle to find a happy life. That's what's stated in the, in the final quote I got of here. Uh, where in a sense that states, it seemed to me that writing could put an end to my suffering and offer principle for living a happy life. So, yeah, I think that's where I'm going to end this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I, I just got why I am the chair of this panel, I think it's all French stuff. Uh, <laughs> it's a bit slow, but I um, well. <laughs> So the next speaker is um, Andrea Cartney. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, they asked me to pronounce it in English. So Andrea uh, is an associate professor at the International Relation in History at the Sapienza, a university in Rome, uh, director of the CIMA, Research Center for International Cooperation. He teaches na uh, nationalism and national minorities in Europe, international history of nationalism and identity. And his paper is also about Francois. A very book, Fighting for Modernity, balancing the same point between futurism, feminism, and hysterism. It's going to be curious. Thank you. Okay, and thanks to, to Sarah, the medical, and to all the organizers to, for uh, inviting me here. And uh, I'll try to launch my presentation. And, uh, that is, uh, I was uh, presenting this, uh, this uh, uh, contribution in uh, a part of this contribution in a celebrity studies conference a couple of years ago. It was quite uh, very interesting the uh, the the set uh, reception of uh, of this uh, topic uh, because uh, Valentin de Saint Juan is very well known also in the studies French studies and gender studies for, but for different uh, approaches because the meaning of this woman is quite very controversial in that sense. And um, so on. Uh, I was uh, I was arriving to, to Valentin uh, through D'Annunzio, through Ricciotto Tenuto, uh, through the environment, the big contest of uh, 
uh, premise of uh, the Great Wall, um, and also the end of the, the, this uh, period of the prosperity and uh, uh, happiness that is called after the end of that, the Belle Epoque is now. It's like our period, maybe we are talking about that we are in the middle of the end of one period and the starting of a new one, who knows. And in that sense, it's, it's interesting uh, that um, this, this uh, kind of personalities were able to have a different role and, uh, and contribution to different environments with the links with the very different men and, and confess. In, the, in that sense, I was approaching uh, uh, her um, as a, an international history personality. So it is not a part of, uh, uh, of the French, only, only the French or European history, but uh, I was attracted by her uh, as a, a real link with the Eastern world, Islamic world, and Mediterranean. Um, so, okay, starting for some elements, but after that, I'm going to 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 have a, a way out uh, among different uh, scenarios, because we are talking about so Paris. So you will know that is only uh, um, a slide to to recall. Uh, what means for, uh, for uh, us, for all of us, Paris in that, in that period. Uh, I was attracted by uh, Ricciotto Canudo, Le, le, le Transplanté, Paris, la ville visage du monde, this novel, uh, in Italy quite uh, not very well known, but uh, was interesting and was uh, uh, quite well spread at that, at that time because Italians for that, uh, of that uh, period were uh, populating more and more Paris, not only as uh, workers, so we have a lot of workers at the end, by the end of 19, beginning of 20th century, but also journalists, artists, uh, and uh, so uh, intellectual, uh, in the intellectual and in environments. And it was uh, uh, written by uh, Ferrario, Les Italiens de Paris, a recent book uh, uh, reconstruct, rebuilding this, uh, this period uh, in the beginning of the uh, 20th century. Very interesting because uh, we, we can see how Italians were at the, at the middle of, uh, of, the, of the world culture, uh, but Italy was a provincial country, so finally it was quite young, with a very high level in, in some personalities, but in, in general, uh, country as a system uh, was uh, searching for its place at the first line, maybe till now, and uh, not successful in the the period. Fascism was uh, so quite, quite very well uh, uh, opinion, very well shaped. Uh, that, that is uh, this period, so it's uh, like a, a kind of solution of, of the. We can see that uh, through the Kiriko, through. Uh, very important intellectuals, uh, all, always uh, in some kind of way taking a side with the fascism, that, like, uh, yes, uh, sickness, but uh, necessary, something like that. It's interesting because, uh, uh, in all the cases, uh, uh, futurism is one of the glory of, it of Italian culture, but it was spread from Paris. And the spreading from Paris of these kind of exigences um, was uh, was um, recalled uh, by personalities like uh, Valentin de Saint Quentin. In that sense, we can call Valentin a part also of uh, the Italian de Paris in in some way. It is not technical uh, right uh, opinion, but I want to provoke, uh, to give you this provocation as a, like a suggestion, because the meeting with the Ricciotto Canudo was very important for her life and works. Uh, so we are in the Belle Epoque, the glamour and the fashion system of that period is, uh, is very important to understand 
the, the waiting time to the war and uh, which kind of shock was uh, uh, provoked, uh, proposed, provoking uh, in the, this personality during and after the, the war. Um, a femme fatale the, the, of that period, maybe, was uh, a provincial uh, woman. In that sense, Anne-Jean Valentin Marianne de, de Grant, the Cécile Versel, uh, um, Le pseudonyme, c'est important. Uh, uh, it's very important because uh, uh, Valentin is uh, taking from the, of, uh, uh, the castle, the place of the, his great uncle Lamartine, so one of the most famous and important in the uh, French uh, literature. Um, so the place, the Saint Point, is uh, the suggestion for his life as an artist. So he wants to, to change and to have this alias as a real life as an artist. We have this kind of, uh, of um, uh, personalities uh, in, uh, in many times in, uh, in uh, the period of modernity, not only. And uh, the Italian uh, system of that period was uh, uh, keeps Gabriele D'Annunzio as a, as a kind of uh, uh, model of that, uh, uh, of that period. Maybe Valentin is a kind of uh, female D'Annunzio, but I don't want to, to suggest or to give you a uh, so hard provocation. And uh, uh, so uh, it's interesting because uh, um, Valentin and Ricciotto Canudo are, are personalities from the province, from the countryside, and they reach uh, the capital. They reach the core of the environment, intellectual and artist environment, as a real need to open itself to the to the world. In that sense, he was able. So after a marriage, very young, with Emile Perrenot, that was in, important for his uh, background, the building of his culture. Widow uh, at the age of uh, twenty-four. And after that, Paris, Charles Dumont, that's the second husband, uh, um, deputy uh, at the National Assembly, socialist, very inside the uh, political and, and cultural environment of that period, that was uh, the starting point for his career in the, in the, jet, in the uh, intellectual and artist system of that period. So, uh, beautiful may be more attractive. He was uh, using his, uh, uh, his uh, passion and charm uh, to, to have a link with the uh, growing artists like Alphonse Mucha and to, to keep links, very real friendship links uh, with, the, for example, Auguste Rodin. In Paris, with the, all this and, and more and more, this kind of uh, suggestion, I wanted to to call this by the book of uh, Baladin. It is the last book about uh, Valentin de Saint Quentin. It's quite uh, um, interesting how this kind of ways of studies is always recalling more and more elements because if we we talk about movements, for example, the cerebrism, or uh, uh, theosophy, or romantism feminine. The cerebrism, for example, was a wave, so a new movement um, started up by Ciotto Canudo and Valentin, not so, uh, not so famous at <laughs> today's time, but it was uh, this kind of uh, this uh, uh, attempt to have a third ways. To, to, to build and to understand man and mankind and culture and what means uh, uh, also the uh, studies on uh, psychology. So we are in, this, in the middle of this, uh, of this contest. But the other side, a very important role in his life is, is given uh, 
by Ricciotto Canudo, we can see in this sketch of uh, Picasso, uh, he described him like uh, Le Barisien, because from Bari and not from Paris, that was like a joke, it was like, a, yes, a very, uh, but this is a, so friendship is a contamination between uh, different uh, background and heritages. Ricciotto Canuto is very important also for, for the life of Valentin because uh, he's, uh, he said that, uh, so he was uh, passing himself uh, in the middle of Paris like a Sicilian, but he's not, because Picasso said, you are from Bari. And Bari is, you know, it's, it's the, the door open to the Mediterranean, but also to Balkans, to Eastern, uh, Eastern world. And, um, and Ricciotto was uh, very famous because uh, uh, he was uh, one French nationalist in some kind of way also. We can see that uh, in, the, in the beginning of um, the mobilization in the Great War, the First World War. And also him, so also for him, the moving to, the, to, to move, moving to Paris and to set, um, to settle there was the real starting point for his career. Um, it's interesting that these kind of artists are multi-faced artists. So he's a musicologue, musician, dramaturg, theater uh, piece uh, writer and, uh, and, and uh, a real uh, uh, devout uh, scholar to D'Annunzio. D'Annunzio, you know, it's for the uh, Italian, uh, it's from the extreme left to the nationalism, so it's uh, covering quite all the ideology of that time. And uh, in that sense, decadentism was uh, this big way in which uh, they, they, they try to, to have a different element to recollect uh, uh, many suggestions in different uh, arts and fields. And in that sense, so writer, writers, journalists, or artists, painter, or sculptor, or for in, that, in that sense, starter of new arts like uh, the cinema. And uh, Ricciotto was very, is very famous today too, not, not, not uh, really for his uh, works, very technical works in music and, uh, and uh, theater, but because he was a, a theorician of the cinema as the seventh art. art. So he was the first publishing uh, an article saying that so we have a different three plus three arts, so uh, in material, material arts, and plastic and movement arts, like music and, and uh, um, singing and, and so on. And in this way, the, the seventh art is uh, the cinema. In this, uh, in this time, that is the time in which uh, D'Annunzio was giving one of the first movies, Cabiria, uh, in, in Italy and in France. And we can see this kind of exigence in this, uh, uh, in this lover, because Valentin de Saint-Paul was uh, able to, to try and to, to contribute to his exigences. Uh, in the context, in the aim to set up what means cinema, by the other way, through choreographies and dancing performance, and inventing uh, a real, a real uh, avant-garde performance in choreography that was called meta chore. So we can, uh, I can uh, suggest to you to think about this. Uh, these performances like a, a two-way, so different way of the cinema in that sense. In this period, it was quite controversial because uh, someone loves, loved uh, a lot the metacody, others said that it's disgusting. <laughs> so, but in, the, in this way, so what, what means uh, the most important things is the approach, the most important uh, approach to 
personalities like uh, Valentino, Ricciardo, is uh, to see the perspective and to, to see the, the fire of research in that sense. They are uh, linked by many uh, common uh, friends like uh, uh, Rodin, like Ardengo Soffici, so if you are here as a, a literature a scholar, you know very well. They were so the builder of uh, uh, the activity of, uh, of literature in, in Paris. And uh, so this episode is quite very important because uh, Valentin was uh, a lover, but only a free lover. It is very important. And uh, we are talking about uh, a woman uh, after marriage, so transferring, going, moving to Paris to be absolutely free. And in that sense, this, there is an help for days and days to find the way to uh, meet up again uh, Valentin de Saint Quentin by on behalf of Richard Tocanuso. So he wanted a lot to, to meet her a second time after a theosophical meeting and so on, but Valentin was always. Okay, maybe Ricciotto can find me, but also, also in that case, I am free to accept maybe him only to my house and so on. So we are talking about a very strong uh, girl in that sense. And uh, so, after that, so the divorce from Dumont, but it, this not, uh, um, means that there will be another marriage. So they are a free lover, they are very well known as a couple, but they are artists, so it is a, a very modern way. And that is, uh, uh, she's uh, in his uh, studio, La Fille du Soleil. So, uh, uh, that is uh, the definition of Gabriele D'Annunzio when he was uh, meeting her in uh, several times. And it's interesting because that is the same name that she will uh, um, find out, she will uh, uh, choose uh, as uh, Islamic name. Mm -hmm. And um, so, um, uh, but also La Mousse Pouc, uh, dressed by scarlet silk. So she's, uh, uh, she's uh, um, a model also for the fashion in that, in that period. Eric Satie uh, with, uh, with the music, in the, so she's, she, she suggested to, to Satie some um, some songs and uh, poems. It's very important these poems because uh, he's, she's uh, uh, developing and growing through poetry. Until, uh, but also in parallel, uh, she's an artist, so we can see the grave uh, of uh, uh, of Ricciotto and his. Uh, um, his uh, participation to the Salon des Indépendants uh, with portraits of uh, uh, Canudo in the Salle 4. You can see also the, the, so the, the style. If you have been in the D'Annunzio Vittoriale, Gardone Riviera on the Gard Lake, that is very famous in, in Italy because it's the Vittoriale of Italian, so it's like a museum of all the rhetoric of uh, Italian unification and, and Great War, but it is the documentation. It's a document, it's a living document in, the, in the, which way in that time Italians were, uh, were um, perceiving themselves through the D'Annunzio uh, life and words. This is very similar to that, so full of spins and, uh, and full of uh, uh, Baroque and uh, uh, things from uh, all the world and, and places and culture. 
So it's very, she's very famous because of, uh, in the 1912, uh, she's uh, uh, the author of the Manifest de la Femme Futurist. It, it is very interesting because it's, uh, it's very famous for that, but she said, I'm not a futurist woman, I am an, uh, um, an interpreter of the exigences of the futurism for the women. That is the and, but you know, this uh, futurist like Marinetti, so the inventor, and you know, all this, uh, this uh, circle uh, were very uh, anti feminine, so they were very machist, so absolutely. But Marinetti said, okay, maybe you, you can be only, only you, Valentin, you can be a real futurist female in that sense. Because why? Because uh, the futurism for, uh, for Valentin is uh, a need, an exigence of, uh, uh, for uh, the men of the time, man, uh, mankind, the, the, the individual men, to be free and to open without the, 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 the past. So not, not, uh, not, not uh, taking into account the past and uh, uh, to open the ties from the past to be free to express themselves, like in a Nietzschean, like in a Danutian way. And it is very interesting because uh, through this way, he is also uh, um, re, um, re is also able to re, re um, recall the lust as uh, a luxury in uh, a different way. So the carnal search of and the expression of uh, uh, the carnal uh, instincts is uh, to be uh, recognized also for the women. So in this way, so is. Uh, She's, uh, uh, she's going through very controversial ways and, and topics in that sense. That is uh, also the Futurist Manifesto of uh, uh, Lust. Lust or just Lust? Lust. Okay. And uh, in the 1913. So we see that we are uh, quite. Uh, so, Balkan Wars, so there are. This is the, the last period of. Uh, of the peaceful uh, pre war uh, Belle Epoque. And um, it is important that uh, it, she is against the submission, she is against the sentimentality, she is against the, uh, the, ima the image of the women like uh, you know, the decadence way. So, for that reason, she was like a man among women, so she was perceived like that. So that is a critical addition to the Futurism. She is an animator of the magazine Mon Joie. It is founded by Ricciotto Cano. It's very interesting, the imperiali so this, this is the journal of the imperialism of the art on the life. Uh, Rodin, uh, Apollinaire, uh, 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 de uh, there is a lot of authors from different arts writing and, and uh, presenting them, their uh, contribution in this, uh, uh, in this journal. Mon Joie is the, uh, that is the Roland, uh, famous middle age uh, crab, uh, when uh, she, he is uh, fighting against uh, the Islamic uh, uh, invasion uh, during the Charlemagne, uh, the period of uh, the empire, the middle age empire, and by the other way is also the Gioia del Col, the tra translation that is the locality near Bari, close to Bari, where uh, Richard Cotanudo uh, was uh, born in. And um, so, symbolism and modernity, and she is very well attracted by Islam. 
that is uh, very interesting because uh, through theosophy and through Sufism, she tried, tries to um, discover a real original spirituality in the East. That is uh, uh, a long uh, evolution and itinerary for Valentin, but uh, it's also uh, it's also very interesting what what kind of uh, uh, results he, it uh, he, that that will be uh, reached by her. This is uh, these are images of her, Mon Joie, Le Transplanté. Was quoted, uh, mentioned before, and um, so the Nuncianism and Futurism together, maybe that is a, a kind of uh, okay. So um, the war that is the breaking point of their so their relationship. They will be also till the end of uh, till the death of Ricciotto, who was uh, quite uh, till young, uh, dying in after a few years. Uh, but um, also Valentino was very friend, very friend and close to the new uh, lover of Ricciotto. But the war is is a period in which uh, so it's. Uh, uh, it's a turning point because uh, uh, there was a mobilization for the war. She wanted to join uh, people to the war, but she was a female, so tried, she tried to, to enroll in the Red Cross. But it was very, uh, very, uh, that was a big deception, so it was, uh, um, it, it was, um, really um, upset also uh, because of the corruption inside this uh, uh, this uh, this kind of uh, environments and she she tried to recover new ways through uh, experiences in Mediterranean also Ricciotto is a theorician of a theorist of uh, uh, Mediterranean like a culture with the a lot of culture inside, so Neo-Latins or Latins and Slavic and Arabic, so Islamic. She is also uh, able and uh, trying to, to do that in, in, in Corsica, in Corts, uh, where she wanted to build a new circle for people uh, after a period in, uh, in Spain to recover and to wait for the end of the war, uh, to, to study and to, to um, go inside, deeply inside the Mediterranean. And after that, there is the conversion, conversion to, to the Islam. This uh, last period is, is the so-called esotericist period. That is based in Egypt, is linked by a good friendship, not, not so close friendship, but good friendship with René Guénon. Mm. And, last phrase for this last period, she is, uh, uh, she try, uh, she tries, tried to uh, build a way for feminism, not by West but an inner feminism for the Islamic women, so for the Eastern world. So what means that? So she was veiled, uh, trying to, uh, to, to consider, to build, and to, uh, uh, to show what means the, the values of feminism and female in the Eastern world. And trying to do that, she was fighting against the colonialism and the mandate and all the administration of, uh, of this uh, Prosharia from Egypt to, to Lebanon and Syria. And uh, in this period, for this uh, approach, uh, she entered in a fight against the Paris government. And after that, Paris government said, okay. 
if you do uh, politics, so you will be inspired by agile development, a lot of problems. If not, so you can do uh, your activity of uh, philosophical and religious uh, uh, Sufist uh, practices, but not in public. And that was the last uh, period of, of, of Valentin, dying with uh, his name, Islamic name, and uh, through uh, Islamic rituals in Egypt, practically unknown and poor. That is finished. Um, so, our next and last uh, speaker is Robert Payne. Uh, he is a French teacher at the University of Bedfordshire. He completed his PhD uh, at the University of Leicester in 2017 before spending two years as a lector at uh, the University of Mulhouse in Alsace in France. Uh, his uh, paper today is uh, between the center and periphery lesbianism in Hélène de Montferrand, Les Amis de Louise. Good Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> um, so, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for sticking around until right till the end. Um, you know, at the, end of the day, at the end of a conference, it always gets to the point where everybody's a bit tired and heading off. But, you know, um, hopefully, uh, this will be okay. So, um, Hélène de Montferrand is one of only a few 20th century French writers who is openly lesbian and whose work consistently focuses on lesbian characters and themes. Despite the peripheral status of this subject matter, Montgomery has enjoyed mainstream success. For Les Amis de Louise, which was published in 1990, so we're fast forwarding a few centuries compared with the beginning of the session, um, which is the novel that I'm going to talk about today, she won the prestigious Prix Goncourt in the Best Debut Novel category. Um, she has therefore been credited with bringing lesbianism and lesbian writing into the mainstream. Um, so Jennifer Wayarty Walters, um, who's written a book about uh, lesbians in French novels, um, writes that Montferrand's accreditation with the Goncourt um, led to official public space being opened up for a variety of normal human experiences to be attributed to lesbian characters, who neither died at the end of the novel nor were dead before it started. Um, <laughs> which is quite a nice quotation. I put that one in for uh, you know, a bit of a laugh. Um, similarly, Lucy Cairns states that Montferrand, quote, has portrayed a lesbian society within, but not antagonistic to or marginalized by mainstream society that is literarily unprecedented in French literature. So just to tell you a little bit about the book, it's one of my favourites, first of all. Um, but, you know, things that will interest you a little bit more. Um, it is an epistolary novel, so one written in letter form, set between 1964 and 1980. It follows the lives of a number of heterosexual and lesbian women, who are all aristocratic, by the way, and that's quite important. Um, and it centers on the love triangle between Eloise de Marais, who is the protagonist, um, Erika von Tauberg, um, and Suzanne Lacombe. Okay. So the plot proceeds as follows. So 29-year-old Erika seduces 15-year-old Eloise, who then falls for Erika's former lover, Suzanne, who is almost 50. Humiliated and jealous, Erika shoots Eloise in a fit of jealousy and flees to Germany. Soon after, Suzanne learns that she has a brain tumour and commits suicide. Grief-stricken, Eloise marries, marries, has three children, a boy followed by twin girls, and is widowed prior to the birth of her daughters. And then after 10 years, uh, she and Eric could get back together again. So um, the plot sounds a little bit cheesy and melodramatic, um, but it's actually offset by some really quite complicated characters um, who resist stereotypes about, uh, about women and about lesbians as well. 
um, and a good sense of humour as well, I think. So, uh, despite the novel's treatment of traditionally marginalised groups and themes, then, um, at the level of genre, the novel is actually relatively orthodox. So, the novel contains frequent intertextual references to French literary classics, most notably Jean-Jacques Rousseau's La Nouvelle Héloïse, or The New Héloïse, and Chaudron de la Clause, Les Liaisons Dangereuses, or Dangerous Liaisons. So, um, Montferrand's and Rousseau's protagonists are both called Héloïse, um, and in both of the novels, the main protagonist falls in love with a tutor, so uh, because Suzanne is uh, a teacher. Um, there are also obvious parallels between Montferrand's plot and the representation of a morally depraved aristocracy in the Filias or Morales. Erica, um, sorry, Eloise's manipulation of Erica and Suzanne because it's interesting that she is the one who manipulates them, even though she's the younger one, um, is even compared with that of the womanizing Vanya. Um, and the use of the epistolary form in Les Amis de Louise cements the link between this novel and 18th century epistolary classics. Um, Montfermeil's style is classical and traditionalist. So, in an interview with Lesbian Magazine, which is a lesbian magazine in France, um, Montfermeil stated clearly that clar sorry, she stated that clarity rather than pretentiousness uh, was the most important characteristic writing, and that she did not have the, quote, typically French phobia of repeating words, and that she hated literary works that broke the rules on tense use, which she claimed to respect scrupulously. <laughs> um, and she then concluded this little, her answer to this question, by saying that um, the French language is our tool, and it must be respected with all its specificities that make up its charm. Besides, what's more pleasurable than a colloquial verb, even a slang one, conjugated in the imperfect subjunctive? <laughs> quote. So I get, the, I get the feeling that she is a little bit of a character. Um, um, so Morphilmont is opposed to linguistic change and committed to preserving the conventions of the French language in her own work. So on the one hand, then, we've got this very classical style, okay, with a um, that respects the rules on tense use scrupulously. <laughs> and those rules are quite hard, by the way. <laughs> In French. Um, and uh, all of these intertextual references to a very classical French camp, all whilst treating a very peripheral subject matter that is lesbianism. So, what I want to do in this paper is explore the relationship between the centre, i.e. the traditional, the classical, um, and the periphery, i.e. the theme, okay, in the novel. So I'm going to start with a very, very brief overview of the epistolary genre and women's relationship, <laughs> and women writers' relationship to it, and there may be people who know more about the evolution of the genre than me in the room, because, um, as I said earlier, I don't know much about, I'm a contemporary scholar, really, I don't really work on prior stuff, um, pre-20th pre century. Um, and then I'm going to look at how Montfermeil rewrites the epistolary genre. And then I'm going to look at the role of what is not said in the um, Les Amis de Louise and leave that all bit together. So, um, women writers in the epistolary genre to start with. So, in her introduction to Writing the Female Voice Essays on Epistolary Literature, which was published in 1989, um, Elizabeth Goldsmith remarks that, quote, the association of women's writing with the love letter genre has perhaps been one of the most tenacious of gen gender genre connections in the history of literature." Unquote. So this connection dates back to the 16th century when uh, the letter began to be regarded as a literary form. Um, but actually, because of um, difficulties with women publishing in that period due to sort of norms of femininity, um, they largely practiced the genre as a social art, okay, whereas it was men who exercised it socially and literarily. Um, so there is a bit of a concern there with, with female power, potentially. Um, 
so the first epi epistolary text took the form of instructive manuals um, that taught the user to write effective letters. And in her illuminating study of these collections, Catherine Jensen um, argues that male authors sought to consolidate men's power not through uh, the wholesale exclusion of female author letters, but by including them as tokens um, that positioned women in non-literary private spaces and represented them as sexually subordinate, and in particular as constant and willing sufferers of unreciprocated desire. Uh, so, Goldsmith, to come back to her, theorizes a sort of interesting paradox about the relationship between women and men in history writing. Um, so, this is a quotation uh, The one genre with which women have been persistently connected has actually specialized in narrowing the range of possible affections for feminine expression. <laughs> so, I'll come on to the text now. So. Given the association between women and letter writing, then, the use of the epistolary form in Les Amis de Louise could be said to reinforce norms of femininity. Um, it is therefore particularly significant that Montferrand uses it in a lesbian novel that inherently challenges the norm of female heterosexuality, and that it also portrays female characters who assume high powered roles in a traditionally male public sphere. So Erika skillfully manages her father's lucrative company. Suzanne is a high school history teacher, and Eloise reads history and pharmaceutical studies at university before going on to open her own pharmacy. Um, really, these women are they're, they're like a race of super women um, in, in this novel. They're, they do everything, um, and one might um, relate that to their social class. Um, we might come back to that um, later on. Um, so, moreover, Montferrand reverses the patriarchal tradition of silencing women by giving overwhelming precedence to female perspectives. So, although men do feature in the novel, usually like the women in positions of social and economic power, um, so Eloise's father is an ambassador, Ericus is a renowned entrepreneur, it's actually only the female characters who write the letters. Um, unlike in classic epistolary novels, Les Amis de in Les Amis de Louise, the female characters enjoy and exercise control over their sexual relationships. So Montferrand challenges the stereotype that lesbians are less interested in sex than in love, and do not engage in the promiscuity commonly associated with gay men. Erika admits that she can no longer count how many sexual partners she's had. Um, Eloise sees her relationship with Erika as sexual rather than romantic. She grows bored when Erika becomes clingy and cheats on her with Suzanne. Um, the characters thus resist conventional and purportedly moral long-term monogamous relationships. Furthermore, the novel portrays sex as a game primarily controlled by its young lesbian protagonist, and there is a bit of a link there with Yuri's or Roshan's. Um, so, for Eloise, um, the young lesbian protagonist, finding a, finding a boyfriend is dismissed as facile or easy. Finding another female lover is difficile et donc valorisant. <laughs> Difficult and therefore rewarding. <laughs> seducing Suzanne, and I love this quote, <laughs> seducing Suzanne is described as an excellent exercise. <laughs> <laughs> An excellent exercise. And staying loyal to Erika is unappealing because Eloise, no Sandra's fruit, is no longer having fun. So, Les Amis de Louise further differs from classic epistolary novels in its portrayal of despair and revolt. So, in an article on contemporary women's epistolary novels, by contemporary I mean 20th century, um, Elizabeth Campbell succinctly describes how the treatment of these themes, that is, themes of despair and revolt, has changed since the 17th and 18th century. So, this is a quote from her article. Um, in the epistolary novels of the 17th and 18th centuries, we are more likely to find despair as the letter writer either feels herself succumbing to the temptation of her lover, or seducer, sorry, or having been seduced and abandoned, bewails her fate to another. 
In contemporary epistolary novels, we are still likely to find despair, but more often we see women moving away from despair to revolt. And it's really the last sentence that's kind of the key bit here. So there is still despair in contemporary women's not in contemporary epistolary writing by women, but that despair is often transformed into um, a kind of revolt. So in keeping with this model, Eloise, Erika, and Suzanne all go through periods of despair that they turn into revolt. When Erika learns that Eloise is sleeping with Suzanne, she shoots her. <laughs> As you do. Um, Suzanne commits suicide, which is undeniably tragic, um, but it is also a form of revolt in the sense that it's a way of taking control. Um, and because that, Susanna, um, sorry, because that su suicide is motivated by illness, rather than because she has a brain tumor, rather than unrequited love or desire, um, Liz Emmy Davies actually departs from classic epistolary novels in which love is portrayed as a curse. So, unlike in the epistolary novels of the 17th and 18th centuries, um, Erika and Eloise do not bemoan their lack of fortune. Uh, if we come back to the quote from Campbell, one of the conventions of the traditional history novel was that uh, the, uh, the seduced would bewail her, her fate to know. Okay, in this novel, it's not really the case. So the novel resists contemporary claims that women are inherently more um, emotionally expressive and receptive, um, and that as a result they need to talk about their feelings, which is a bit of a, a, a cliche, isn't it? Um, Indeed, it is telling that Eloise, who is the novel's central character and one who writes the most letters in the novel, actually stops corresponding um, in the immediate aftermath of Suzanne's death. Um, similarly, Erica stops writing letters altogether um, after she and Eloise break up, and she chooses instead to write in the more private space of her diary, which we do get extracts from in the novel. So it's not just an epistolary novel, the real are also diary. Um, so, in this way then, writing, or to be more precise, writing selectively, or not writing at all, um, becomes symbolic of the character's emotions. So, although Erika updates her diary more regularly following the breakup, uh, she struggles to come to terms with it. Um, so, after a thorough critique of her own appearance, she writes, Now the mind. Well, no, I'm not ready to look at that yet. We'll do that later. Okay. Uh, which I'll skip over as well. So, although the novel maintains the suffering female characters that were typical of classic epistolary novels, it does depart from this model in having the protagonist refuse to write their despair and share it with us. So, <clears throat> coming on to the sort of third part of my paper. Um, which is about the role of the unsaid. So this tendency to write selectively um, is equally evident in the character's treatment with the novel's treatment of sex. So given the foregrounding of lesbian desire and love in Montferrand's work, um, it is significant and perhaps surprising that the novel does not contain a description of lesbian sex. Although it makes it plain that sex takes place, and there's rather a lot of it, um, it refuses to eroticize the act by avoiding any explicit descriptions. So, Montferrand achieved this by replacing the explicit details of lesbian sex with ellipses. Um, and I've got an example of this in which um, Eloise relates her encounter with one of her lovers, uh, Melita. She has a few. In the, uh, so, Eloise says to um, Melita, Show me your bedroom. And then there are three, and then there's an ellipsis, so that we know we know that sex has taken place here. Okay? And then she says, afterwards, she said, "Oh no, sorry, this is uh, Melita speaking. Uh, she's talking to Eloise. You were completely mad to get married. You're not made for it." And Eloise replies, "No, don't think that. It was all right." <laughs> Melita says, "Yeah, right. Better than this." And then there's another ellipsis. <laughs> I continued, I continued, I is Eloise because she's telling her best friend all about this. Um, 
you were married too, after all. End quote. So the bracketed ellipses indicate Eloise's omission of details that she is unwilling to disclose. It is easy to see why this could frustrate lesbian readers trying to come to terms with and understand their sexuality through literature. The fact that Eloise stopped short of an overt affirmation of sexuality through a description of her experience with another woman appears to equate lesbian sex with the unspeakable. However, the non-description of sex in the novel chimes with some feminist arguments about the potentially useful role of the unsaid in the uh, valorization of female sexuality. And I'm thinking particularly here about um, Ellen Sipsu and Lucy Le okay. um, On the other hand, the non-description of sex... Sorry, that's the wrong connector. Um, <laughs> the non-description of sex also enables lesbian readers to construct and fantasize about what is missing um, for themselves, rather than it being imposed on them. And there is a very long tradition of um, female sexual experience being imposed on them, okay, by uh, descriptions of they are describing anything particularly at Freud there. Um, so in this light, then, the subtle inscription of sex is actually empowering um, and liberating for lesbian readers, or at least that's my argument. There are very ways of looking at that. Um, so the use of the unsaid extends to sexuality. Significantly, the words lesbian and lesbianism do not appear in Les Amis de Louise at all. It is tempting, again, to criticise this omission as an unintended endorsement of the taboo on lesbianism. Uh, in other words, of confining it to the periphery. Um, but it is equally a powerful, powerful reflection of its invisibility in the 1960s and 1970s, when actually the term lesbianism was probably not used all that much. Um, so rather than labelling the characters as lesbians, Montferrand uses imprecise but connotative substitute phrases, such as les filles dans mon genre, or girls like me. Or ellipses. Um, for example, when Erika comes out to her colleague, uh, the colleague responds, I'll quote again, Vous voulez dire que vous ne les aimez pas? Pas du tout. Même pour. And then more ellipses. <laughs> I'll translate that. Um, you mean you don't like them? Then men. Then being men. At all, not even for. Um, so, however, just as not describing lesbian sex does not amount to precluding lesbian sex, there is still plenty of it, um, refusing to name lesbianism does not amount to refusing lesbianism. Les Amis de Louise is irrefutably a lesbian novel in which lesbianism is broadly problem free. Um, so we could say then the unsaid is actually a consistent aesthetic approach by the author to handling sex and sexuality. I'd love to ask, actually, why she has these ellipses all the time. Um, you know, I think that would be quite interesting. Um, so just as language is central to Montferrand's project then, so too is literature. So as I've said already, Montferrand draws overtly on the history classics of uh, Rousseau de la Clos. So, by aligning herself with the most prolific history novelists to come out of France, Montferrand positions herself within a literary elite. In doing so, she is attempting to claim a place for lesbian identities in texts in an established, highly acclaimed French literary canon. Clearly, attempting to make lesbianism count in this way is valuable. However, one might also say that it is objectionable. Why, for instance, should lesbian writing seek legitimacy through a traditionally androcentric literary canon? Can it not be legitimate in its own right? Yet, by positioning herself within this canon, Montferrand seems to move away from the notion of lesbianism as something that is ontologically different or radical. As Lucy Cairn states, uh, this quote, functions to legitimise her literary status and to suggest more common ground between heterosexual and homosexual dynamics than it can be held to exist. In other words, the relationship between Montferrand and the classic of history novel novels of the 18th century actually normalises lesbianism and lesbian writing. 
Paradoxically, then, Wolfgang's recourse to tradition, the mainstream or the center, is actually integral to the transgressiveness of a literary project. That's kind of the why I'm making the argument. So, to conclude, while Wolfgang's self alignment with an elite and largely male literary canon might put off some readers, she arguably positions herself within the canon only to reclaim it for lesbians. This is most apparent in her use of the epistolary form in Les Emilien Reads, in which the female characters, in sharp contrast with those in classic epistolary novels, are sexually autonomous and fulfilled. Why no sex scene then? I'm just kind of tossing the question out there. We might come back to it. Um, lesbian readers might regret this, this omission, but there is plenty for them to like about this novel. Lesbianism is not presented as a barrier. The lesbian characters are accepted by those who matter to them. And as a result, there is a remarkable degree of common ground and solidarity between the heterosexual and lesbian characters. And in these important ways, Mordor undoubtedly succeeds in bringing lesbianism out of the periphery and into the center. Thank you. Introduce you. Eleanor Sanson is Professor of Italian History of Linguistic and Women's Studies at the University of Cambridge. Her research brings together the history of linguistics thought and the history of women in Italy between the Renaissance and the post unification period. Another field of interest is conduct literature for and about women. Among her publications are Donne Precettistica e Lingua nell'Italia del Cinquecento, Women, Language and Grammar in Italy and more recently a critical edition of a very rare 1628 text by Isabella Sori, Ammaestramenti e Ricordi, with the Modern Humanities Research Association. The edited volume Women in the History of Linguistics, co-edited with Wendy Ayres Bennett, is impressed with Oxford University Press. She is editor-in-chief of the series Women and Gender in Italy, 15,000, oh, oh, <laughs> 15, sorry, uh, 15 and the peer reviewed journal Women Language Literature in Italy. Professor Lin. Thank you. Ready? So, thank you to um, Sara and the name of my Kathleen's for inviting me. Um, to be at this conference, which I'm sure has provided very much more opportunities for interesting reflections and also for distraction in what is a precedent moment of difficulty for any people in any um, In this respect, I want to apologize to all of you for the fact that I cannot be there in presence. Um, the reason being that in a few days I'm going to visit my very lovely parents who are a bit elderly because they are in 26 respectively and not the best um, health conditions. So I thought that what I can do given the whole business of the situation is trying to protect them as best as I can by being extra fortress, given that there isn't very much else that I can do. So I, um, I thank you for your understanding and please do accept my sincere apologies for this. So, um, in her 1976 essay, Basic Women in History, Definitions and Challenges, the Austrian-American historian Gerda Lerner, one of the founders of the academic field of women's history, explained that in the first years during which American historians had begun to develop women's history as an independent field, they had sought to find a conceptual framework in methodology appropriate to the task, and she had identified three levels in which historians trained in traditional history approaching women is. The first one implied writing the history of women's worthies. So this is notable women in history, what could be called compensatory history, which tends to focus on exceptionality. And this exceptionality can be misleading because it can represent and experience those who could not escape not exceptionality because of a number of limitations, and not least social safety. The second stage, Conceptualizing women's history can be called 
which explain contribution history. And this describes women's contribution to and her status within his field, so many field disciplines, which implies trying to fit women's contribution within capital and value systems, which consider that male experience the measure of significance. In the foreground is our traditional understanding of the movement of disciplines, and the contribution is just as with respect to its effect on that movement or discipline as we traditionally understand it, or by those standards that are traditionally considered appropriate with Elena, And that was the third Elena, stage. Elena, yeah? it's not working well. I'm trying to call you again, okay? Okay. I close and call you. Yeah. Try again to share the PowerPoint, please. Try again to share the PowerPoint, please. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's try again. Can I try again? Yeah. Is it is it the screen or is it the voice that not it's your voice? The voice. The screen ah, okay. is working. It's just the voice. So we're talking about the first stage. Transitional history. Can you hear me? Which reminds us that the true history of women is the history of their functioning in a male defined world on their own terms. And the need to consider adding new categories to the general categories by which historians organize their material. Now, if we take this framework and we apply it to the investigation of women in the history of language and linguistics, as well as their presence in scholarship more broadly, and we will see translation today. Are uh, aiming to get eventually to a transition of history with steps towards the development of new criteria and concepts, then we can keep in mind that so far our reasoning within the areas of women's possible contribution to these fields of knowledge, and not only the state to women within those areas, have been determined by men. Is this better? Yeah. Okay. So, paraphrasing learner, we can say that the true history of women in the history of language, linguistics, policy, translation, is the history of their ongoing function in a male defined world on their own terms. In a volume of mine from 2011 that I mentioned earlier on, a language and grammar, which brings together an interdisciplinary perspective, the history of Italian language, the history of grammar, the debates of the and the history of women. One of these own terms that have emerged as a possibility for women to come to the language study and express their thoughts. Uh, Elena, sorry, we have still some problem with your voice. We tried to close and call you without the video. So I, uh, I, can try, I can try to show the PowerPoint from the screen okay. here. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you then um, the number of the slide. Okay, yeah. And okay. we just have to this way. Is that okay? Okay. Let's do that. Yeah. Okay, let's first. Should get this one? Okay, this one. Okay. 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 Let's, let's try it now. It works. Okay. Yeah? Yes. And it's better? It seems better, yes. It seems okay. better. So I was saying that um, in the um, book that you mentioned earlier on, Women, Language and Grammar, I had already seen that these questions of the own terms were related to the issue of translation. And translation as an expression of scholarship in language had also emerged in this book that you also mentioned, that is National Press, um, the Dorset University Press on uh, Women in the History of Linguistics. Um, it has brought to light the fact that women often see translation as a way to express their scholarship in linguistic terms at a time when the possibility to contribute to language codification as such was restricted, both because of their limited access to education and long-standing prejudices that did not consider this field of knowledge, language qualification as such, and scholarship in general, 
uh, suitable for women. This is not to say that there hasn't been work, for instance, in the field of translation, but more from the point of view of uh, their contribution to literature. And I should say, not so much in the Italian context, but more in the context of England, Germany, and France, for instance. We can mention the, the work by Brent Washington for the early modern of England, and Hilary Brown for Germany. So my consideration today are taken from a book project that is in progress, Knowledge of Trust Families, Women in Translation in Italy's long 18th century, which investigates, uncovers, and recovers women's scholarship in the field of translation from the creation of Arcadia in 1620 until the beginning of the 19th century. So who are the biggest founders of Vienna, pretending persons in the 1820s and 1830s? And what I want to do, what I'm aiming, hopefully, to do is offer a contribution also to the cultural history of translation in Italy and to women's history. So what I've done is I have embarked in what has been an extremely fascinating journey to discover women's role within this field, uh, both metaphorically and also real one, because it has, as you can imagine, required many expeditions and explorations into library and archives across Italy. And what has emerged has, uh, with the sources allow that, of course, also the individual experiences of women letters across the land, who devoted themselves to translation also to be able to express and reclaim their kind of scholarship and intellectual engagement when other paths were precluded to them. So let me give you today some examples of women who reclaim scholarship by means of translation. Um, against the general background, the linguistic background, in which they operate, and touching upon some of the obstacles they have to face. So next slide, please. Italy's 18th century has been termed the century of women, the secolo delle donne. The beautiful paintings by the painter of contemporary genre scheme of life, Pietro Longhi, from Venice, as you can see from those uh, images, well, it would have been behind me, but in front of you, <laughs> stand wide. Um, but it's also the second Caledonia because the publishing market, which always kept an eye on the requirements of an expanded leadership, had identified women as a very prolific set to invest in. So there was a whole range of work, the back genre, that published for the benefit of women. Uh, periodic publications, journal, gazette, travel accounts, manuals on the education of children, conduct literature for plays, and of course, women were associated with reading novels, which were more often than not criticized and frowned upon by moralists and pretty corrupt with morality. Next slide. We also find in Italy, as in other countries, a rich production of work specifically aimed, or so the title say, for the ladies. And you should be able to see on the slide as an example of these works, for instance, on the left hand side, the Newtonianismo per me d'Arne, which was then also translated in uh, several other languages, but also chemistry for the ladies, um, theology for the ladies, the Theologia per Redame, and the history of animals for women. These are just some examples because there are, as I say, a range of works of this. Now, the idea behind this is that these are a simplified form of knowledge in content and, and, and presentation um, to benefit the less learned. And of course, we know that women were often considered to be uh, among the less learned, if I should say, the less learned by the last, of course, the limited education possibilities. So, not only were women the intended readers of the Battle of Literary Production, but they also themselves actually contributed to the literary world. Next slide, please. Throughout the century, women entered fields that until then had been mostly or exclusively made reserves, such as philosophy and scientific writing, and then from the second half of the century onwards, also journalistic writings, with figures such as Elisabetta Kiner Pura, F. and Sapi, then the Neapolitan from Portuguese origin, Eleonora Fonseca Pimentel, in Enter. And Milanese, the Milanese Carolina Alfanzi, of whom I did not have an image, but I can show you here the image of the Pietro delle Dame, which is found in 1804. And indeed, as we said, another field which we witness growing female presence is translation. Next slide, please. Either by consulting existing women's translations in their original 
information of printed sources or by means of cross references in other primary sources or by making use of compilations of learned Italian written across the centuries, I have been able so far to identify more than 100 names of women translators. And I really believe that this is just, if you want, a sample of much larger number. And these are women of different backgrounds and situations from across the peninsula, who between the end of the 17th century until the 19th century, crossing linguistic and cultural boundaries, translated a variety of books, poetry, novels, plays, history, biography, economic and legal texts, scientific texts, as well as religious and devotional writings. Now, my research in particular focused on the study of printed material, but occasionally also manuscript translations. And here you can see in the slide just some examples um, to give you an idea of how varied they are. And I'm going to go back and talk with you, uh, to you about some of it. Next slide, please. The increasing presence of women translators was detected by feminist texts, though not necessarily a positive term. Here you have quotations which I'm going to translate and paraphrase with you from Matteo Borsa, Gusto Desente Lecture Piano, in which he talked about the fact that on the most common and more easily observable basis, the current state of the Italian letters, one could see this amount of works of, as in opposite, well, a few man and to let the fancosa in the original Gimite of the Retrade. So the term is mechanical. He is referring to the translations. Translations should only be attempted, says by the best writers on the best originals. Whereas he said everything, they were quite translated to try to make the big in by the page, by ignorant of them. And of course, written together good tough of misogyny, he says among the favor of translators, very and women. So women and children, of course, they are often associated. Um, translated works that were most suitable to them, the most insignificant works, and in endless numbers engaged in what was at find that much easier way to talk authors. He talks, as you can see in the third line, about this questa adiatissima strada di pazzi talking. So they didn't know their own language, not the language of the author. They translated. And just indecently mixed together everything without any accurate language, symbols, agreement, and produced unbearable translations of the first time. Um, this Ajatisi Pastrada of Pastopi is referring to this idea that women can use translations as a first step, then become authors of fictional works. And this is an idea that has been recurrently voiced and discussing women and translation. Now, engaging in translation has been deemed to find women a compromise between their artistic aspirations and the character of authorship of imaginative literature and a way for women to lead their mark in a wise positive environment. So it has sometimes been coded, we can say, as a feminine activity, something that didn't threaten male establishment as the expression of personal viewpoints and, and also because any comments of course women translators might have displayed could be dismissed by denigrating the part of translation itself. In fact, research on the topic shows that this understanding of the role of translation is limited. What I'm saying is not that women are engaged in translation uh, for other pieces or that they didn't engage in translation to try out their literary skills, but this can be said also for that anything. But what I want to say is that the findings of my investigation reveal that several of these women produced translations, the period in question, were also producing it to the work of both um, that had received seeds of appreciation. So they produced both, one alongside the other, sometimes before their translation. So this means that they had a full reading of their own work and they didn't need translation. Yeah. Next slide, please. What is in point is the Reza Baduti Milanucci, Luca, into translating only after a successful career as improviser, Italian and European private public state. She was known well known. In 1815, she broke out the translation from Greek into Italian in three books, um, a text by Greek Palazzo Museum, which was published in Morgan and Chimbolton. And she was 52 at 
client. Can it be translated to scale enough to the very state? Um, for instance, other women of Microsoft, despite having reached such a particular prominence, at times depending on the ink, so it's not a kind of relationship to translation that they received from the next slide, please. Let me give you the example of the patient Lisa Bertalicotti. Besides her original contribution as playwright and her activity within the theatrical show girl, also translated both from French and Latin a whole range of work. Terence's comedy, La Cine Mordière, La Mise à for instance, Les Amazones by Madame de Bourgogne, and she also said, this is very interesting, of course, to have translated some of the works that beautifully attributed her husband, Count Gaspar Bocchi. And the decision to translate can be purchased also from the necessity to contribute to the financial management of the impoverished condition of the Bocchi family, to the point that it seems that said, for family activity, also, also the daughters were involved in <laughs> So translating can compare both a public and a private element, like in this case. And some of them might also have taken up translation as a literary pastime, an activity to be involved in, if you want, in between their domestic duties, in between the many engagements of their busy social life, or in order to go to do practice the languages that they have learned. But before going into many more detail by giving you further concrete examples, authors and works, women translated its relative to Italian, and before touching upon the question of the languages from which they translated, I would like very briefly to provide the report I mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. I said earlier on that I have positively identified and found a little more than 100 names of women translators, and that they need to start a path to this number. Why is that? Well, this is because of the difficulty at times to attribute certain translators to certain female and male translators. Um, because women translators publish their work either with the full names, or sometimes with an official only, or sometimes with no name whatsoever. Um, in other instances, they may appear in the note of the reader, composed by the printer, in a other parenthetical here. Have a look at this slide, for instance. Um, it's a slide where you have several um, title pages, am I right, Sarah? Yeah? Sure. You have several title pages on, on, the, on the slide, right? With a dynamicity of G on the top left. Yeah. <laughs> well, as you can see on the top left, it says um, there is full name, so an enemy of genius, but it's pretty a Rosina for so. She translated in Turkey. Well, you can see on the right hand side, you have the name of Maria Selvaggio Borghini, and she translated in Italian. You can see the Avenue di Telemaco on the uh, right, my right, yes, your face too. Maria Francesca Piazza, 1731, who translated Salon de Telena by Filolo. Now, if you turn down um, the second row, oh, in the case of Fernandi Marvezzi, Fernandi Marvezzi, her name does not appear on the title page of the translation of Pope's Break of the Law. It does not appear on the title page. Although she then addresses the reader directly, explaining the rush sound behind the enterprise, the passione. When Francesca Roberti in fact translated Duguay, a Lefebvre on the right hand side, bottom right, on the occasion of her sister taking the veil of becoming a nun, her name is again not on the title page, but it appears clearly in the medical three letter, as you can see, alla signora Tessa Ante Roberti, and then right in the middle of the page, Francesca Roberti Franco. Next slide, please. You can also find, instead of the name, an explicit effort by the printer saying that, for instance, the female translator of the Pigeon and the Borden letter, the Mille et Jules et Quelques Vies, forbade him to give her name out. La di lei modestia pietò assolutamente di ornato su un'edizione. This is to um, the right of the title page of the uh, letter. The translator of the Touch in Italy, and this is on the right hand side there, you can see that there is a crown image, can be recognized by the intertwined initial of the 
Facebook page. Can you see there's an M, an O, and an S in twice to understand. And that's Maria, Vittoria, Occuboni, and Belloni. Other works were published simply as Trabocchi da una piccola torinese, and that's to the right of the slide. If you look now further down on the left, you see that there are initials sometimes. ECT, Tozzo dal Francese, ACT. I'm referring to the part of the story there. And on the right hand side, in the case of Henry Pastoni, her name appears only at the end, the Stupida, which I have typed hidden from the title page. See that M, no, Pastoni. So certain translations can be attributed to certain female figures, thanks to his other contemporary sources. It was, of course, a well known fact that the woman from letters had translated a certain work. But I'm well aware there are a number of other translations that are anonymous and that might, in fact, have been translated by women, but their scholarship, their authorship, has been locked. So I'm saying this because it means that there's a lot of research that is done in the field. I would also like to um, leave now our translators for the moment, they are working for us, and to have a small but important digression to the point of language. Because we should not forget, going back to what I mentioned earlier on, that the act of translating is more broadly an expression of scholarship and education per se. Already in the terms of the knowledge that is required to interpret the course of language. So in a sense we can say that it is an exercise of high linguistic. Now translation involves not only scholarly skills, also creativity in the choice of the text, in the choice of the words, in order to make foreign syntax become legible to another or to give a different social literary milieu. And this is a very important point that we should never forget. In the point of the linguistic situation, translation was an enterprise of scholarship so because the translator had turned the foreign language, the source language, into what was in fact another folk language. What am I referring to? Next slide, please. For all translators, whether male or female, um, the Italian they used for their translation was not the mother tongue. In fact, at the time, Italian was nobody's mother tongue. And this is a crucial element in the linguistic history of Italy, as well as in the history of translation in Italy, that cannot be taken for granted. In the 18th century, Italian was still very much a certain tool of communication. So here, I'm quite a few for those of you who might be less familiar with the situation of Italy. Italian was codified at the beginning of the 16th century uh, on the basis of an archaic form of task based on the language used in the 14th century, so from two centuries earlier. Um, whereas, as you can see, which is still the case, there was uh, a variety of vernaculars, as, as we call them, were third time of dialects, as we call them nowadays, all derived from Latin. Who, um, who which are in a relationship, or if you want to call them flats, like brothers and sisters, like Portuguese, oh, French, and Spanish, which means not necessarily mutually intelligible, despite being related. So task um, had to be learned by people who were from Sicily, who were from who were from Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So it was like a foreign language that one was writing it, because it had become the language for literature. So if you translate it to French and you get from Veneto and one of the Venetian dialects, um, probably the Italian dialect, was your uh, mother tongue. You could translate from French into 14th century Tuscan, the literary language, which was for you, the Falkman Next slide, please. The Piedmontese man of letters, Giuseppe Paretti, wrote his account of the manners and customs of Italy, specifically on this point, he wrote in English. Their dialects, as referring to the Italians, are preserved in what may be called the barber purity. It is true that all Italians endeavor to write the language of Tuscany, yet in their daily intercourse they use the speech of their own, own narrow history and never chop their heads with the language of Tuscany but when they converse with strangers. For this reason, Baretti, using Tuscan outside Tuscany was a clear application, which came with the risk of being mocked and ridiculed. He wrote, should any Italian but a Tuscan aspire his thumb to talk to Tuscan purity, he would be laughed at, 
as guilty of ridiculous affectation. But what about the languages from which women translators work? About these tools of their scholarship, the languages. Next slide, please. Um, women translated above all during the <coughs> from um, French. We should not forget that throughout the 18th century and beyond, of course, foreign languages, and French in particular, were learned by young ladies as a sign of refinement and distinction. So they were part of their art uh, again. In Italy, French was in fact a more common language of conversation among the upper classes than Italian, as I mentioned earlier, can't be felt was. According to some men of letters and oralists of the time, women's use of French was some sort of epidemic. Women were indeed often held responsible for what seemed to be an unstoppable spread of vicious galomania that was corrupting the Italian language and Italian customs and morals across the Instagram. This is the first quotation of talk. The novelist Antonio Piazza deplored the fact that Italian was never used by a lady, if not interspersed in her mouth with French, because she would place French words here and there so as to come across as elegant and refined. Cacciarle per tutto ci vadano o non ci vadano. Second quotation. Besides French, women translated from the classical languages Latin and less frequently also Greek. It must be said, of course, concerning letters that you know, letters and education at the time didn't always necessarily agree as to whether or not it was suitable for women. They all agreed on the fact that they should attend schools and should not learn Latin as young men did in the Jesuit schools. Um, but some men of letters, such as Pier Domenico Soresi, I can see the, the quotation here, in one of his treatises on the education of women, opposed the study of Latin altogether for women, also at home, remarking that it was necessary to few men, and therefore it, it was even less necessary to women. So, non dunque più poco le femmine che le fabbia mestieri. But throughout the 18th century, moralists and educationalists insisted more and more on the need for women to actually learn Italian and even Italian grammar. And this is the third quotation on the slide. Gioacchino Trioli da Chiari, in 1765, explained that women should, above all, read good Italian books and have a daily lesson in Italian grammar so that they would learn to write correctly. Next slide, please. As for English, even though its present day in generally was still distant, and despite the fact that it could not have any claim to compete with French, from the second half of the 18th century, while interest for Britain and its culture grew, English was being studied by more and more people. Not surprisingly, we start to see women translating also from English. At times, they were translated directly from English, and sometimes they translated via French translation. Here we have on this slide, we should have now a um, quotation again from Beck, in which in a letter to his correspondence, he recalled how he had heard about the new building in Spain, learning English among the ladies. So he says, Non ti ricordo bene chi sia che ha detto che in Milano si è introdotta ora la moda tra le date di studiare la lingua inglese. Next slide. Do you now have a slide with initial image? Am I right? Yeah. Yes. Great. So let me give you just some examples of works translated by women at this time across the peninsula. Some names, some works. In Lombardy, Francesca Manzoni Musti translated uh, the five books of Ovid's Christian, published in 1745, with Pablo Lactan Pet. Angela Corsi Salamoni, also in Lombardy, translated with Pierre in Viterna. In the Vento area, Francesco Roberto Franco, who I mentioned earlier on, translated Latin, French, English work. She published the first book of Petrarch's Africa. Translated as uh, and also devoted her attention to the production of Ocean poets. So, for instance, with her translations of the meditations about tombs by James Kirby, as the Signor Kirby. The journalist Elisabetta Caminatura, who I mentioned earlier on, produced 10 volumes translated plays from English, German, Danish, and Russian, all by a French. Justina Renier Miquel, who my co-written, turned Shakespeare's Macbeth, Othello, and Coriolanus into Italian. 
In Sicily, an Argentine translated Voltaire. In Tuscany, the Infar et Vallucci, Vallucci, sorry, I mentioned earlier, translated from Greek, and she's also created to help the scientists and manufacturers of their parties with this translation of this by the the fact that the translation for some women was, as I said earlier on, needs to express it and display their scholarship in which, in fields in which otherwise they would not have been welcomed as original authors. Now, I will be able to refer to consideration only to women who display their erudition in fields of literature and other humanities, leaving aside those women who use translation as a way to display their knowledge in philosophy and science, because they have been perhaps mentioned for by scholars who work in history and science. Just to give you some names, Giuseppe Leonardo Barbaticola, Maria Argen, Angela Figueri Crispo, Ograzia Gilatten, translated respectively Descartes, Stephen Hayes, and Isaac Fox. Now, what is very interesting to see in a minute is that because women were not necessarily welcome in certain fields of scholarship, so the only way to express it was if you want in a disguised way. And one way to do this was to use liminal spaces of Emphasis, dedications, footnotes, notes to the reader, to enhance the textual material, where little translators could present themselves as scholars, making their voices heard, but in a sense, you, they would not, they would enter, they would stretch into the field where they were not considered necessarily um, welcome or where the scholarship was necessarily considered suitable. You should have a slide with a number of uh, prefaces. So yes. in the preface, the dictations and notes to the readers, they could make the voices heard directly to the readership and express this, the reflections of the, in this case, as we're going to see, the rationale behind the translation, or they were, they were of the translation. So if you want considerations that we could validate, they could be uh, reflections of theory of translation studies. Next slide, please. When Justina Premier Miguel, an aristocratic Venetian family, decided to translate Shakespeare, as I mentioned earlier, she urged her readers in her preface about the translator, which you can see in the slide, the Passione of the Bridge, I think that of the slide. Not to be surprised by the fact that had the power to touch the then going on to explain how in her translation she had left out some sentences that did not suit the Italian and Italian culture, and which she had then included right at the end of the tragedy in their precise modified word translation. So she takes it out from the translation except for her precision says she out at the end of the translation those parts that she had just removed. And she said, and I really like this part, she says that her plan was to present a series of translations which would offer some sort of fear for possibly a practice. And in principle, she explained, she would have been inclined to include in her preface from considerations on theatrical production at the time. And she says, Se solo argomento su cui una donna possa ragionare senza tener le accuse di uomini, that is, perhaps theater is the only subject about which a woman can reason without having to worry about being attacked by men. But this would also have implied the need to discuss what the renowned men of letters of the time had of the topic. And she adds, forse questo, tutti sarebbe perdonato a donna in English, and then some that the woman will not have been forgiven for. So René Michel often acknowledges that there are limits in terms of which territories would enter into. So the compromise that she found was to present the judgments on Shakespeare's words by the greatest English men that practice. And within this general discussion, she would then also present her views. She if would remove herself from the, the considerations made by Italian critics to, come, to avoid being attacked. So it was a strategic compromise to be able to express her scholarship without openly defying social conventions. Next slide. For other women translators, we have our Emmett Stoke, I have not been able to find out her name. Um, their translation allowed them to express their erudition by means of footnotes. Can you see the footnotes on the right hand side of yes. the slide? Yes. Great. So in footnotes, um, you can see a knowledge come to the fore. 
You can see, for instance, and if, um, on the page on the right hand side, it's more or less at the end of that uh, first note. So, not the one number one, but I'm just above that. You can see that she refers to Montesquieu in uh, La Fonde de la Cadapéron of 1734, and she continues to do that with the rest of the work. So, you see, she would not necessarily be able to publish the work in which she was expressing her. Uh, in their criticism, she can translate the text and add in her knowledge. This would have been another way of compromising with the comments and the reflection of time. Next slide, please. Francesca Roberti Franco um, was one of these translators who moved in cultivated circles. She was interacting with eminent figures to be the Republic of Lectures. And we mentioned earlier on that she translated uh, Petrarch's Africa and all the said the Rothko's poems. So she was among those 18th century women who translated in between the many engagements of a very disciplined line. And among the learned connections was the well known Jesuit men of letters, Saverio Bettinelli. And what we have is, the, is part of her conversation with him. To whom um, she said draft her translation, Petrarch's Latin book, Africa to see. So, even in this case, she wanted to engage in scholarship and engage in the literary um, culture at the time and by being able to exchange draft her translation. It was a way to express achievements and get some form of recognition. Then we also have other work projects in which we find hand to hand. Women's translators' engagement with various issues, such as the debate uh, on, question, on the question of women's rights to education. Next slide, please. One case in point is the translation by, as you can see in the middle of the title page, M, L, M, F. You should be able to see the initials, just the transportata della lingua francese e italiana, dalla M, L, M, F. So this is a uh, translation of Juan, La Guerrilla de Tampa, and we learn that the translation of the, the translator, sorry, of this work, learned this from the monumental Biblioteca Modenese by Gimola Mutrowski, was Maria Lava, Montecucci Costiera. If you please go to the next slide, Sara. You can see that we should have a active note to the reader takes the form of a declaration of women's rights to study and learning, in which education is also interpreted as a means of defense against the insidiousness of misogynistic men of letters. So she is basically using the factors of the text to express her view of women's education, the right of women's education, something that, for instance, you see was in the work that I mentioned earlier on, by Barbara Pitbull, who translated the cat, and that efforts she defends and women's learn, learning and uh, particularly in the scientific field. Next slide, please. By means of their translations, women could also offer in some instance a more direct contribution to language communication as such. Here you see the brief uh, lofty high tech of the Kita uh, Blabandola. Sorry for my accent in Tunis, I'm doing my best. Of which you can see that the title page of the 1742 edition and this work, several other editions, 777, is 15, is 39, is It is an example of women trying to ask with success as getting from one dialect to another dialect of the of new music. The Pensagra, so the 17th century favorite day protection by the Neapolitan Giacomo was translated into two volumes by the sisters Madalena and Teresa Freire, and the other two sisters, Teresa and Dante. Now, they came from families of intellectuals. The brothers were friends, the well known mathematician astronomer, Sadio Manfredi, historian, Giampietro Zanotti, Giuseppe Francesco Zanotti. But you can see on the title page on the left hand side, it's given to these women who are intent to keep. Uh, more female kind of activities 
who then also, as we understand, took on the role of translating, as it says on the title page, the title in in language of Asia. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. The Sisters Manfredi and Zanotti had also translated, just a year before, also into volumes, the poem in Cavalma, that called the Convertulti and Cacasendo. There was it originally the outcome of the collaboration among 20 men of letters, which had brought together the work of Julio Cesare Croce and Adriano Bacchini, both 17th century uh, authors. Uh, first published in 1736, but this is uh, the edition that was published, the fifth edition that was coming out at that time in key volumes, with parallel text, um, that also had, as you can see from the time of the aggiunta di la traduzione in lingua bolognese. So, besides the text, the source translation to Bolognese. Next slide. Here you can see in the parallel text. So, you can see the Italian and then the Bolognese. The work of translating the text had been distributed among the sisters of Fred and Zanotti. Uh, Angela Zanotti translated the six cantos of Bertoldo. The elder sister Teresa translated the Argomenti, which you can see at the top of the image. Teresa Manfredi translated the eight canto Berti. And the sister Martina translated the Allegorie, which you can also see that. And then a friend of the family, this came from men, Giuseppe Boletti, from Acaseno. And as he said in the uh, preface, he was black or a female translator to the book. Now, I can tell you that this collaborative translation had 11 reprints, and it went on to become one of the best sellers of the century. Next slide. The name of the translators does not appear on the title page. Uh, it is not even given within the text. It's not even included in the preface. It was well known at the time that the sisters of Anotti Manfredi had worked on this translation. But there is another point that I would like to draw your attention to, and this is something uh, that is actually explained in the, the address to the readers. Among the dedicatees, among the intended readers, would be uh, no ladies. And it's, um, um, if you want to know, coming to the printer, later than a whole And it is important because it draws the attention to the reader to the fact that all of these data were not being caught by him. So, what is this to translating the text from the Apollon to what needs did is to give a very important contribution to the codification of the orthography, this the writing, the spelling of Polonese, which until then didn't have uh, uh, a more modified, more fixed version. And it remained, uh, if you want, the model for all subsequent works of its kind. So, it's a kind of contribution if you want to language codification, the codification of that text, and not a form of scholarship. We also find other examples of works of translation that contribute in some way to language codification, and are now moving towards the end of my presentation. Next slide, please. An example of scholarship in terms of language by means of translation so comes from the 1830s. Mentioned earlier on, my project has some incursions into the 1820s and 30s. And you have here on the slide Jan Philip de Mortmont from La, who translated the works of the Anglo Irish doctor Maria Edgeworth. She was born in 1790 in Milan, from a well to do family, studied in a convent, uh, lost father. With her mother, she had been very much supportive to continue her studies. Uh, she had been able to travel across Europe and um, encouraged to read extensively the philosophers of the time, including Rousseau and Voltaire. Um, and she had become, if you want, a real cosmopolitan traveler, having lived, traveled uh, in the Netherlands, Belgium, Switzerland, and then back to Italy. Next slide, please. Between the 1820s and 1830s, she developed an interest in early childhood and in Edgeworth's pedagogical theories, which she divulged in Italy thanks to one of first translations, as I said. Among these, you can see on the screen the Prima Lezioni Quattro Top. So you can see that here, Prima Lezioni are, um, at least they are targeting children. What is interesting for us, in terms of language, scholarship, and translation, is what you see on the right-hand side of the screen. It says, Bocattari, 
composizioni di alcune voci usate nel libro. That is, a concert or some the work you would use for the benefit of your young readers. So it is a dictionary of your words, which is addressed to your dialect of it, because as I said earlier on, Italian was a language of literature. In everyday life, it would be the dialect that would be used. These children would have to work in Italian. Next slide. So as you can see, she's addressing the Ekali Rakati, so the school people. And as you can see on the right hand side of the image, you can see how it works. You have terms or you have past continuous, and then a short explanation. A bella posta, abitudine, accendere, attare, on the right hand side, aipola, alto. So a short explanation of work for the uh, children. Um, what we should remember is the fact that at this time, when she is published, it was extremely rare to see women authoring any kind of works of language. Um, so in this case, we would say that use of transcription was to, be, uh, to use parts of expression, una strada per so a way to become authors in this case of works of language. We have in fact had to wait till the uh, unification period after 1861, the first, first women uh, writing grammars needed to be grammars for children and for schools. And let me now give you a very last example that encapsulates many of the ideas and issues that we have touched upon. Here I'm going to take you back to time, right at the beginning of the period when my investigation begins, back to 1694, and to a very specific context, which is the context of convents. Next slide, please. My last example comes from a Benedictine nun, the convent of Santa Alessandra in Parma. Her name was Maria Stella Scutella Marie, and I would imagine that you have never heard your name. Sorry, heard her name, I would imagine. I, I thought that I get the sense that people who have not heard Maria Stella Scutella name before. Sorry? I would imagine that people in the room have not heard Marie tell us the last name. I don't think so. No. Anyone heard this name? No. So we can say that Scutellari has been forgotten. You will see in a minute why this becomes relevant. So Scutellari translated into Italian Santa Gaston's Meditazione, the Soliloquia, and Manuate. And she also translated, you can see this from the title page, the left of this slide. St. Anselm and St. Bernard, followed by the meditations of the 14th century French learned writer, Raymondus Rodatus. Scutellari is known to the reader, which you can see at the center of the slide, as Voto et Tese is both an acknowledgement of what is meant to be a woman engaged in scholarship and also an eloquent defense of women's rights education. She declares that with you, as men, Naturally, strive knowledge because they have an inclination in mobile and ragionevole, a noble and reasonable inclination towards knowledge. That is, she strives on instinct of natural and sapete, a natural instinct to want to learn. It was unfair, she explained, to exclude women from this desire to learn. Non mi pare però giusto escludere nel senso che nella notevole desiderio e pazzi. And she explained, if perfected special ignorance, it was not because of any form of intellectual shortcoming their case. Because God had provided both men and women with the same talent and the same skill. It was rather the consequence of men's decision. Men had no right to complain as they often did about women's face, because since birth, the only thing they offered them was access to vanities, and they only encouraged concerned about their achievements. Instead, there were, she stated, many intellectually gifted women who, given the opportunity to devote themselves to studying, would have made great profits, optimal achievements. She did not presume to be one of these intellectually gifted women. She claims, for the fact that she had worked on this um, translation, but she certainly was, she added, among those given by the desire to learn since she was a child. And her ability to translate was, as she was 
una virtù ha il più possibile che superficialmente. Questo è il limite di schifo. She had decided to translate this book for the benefit of the other non-bit combat, but also more probably for the benefit of simple and devout people who could not be given for laughing. She had eventually let herself be convinced to give a translation to the Nazis, even though she had first been do so only if she could remain anonymous. Now, this had proved impossible, and she had therefore reluctantly agreed to have her neck from the time of face. Yet, an unpopular she writes, she is well aware of in prejudicio and impossible to check the requested book and after presenting the distinct for the book. So she says, well aware of the prejudice, her translation would have to face if the name of a woman appeared on the book page. So she understood that perhaps such element and disruptive was considered appropriate in terms of languages access to the page by women. And she concluded her note to the readers by asking them one thing. She says, Comunque si assist, non ti chiedo altro, una sola grazia. Se ti ricordi di me, mi pedri a presso Dio. So she says, I'm only asking you for one thing, readers, that you remember me and that you pray for to God. In fact, as we know, and so were many other women who translated works for the benefit of others and driven by this desire to share knowledge. Next slide. Which kind of concluding remarks can we draw from these considerations? If translation cannot be cooked correctly, it could nonetheless be a less direct, as we said, less transgressive meaning for women to contribute to the world of knowledge and scholarship a means to make knowledge threaten of false backwards. Women of letters continue from time to be aware of the prejudice of the prejudice that they might be attached to some works they translated because of the very fact that they have been translated by women. But they learn, go back to what we saw earlier on with the other learning, to make use of translations in their own words. It does not seem to date that we could chose translation as an ancillary, secondary activity that allowed them some space in the stage, as we saw earlier. Rather, translation was a earlier form as a form of scholarship. Female translators in the 18th and 19th century Italy chose to translate for the benefit of others, other women, the readers, those who lacked the necessary privilege to ask these things, in order to give the contribution to the circulation of knowledge as an expression of scholarship, advancing the literary production. Women translators are, and I'm using here a formula that was coined by the Italian scholar Rebecca Cassiotti. She was referring to the bird production of Anne with its converts in the early modern period and going to borrow it to refer to women translators. Women translators, as a whole, be considered as an archipelago sommerso, a submerged archipelago. Forgotten? Unexplored, hard to reach, hard to trace, but are waiting to be rediscovered and brought to life. Next slide, please. <laughs> <laughs>